screen? Can you hear us? There we go. We have connection. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Tibbetts. Thank you. And we had no closed session items. Mr. McGlynn, item 3.1. Before I introduce item 3.1, I would just like to uh, welcome Stephanie Williams back to the city. She is the city clerk. Congratulations, Stephanie, and thank Dina for her service as interim city clerk. She did a fabulous job, um, and thank you both. <laughs> Item 3.1, Evergreen Study Session, David Gouin, Assistant City Manager, leading us off. Thank you, and good afternoon. Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. Uh, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about our the Evergreen um, option. Uh, this is comes out of the council's goal setting process which identified climate action as a tier one priority. And in that, uh, there were a number of elements that the council asked the city, to the staff to look at over the year. Um, this is one of the final items that we're bringing forward to you as part of that process um, in this current year. Uh, it was to evaluate Evergreen and what that meant for the city to move towards Evergreen off of or what we're currently um, using for energy cost. So today we're gonna give a, a study session about what that means, an overview of Sonoma Clean Power's Evergreen service, what that means in terms of greenhouse reductions. We're also gonna talk about the cost, the cost of implementing that. Um, and the other thing we're gonna do is break down our energy costs citywide into three different buckets. Citywide we use energy for water, we use it for facilities, and we use it for transit are the big uses. And so we're gonna talk about each of those areas and what we're doing in those areas um, in terms of energy efficiency reduction to, uh, to leverage to get the best bang for our buck for what, how we use our, our spend money on energy. And then at the end, uh, we're gonna have a conversation about where, where we go next. How do we wanna look at each of these, look at each one separately, look at them all together, um, and how to move forward as we move into the budget process. So this was presented to the subcommittee early on this year. We got direction from the subcommittee to bring this to the full council for discussion. And part of the reason for bringing it now, again, was to um, tee us up for if there was any budget implications that we can incorporate that into the budget moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna um, turn it over to Amy Nicholson, who is our senior uh, uh, staff planner on, on this project, um, and uh, to go over the overviews, and then we'll, we'll cycle through the different sections. Thank you, David, and good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. Uh, so as many of you know, Sonoma Clean Power is a not-for-profit public agency. It's operated by various cities within Sonoma County, including Santa Rosa, and also those within uh, Mendocino County and the County of Sonoma and County of Mendocino. Sonoma Clean Power sources clean energy from a variety of renewable resources throughout both Sonoma and Mendocino counties and this higher percentage of renewable energy results in reduced greenhouse gas emissions for customers who are subscribing to these services. Sonoma Clean Power has two power sources, one which is Clean Start. This is the um, subscription that the city of Santa Rosa currently has. We switched from PG&E to uh, clean Start in 2014 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also to obtain cheaper energy. Clean Start is comprised of both renewable and non-renewable energy sources and 90% of it is carbon free. In addition, Sonoma Clean Power offers Evergreen as a premium service, and Evergreen is 100% renewable. Um, it is comprised of 84% geothermal energy and 16% solar energy. Just a little bit more about Evergreen, which staff uh, looked into prior to the study session. Again, it is 100% renewable, and it is also 100% locally sourced. It, um, again is mostly comprised of geothermal energy and this is an efficient energy source because it can be generated while the sun isn't out, so at nighttime or during cloud cover and also when there are high energy demands. The solar, again, that is used for Evergreen services is from all local installations and in 2018, Evergreen's emissions were approximately 53% lower than Clean Start emissions. This graph compares uh, GHG emissions 
over a four year period. And this is just related to the city's municipal um, energy usage and it shows um, what the actual emissions were under clean start. So that's that orange bar in the center. Uh, what the emissions would be had we continued with PG&E and what the emissions would have been had Evergreen uh, been subscribed to. And again, as you can see, the emissions from Evergreen are um, substantially lower than that of Clean Start, um, both of which are substantially lower than PG&E. You'll note that uh, the 2018 numbers don't include any PG&E numbers, and that's because PG&E hasn't released their emissions factor to date. As you know, the city has an adopted climate action plan. There's the community climate action plan and the municipal climate action plan. Both of these plans speak to uh, prioritizing renewable energy. Um, the municipal plan directs staff to purchase cleaner energy from either PG&E or another source. And so a switch to Evergreen would be consistent with these policies and these plans. So, uh, a change to evergreen service would come with an increased cost. This chart shows, or graph shows, costs if we were to be subscribing to evergreen services for um, the past five years. And one thing it, it certainly shows is the division of um, funds from our enterprise accounts like water versus the general fund. So the city has um, about 25% of our, our um, electrical usage comes from operating our city facilities, street lights, traffic lights, and the remaining 75% comes from our operation, our water operations, including the Laguna treatment plant. So this chart shows the yellow section, which would be the cost increase associated with um, the water operations, and then the blue is the general fund, and, and there's a small bar that you can't quite see, which is the enterprise enterprise fund of parking. Um, so this assumes uh, the premium increase of two and a half cents per kilowatt hour, and then, and shows what the energy usage was per each year that is up on the slide there. It does not account for any additional efficiency gains that might be made in the future. So if we're looking at uh, an average increase of about a million dollars a year with Evergreen, um, that doesn't consider any changes that um, would bring that cost down due to any sort of energy audits and, and upgrades to our equipment. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Claire Myers in water. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwendhelm and members of the council. Um, so prior to purchasing more expensive, greener energy, uh, we recognize that it's important to minimize the amount of energy that we are currently using. Santa Rosa Water has long had goals of reducing energy usage, energy costs, and greenhouse gas emissions as well as moving towards energy independence. Um, to meet these goals, over the last several years, the department has developed energy optimization plans for our systems, uh, one for water operations and another for our regional water reuse system. These EOPs serve as roadmaps for the department to systematically and strategically optimize energy usage within our systems. In addition to saving money and reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the EOPs also support City Council's goal to promote environmental sustainability and that Santa Rosa protects and improves the environment through its policies and actions. So I'd like to start by just walking us through our general process for analysis and planning. Um, Working with our consultant, Kennedy Jinks, the first thing the plans did was to memorialize um, what energy efficiency and renewable energy projects have been completed to date. The department had already done a number of measures and we wanted to capture that. Um, 
Second was to evaluate what is the efficiency of our current systems and practices so that we could set a baseline. And then third, to identify what are cost-effective measures for us to enhance efficiency, reduce demand, and increase renewable energy generation. So a measure, the measures identified in the plans might be an operational change we could make to our system, it might be a behavioral change, or it might be a capital improvement project. So for regional water reuse, uh, we started with four system audits. We looked at the, the operations at the Laguna treatment plant, uh, biosolids and composting reclamation and geysers. Uh, and based upon the results of those audits, we then did five deeper investigations looking at waste heat at the treatment plant, energy management software, irrigation system optimization, solar photovoltaics, and mechanical digester mixing. Between technical, 10 technical memorandums that were written um, summarizing these investigations, we looked at 61 different potential measures uh, that we could implement. Um, and of those, six were identified uh, to pursue for further investigation. Nine, we were able to implement um, and either are complete or in planning, you know, something like the UV system upgrade. Uh, 25, we chose to not pursue at this time, um, either because of operational infeasibility or increased risk of permit violations um, or because we tested it and didn't work. And then 21 were not recommended, generally because the capital costs outweighed um, the projected savings. For water operations, we had a similar process. Uh, we did a system audit of our water and wastewater systems. Um, and based on the results of this audit and a brainstorming session with staff, uh, we decided upon s seven deeper investigations. The utility management systems, optimizing the pump sequencing, looking at pump efficiency, SCADA programming, solar photovoltaics, uh, looking at our variable frequency drives, and then optimizing time of use rates. Of the nine technical memorandums that um, emerged, we were able to look at 38 potential measures. Um, 10 we would like to pursue for further investigation. Four we have been able to complete or are in planning. Nine or four we will not pursue at this time, and 20 were not recommended uh, for implementation. So bringing this back to Evergreen, um, as Amy said, Evergreen would come at a price premium of an extra 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour um, based upon historical usage, so not taking into account future energy reductions from the EOP. Um, for water, this results in an annual increase of electricity costs of between seven and $800,000 or so. Um, and you'll see I broke it down between regional water reuse and water operations, and the majority is for regional water reuse. It's about 83 to 85%, um, and that, again, is because the treatment plant is the city's single largest user of electricity, so that's in the blue. And then the remaining 15 to 17% or so would be for water operations, and that is the orange bars. To accommodate a cost increase of this magnitude would require a rate increase uh, of about 1% for wastewater rates and about 0.2% for water rates. Um, the calculation based on those increases for an average family of four based on usage would be about 90 cents per month. And again, just a reminder, these are costs based solely on historical usage and not based on future electricity um, consumption, or that actual costs would be subject to future consumption and utility rates. And one more thing um, we wanted to note too is that it's interesting that Evergreen could change the desirability of some of the projects identified in the EOP. Um, for example, solar energy projects that have been cost prohibitive in the past might become cost effective. Um, as the cost of electricity goes up, at a certain point it becomes cheaper to produce our own electricity via renewable sources such as floating solar. So, thank you. 
I mean, thank you. We're gonna go through all different sections and we can ask questions at the end. Um, Assistant City Manager Ned is here as well since uh, all these areas fall within his portfolio and so we'll be able to help answer questions throughout the process. So next is the facilities and I'm gonna turn it over to Doug Williams for that. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Schwedhelm, uh, members of council. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the general fund facilities. And what we're looking at is uh, we're about 25% of the total costs from the enterprise fund. The general fund is 25% of the electrical costs. The facilities represent the pools, the rec centers, public safety buildings, city hall, and that represents about 45% of the general fund. The parks we're looking at about 10%, that's gonna be just lighting and irrigation, street lights and traffic signals is about 45%. Now with the street lights and the traffic signals, we've converted a lot of those over to LED already. So we've done a lot of the energy savings on those um, previously. Now we've come up with several strategies for GHD reduction. Um, we've already completed a facilities assessment in January of 2018, but that doesn't let us know where we can save money and we can help with the greenhouse gas emissions um, and the energy. It just lets us know the condition of our fixed assets. Um, we're looking at an energy audit. Uh, we figure it would cost for the general fund about two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars, based on what Santa Rosa was able to do. Santa Rosa Water, excuse me. Um, we've looked at using the facilities assessment and an energy audit, and we would be able to target with pinpoint accuracy how we can replace some of these failing assets and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and save uh, energy. Uh, the energy, uh, excuse me, uh, public-private partnership, it's similar to what we're talking about with um, a public-private partnership for a whole facility, but we could do that with individual fixed assets like an HVAC unit. Um, the assets would be owned and maintained by the private company and we would lease it back from them. A PG&E on bill financing, uh, the city would borrow um, money from PG&E and that money would be paid back from the savings, the energy savings that, that, we, would, uh, that we would receive. So uh, essentially with a, um, the PG&E on bill financing, is that they would come in, we audit the system, they are able to keep our electricity bill at the same rate and the difference between what we save and what we currently pay, that would be how we would pay back the loan. It, it's the same way with, a, um, with an ESCO. Um, there's energy companies that come in, do something very similar to that as the PG&E uh, on bill financing. And uh, actually today, uh, I just had a meeting with Energy and Sustainability with Santa Rosa Water, and there's a program called Energy Watch, and I just learned about this today, or I'd have it on the slide. And it was previously a program with PG&E and the county for commercial buildings but now they're including municipalities in that. So I'll, I'll be looking into that, um, doing a little bit deeper dive into that when, when I'm able to. We're gonna be setting up a meeting, not next week, but the week after with a representative for Energy Watch. And, for, and that is what I have for the general fund. And I am going to turn it over to Transit. And Yuri Koslin will be presenting this item. Mayor Schwerthelm, Council. Um, I'm presenting on how the Evergreen um, switch would impact transit. So we're, at this point, we're not, use, we're using very, you know, we're using just our building electricity. We have zero electric buses. Um, but with uh, the CPCUs, um, CP, 
see the, the CARB's uh, Innovative Clean Transit Regulation, which requires uh, transit electrification by 2040, um, we would have, there, there's some potential electric, there's significant electrical impacts um, uh, in the future. Um, in this, uh, we were awarded uh, 2.9 million from the FTA uh, for the purchase of our first four electric buses. Um, and recently we have a, there's a statewide uh, Department of uh, General Services contract which will allow us to purchase off that, which we'll be returning to council um, to authorize that purchase. Um, additionally, um, we have uh, just completed the battery electric bus planning and engineering study for city bus, uh, Petaluma Transit, Sonoma County Transit, Mendocino Transit that was sponsored by Sonoma Clean Power. Um, the, this report provides insight into the existing conditions and available technologies recommended for transit fleet electrification over the next five years. Um, and then in, in December, uh, staff received the um, invitation from PG&E for their EV fleet electrification program. Um, this program will extend the electrical vehicle uh, infrastructure at Stony Point for uh, the buses that we expect to be purchasing. Um, and um, they, there will be, PG&E will be covering the costs for uh, bringing the infrastructure in and then uh, providing rebates for the chargers and then the infrastructure costs to connect the chargers. Um, once, the city, once the city is able to approve uh, this contract with PG&E, um, as well as uh, create the purchase order for the buses, which council will approve, then we'll move forward uh, with PG&E on that engineering design and construction. Um, for for that for the charging stations at Stony Point. Um, so the impacts on, um, of the you know the CPUC recently approved PG&E's um, commercial EV rate, which uh, provides commercial electrical vehicle um, fleets with a um, a super off peak rate, which is uh, typically. Uh, in, in the in the morning, so early afternoon, and then there's an off peak, which is the overnight rate, which we can expect to use because we'll be charging at our depot at at, at Stony Point. Um, so, um, you know, it sh it, the the this, the commercial EV rate um, shifts the bulk of the bill away from demand charges and towards energy charges. This will provide much more certainty in our costs for uh, charging our electric vehicles or electric buses. Um, these charts here represent a similar transit fleet of a similar size to city bus um, and show similar diesel costs along with um, the cost of electricity uh, for the commercial EV rate. Um, um, and so we can expect w switching to ele uh, elect our, our electric buses, we can expect a 20% reduction in cost um, from the current diesel equivalent. Um, in summary, um, you know, we don't, the commercial EV rate, nobody's operating on it right now. We're not sure of how that exactly interacts with the uh, Evergreens rate and how those are going to play out. So we're not clear on the exact cost, but we do know uh, that, that we expect four, four of electric buses will use a similar amount of electricity as um, uh, the 25% of uh, the electricity that um, facilities uses. Great, thank you. And so that gives a summary of the different electrical uses throughout the city. Um, we wanted to put this slide up here as a discussion point. Um, some of the items we wanted to talk about was, does the city council want to look towards moving towards uh, off of uh, Clean Start onto Evergreen or remain on Ever, um, Clean Start? Um, look at if we want to start engaging in facilities assessment, as you heard from facilities, in terms of what can be done that hasn't been done yet. Um, and if we do look towards switching to Evergreen, um, addressing the timing, the funding, and, and, if it, and coordinating energy efficiencies with that effort. So those are the discussion points that we came up with and we uh, pitched and we talked about at the subcommittee as well um, that we wanted to bring to the full council. So with that, we'll turn it over to the mayor. Thank you for those presentations. Okay, so again, we'll start with questions from council, then we have uh, many cards uh, for comments from the members of the public, and then we'll come back for the discussion after we get all the questions. So Mr. Dow, do you have a question? Uh, first, I wanted to state uh, that I have been on the, the chairman of one or another of the Sonoma Claim Powers advisory committees. Uh, it's voluntary and not compensatory. 
uh, but I have learned a lot by participating and uh, helping that organization move forward. The one, the question that I have at this point, while I think this report is well done, I was caught by the fact that I believe there's standing state goals that have been established to reduce GHGs 20%, 50% below 1990 levels and whatever, and it's, it seems to always be changing. But my point in bringing that up is this presentation shows the additional cost to the city uh, and its various departments, but I believe there's gonna be a mandate from the state that we have to spend some money reducing GHGs anyway. And so if some of these things, like going all evergreen, um, part of that is, is a mandatory requirement. Uh, so it, it, this, it, this shows a million dollar additional cost, and I don't think that's accurate because of those uh, mandated state goals. It, Would you like to comment on that? Or? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so you're absolutely right, there are a reduction and there, there are goals that the city has. The Climate Action Plan identifies a number of those uh, steps to take towards reducing our greenhouse gas emissions to try to reach those goals. Um, we're gonna be up looking at potentially updating that Climate Action Plan. We're gonna be talking about it at the subcommittee this week. Um, but this is one element of the overall reduction strategy. So there's reduction strategies on uh, facilities on the, on the municipal side that we're talking about today, and there's reduction strategies on the community-wide that we're also gonna be talking about as, as a community um, that, you, that we talked about during the all-electric policy and others. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right, there, is re, there are reduction goals. Um, there are a number of ways to get to that goal. This is one of those from a facility standpoint, from a from municipal operation um, that we're putting out there because there is a, a reduction in it. There was a slide we had early on in the beginning that showed that reduction compared to what we're currently using um, as a city and how that would affect those, those future goals. And, and if I can just add in, I, I think part of the issue is, is uh, uh, Council Member Dowd, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we are being forced through state legislation, regional legislation to begin moving towards a more renewable energy source for a host of issues to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think the question that we're, part of, that part of what we're asking here is, is how do we accomplish that goal? Um, if you remember back to slide two or three, it showed the difference between the Clean Start and the Evergreen. Clean Start is a renewable mechanism for providing uh, clean energy. Evergreen simply is a more, uh, um, has more GHG reductions because of the sources that it's specifically pulling from. So, so as, as Assistant City Manager uh, Guin mentioned, it, it's a function of how deep we want to go. One still accomplishes the goal of reducing our GHGs. We just may have to do more facility adjustments in order to meet our goals in the future, whereas Evergreen, with that additional investment, may help us accomplish that at a faster rate. Thank you. Ms. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question is for Ms. Meyer. Um, can you come back up to the staff table, please? So what struck me as really interesting about this whole proposition is that uh, three quarters of, the, of our energy usage is through our water department. And of that, it seems like three quarters of that is through our regional reuse department um, or arm, and that is an enterprise fund in many ways. Can you um, speak to the non-Santa Rosa municipalities that utilize this water reuse service? Uh, thank you for the question. Do you mean in as far as how we would pay for the cost increase or? What I'm trying to get at here is did we, what assumptions are baked into these projections? Did we assume for just the Santa Rosa portion of the water reuse um, and not uh, account for the fact that we're not gonna be able to use one kind of energy to process Katati's uh, wastewater versus Santa Rosa's wastewater. And I'm trying to understand here when we talk about spending our taxpayer dollars on a, what seems like a really great cause, are we talking about spending Katati's tax dollars as well? Is it, you know, is I that baked, what are the assumptions that are baked into the projections? So the, with the, the data that we have from Sonoma Clean Power and PG&E is just based strictly on um, the meter data that we get. So it's a 
a kilowatt hours for um, the two meters that are at the treatment plant and then the 100 or so meters around the city. So it's not, the data itself, I, I have not parsed out into okay. the various. Um, and I apologize for asking such a detailed question. I see yeah. Director Burke coming down yeah. here. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Jennifer Burke, Director of Santa Rosa Water. So um, the, the charges would be to the entire regional uh, enterprise system, and then those would be allocated out and part of the rate that we charge to Katadi, to Sebastopol, to the county, and to Werner Park. So what percentage of our water reuse, um, and it's okay if you ballpark it for me. So, so Santa Rosa is about 78% mm, or so, between 75 and 80%. Okay, so. Runner Park is somewhere in the 19%, and then Katadi, Spasbull, and County are really small. So we're looking at about a 20% of our wastewater is coming from non-Santa Rosa payers. And so would it be reasonable to assume that of this $1 million price tag, maybe 10 to 15% of it would be covered um, in, through our enterprise? So, so the rate increase that we, we anticipate to cover um, is specifically for Santa Rosa. So the impact to Santa Rosa's bill, um, and then what would be allocated out um, are the other, the percentages would be charged to our partner agencies as well. So it has a rate impact to them as well, but we specifically parsed out what it would mean to Santa Rosa only, the piece that would apply to us of that 750,000 roughly, and that results in a 1% rate increase just for Santa Rosa customers. That's very helpful to understand. Um, the last question I had having to do with that is, um, would those rate increase pass-throughs be uh, consistent with the contracts that we have with these other jurisdictions? So uh, we are starting our budget process, uh, and as part of that, we meet with our sub-regional partners, that's what we call them for the treatment plant. We're providing them information. We let them know that this was something that the council was con contemplating and could provide direction on, and that that would be factored into their budget going forward. So Once again, well, jo well done job by water. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer, do you have a question? I do, thank you, Mayor. Um, something that, confuses me somewhat. So I, I have to assume that, well, maybe not. Is there a, is there a direct line of power that helps um, operate our pumping stations directly from um, the, the Calpine? Is it still Calpine? It may have changed, it's still Calpine. I, I, thought, yeah, I, I thought there was a direct line to, to our pumping yeah. stations. Sorry. Um, so yes, for the geyser system. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. So Calpine does provide the power to the pump stations for our geyser system. Right. Other than that direct um, power delivery, the rest of the power that's generated by that geothermal steam field just goes into onto the grid, does it not? C correct. Thank you. So um, it, indeed, we are. Be because of the contract we have with the, um, the geothermal plant, we are in a sense participating at a fairly high level for uh, producing renewable energy. Yeah, so our, um, it's a great point. Our recycled water does uh, provide recharge to the geyser steam fields, and I believe we anticipate that it provides energy for about 100 uh, 100 households um, for, an, for a year. Sorry, 100,000 households for a year. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So, so the other part of my question is what I don't understand, given that it goes onto the grid, is the increased cost that we would pay by going to, um, from Clean Start to Evergreen, is that for the ability of the, of um, Sonoma Clean Power to develop renewable energy production. What is the nexus between the million dollars and, and, and the, what does the extra cost go to? That's what I'm, that's what I'm curious about. Because if it goes onto the grid and we say that it's coming from renewables and we've got a big plant up on the hill giving us renewables power, what is the nexus between the million dollars that we would be paying to Sonoma Clean Power other than a line on our bill. 
uh, I'm Nathan Kinsey, I'm uh, the commercial accounts manager with Snow Clean Power. So essentially, the premium that's gonna be associated with the power that would be going to the city would be related to contracts that we have to sign directly with Calpine the Geysers. So the, the power that is being serviced to the city right now would then no longer be the source. And so we'd have to negotiate new contracts with the geysers to facilitate this power. So that's where the, the premium or the cost increase is associated. Does, does that make sense or? In, in kind of a smoky way. Yes, okay. it does. It's still, it still seems like phantom figures to me. It's electricity, unless you have a very, very large battery set up, the power's on the grid and it's produced and it goes away. It doesn't sit anywhere waiting for us sure. to use it from a particular source. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm having a little trouble. I, and, I, and I think part of my concern about spending a million dollars for this smoky figure um, is that is, is my desire to look at the possibility of doing our own energy generation, which would could, which could indeed be a direct um, asset to us, creating our own power, which has a line directly from that generation to a receiver, which might be a pumping station, whatever it might be. So that's I'm trying to justify or figure out how anyone justifies spending an extra million dollars on energy that that's because of a contract we sign, as opposed to the actual delivery of that power to the city of Santa Rosa to our various needs. Sure, sure, and I understand that. I mean, I think one of the things to think about is the fact that that power source is basically representing a new supply into the grid where an old supply that might have a larger greenhouse gas emission factor associated with it is no longer going to be on the grid. And so when you're increasing that renewable service, that's new power going into the wires. I understand that you know, the electron is just sitting on the wires regardless of if it's generated at that source or it's generated down in Southern California. You know, all power is put onto the grid and as electron, it just sits there and moves around. Um, so it's difficult to to, to, to physically see this source is tied to this region, it's tied to these accounts. But that, that is the way that it's going on and really the way to think about this best is that you're supplementing and removing that non-renewable source of power and taking it offline and then putting this new power into the grid. So that new contract that would be executed would facilitate more geothermal being produced at that location on behalf of the city. Thank you, and this, my, this next question, I think is probably my final question. Um, I'm not sure who to answer, maybe, maybe uh, it's, um, maybe it's you. Um, so indeed, that million dollars that we're spending could indeed, we could purchase um, solar, a solar array or part of a solar array um, that could directly feed energy to one of our users, um, or we could pay Sonoma Clean Power another million dollars to sign a, to have show on a contract that we're getting cleaner power. So they could either be direct or somewhat indirect, in a in a way in a way of saying, correct. I, I that is correct, and, and what I'm the way that I'm viewing that, I'm, I'm sure the city staff would have um, their own opinions in terms of how that's going to look. So, or or it might even be in energy audits and and upgrades. Yeah. So, council member, sorry, that's that's exactly what Claire was mentioning earlier. When you think about the water's portfolio, the concept of increasing the um, to evergreen may cause us to actually spend money on more renewable sources that we're generating to reduce the actual amount of kilowatt hours that we're buying from Sonoma Clean Power. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I think the more energy that we produce locally on our properties that service our own facilities and reduce the demand that we take from Sonoma Clean Power, then you're offsetting the costs 
associated with increasing going from uh, going all the way to Evergreen. Part of why you're hearing the facility side of the house say we need to do an energy audit first as opposed to just jumping straight in is partly this reason because we're, we think that it, we may have more symmetry in investment strategy if we do some energy improvements as well as generation combined with the increase in cost for going to Evergreen, we may be able to balance the costs out and double the amount of GHG emission reduction that we have. So, so we want to be strategic. Water's done a fantastic job of sort of leading the city in this way. They've already done the audits. They've already evaluated where the bang for their buck is when it comes to reducing their commitment to fossil fuel type of generation. And that's allowing them to say, you know, we think it's only a one, we're, we're pretty confident it's only a 1% increase in order to jump to Evergreen. And if we do that, maybe we'll strategize and use that investment a little bit differently. So, so I, I mean, they've done a great job of being a model. Um, and what you've seen in the three different portions of the organization that presented is they're all at different stages. Um, and and it's, it, this is kind of an exciting opportunity for us to really think and strategize how they will all move differently through the system. I appreciate it. It's very helpful. Thank you. And, and real quick, I was going to say, um, you know, one of the things to think about is, is in terms of the timeline that it would take. So capital improvement project for the city could take months, if not a year plus. Your guys' switch to Evergreen could happen as soon as you guys were to elect to do so. Um, and then as soon as we get that information over uh, on our side, we can make that switch upon the next meter read. So it's, it's very quick. Yeah, and, and but, uh, I think that's one of the, one of the important, or one of the um, attractive pieces is that it, it could, that that's, that um, change in the production or, it's, or the source could be immediate. And, and we love our partners at Sonoma Clean Power, but they also are not managing your fiscal uh, agency. And remember that it, while it is a quick switch, it also might prevent some of the other uh, work that the, the, the uh, the part of the organization, the facilities part of the organization is requesting you to consider happen because we are um, a very tight organization in terms of having resources to apply to these opportunities and that's why Water took the approach they did so that they could be ready to accept this, this particular opportunity. Um, um, you know, uh, I, I respect our colleague uh, for Sonoma Clean Power, but he's not looking at our books and not looking at the flexibility that you have to do that type of work. So it is a quick switch, but it might prevent or delay some of that efficiency work because you may not have the resources to do that efficiency work. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just on this slide, uh, David, maybe you're the right person to ask this, just from a fundamental uh, understanding uh, why if we switch all of the municipal buildings over to green energy uh, why is our GHD reduction while 53 percent is great why do we still have that 799 uh, in in, two, in 2018 where does that carbon uh, impact come from if all of the energy is going to be renewable energy Yeah, so the 799 is really associated with the, the source. So there is fugitive emissions that come from the geysers facility. Um, and so that's directly reflected in that data. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a very small proportion of emissions by comparison to other sources, but it, it is a reality of the sources. So it's basically, it is uh, emissions that come from the creation of the renewable energy. Correct. Right. And then, uh, Back to, to Council Member Sawyer's uh, question, does the PCIA or the indifference charge, does that play in at all to the increased cost for the city? Uh, put another way, does Sonoma Clean Power pass some of that charge on to the local jurisdiction? In the Evergreen premium? Yeah. No. Okay. No. The, the, the PCIA is a real cost, and, and I recognize that, but that is not something that has been attributed to the development of the price that we have that we've signed for this contract sources um, directly, so no. Yeah, and if you could just really fast, uh, for the public's uh, benefit, could you explain what the PCIA is? Uh, yeah, so the, the power charge and difference adjustment is a fee that PG&E imposes upon um, entities like Snow Clean Power to basically have the customers that have taken their generation 
business away from, from the, the investor-owned utility and moved it to a different entity like Sonoma Clean Power. So PG&E has signed long-term contracts. Some have recently gone online. Some have gone online 15 years ago and are expiring soon. Some are yet to go online. So that's why there's volatility in the price. And it has increased over time, and that's something that we're always trying to get more definitive information about. I haven't seen, nor do I think our staff has seen calculations definitively that, that really show how that cost is coming and how it's going to change. Um, but it's essentially the, the contracts PG&E have already negotiated, and as a result of customers departing load, PG&E would be left to cover those costs, um, and the CPUC has approved PG&E to recover a certain fee from their customers associated with that. And do we pay some of the PCIA in Clean Start? Is, is that a benefit to Evergreen that we no longer as a jurisdiction to help shoulder that load, or is in both Clean Start and Evergreen, do we not have that charge passed on to our customers? No, the, the PCA fee is something that is explicitly within PG&E's scope of charges. So it's not it's not something factored into to our rates at all. Great, that's yeah. helpful. Thank you so much. We just usually try to communicate about the PCA cost to our customers holistically so they understand that Charges, I mean, if the PCA didn't exist, our rates could be 20, 30% lower. We like to factor that in when we talk to customers about the fact if you're to be with us on Clean Start or on Evergreen, that cost is associated with it and our rates are still more affordable. Yeah, and I know that that's uh, baked in by the legislature, some of how that works. Is there a possibility as Sonoma Clean Power has been established longer and longer that some of those contracts that you're talking about would have expired, and therefore the PCI will go down and, and, and lower the overall rate? Yes, I, I do believe that that will be a case, uh, a, a matter of the PCI reducing. I think that time frame as to when it's going, where we would actually see it start to go down could be years and years away, and there might be times where it's going to increase in the future. But I do think that over time, it would go down, but that could be years. Great, thank you. Sure. Great. Any additional questions? Mr. Alvarez? Thank you, Mayor. I was wondering if there's any other information or discussion that was had at the subcommittee that might be helpful in today's discussion. Not more than this. I mean, I, I think the whole emphasis was, let's bring it to the entire council, because I think all seven of us need to hear this information. Unless, okay. Do you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I think that the discussion, uh, and it was uh, the mayor and I were the, the two council members at the subcommittee level. The discussion was entirely around meeting our, our climate goals uh, and understanding that there might be other opportunities to look at where we do our own generation that also come with them an associated staff cost. Of, of having staff have to do the research and do the drive. And so one of the things that was very attractive was the ability for us to have somebody else's staff shoulder the load and we reap the benefit from it. And the other thing with our subcommittee is climate action. So we're really, let's push in that action part rather than talk about it at several different subcommittee meetings. Let's bring it here and see if we can take some action. Thank you. Ms. Vice Mayor. One more question that I uh, thought of while I was listening to Council Member Sawyer talk is that, and this is kind of a philosophical question, I don't have a specific expectation of Director Nutt, or excuse me, City Manager, Assistant City Manager Nutt, you being able to answer this question, um, but we as a, as a city, I know, have tremendous amounts of facilities that we are challenged to maintain. And we talk about that some of the pain of spending this money on Evergreen might help us to build and maintain facilities. We, I'm, I'm guessing that you don't have a number in mind of what it would cost for us to develop the facilities and infrastructure to produce the amount of energy that we'd be purchasing from Evergreen in the city of Santa Rosa? No, at this point I don't, and that's part of why we want to undertake that energy audit. We want to understand clearly what our options are, not only to either compensate and be fully fully sourced on site, uh, or to minimize the amount of per power we may have to purchase moving forward, or if just purchasing Evergreen does what we need to be able to accomplish our GHG goals. and 
do energy efficiency improvements throughout each of the facilities. I, I don't have a number right now, and, and that's and, and we, we'd like to try to understand that more clearly. And I'm not expecting that you would have an answer, but I would, I'm looking forward to hearing from my council members after we hear from the public about the, the difference between um, our commitment to our facilities and being energy independent, if that's a direction that the public and our council wants to go, versus um, doing something immediately for which the price tag is high, but the responsibility is low. And I welcome the public to comment on this and be very interested to hear what you think. Thanks. Any additional questions? Do we have a cards on this item? Thank you. Okay, uh, for those of you that weren't here the last couple of weeks, we have two podium up there, or you can come on down. There's a microphone right behind the staff table there. Uh, you're welcome to choose any of those three locations. First up, uh, Avani Barton, followed by Ella Crenshaw. Good afternoon, members of the council and Mayor Schwedhelm. My name is Ivani, and I am here as a sophomore at Sonoma Academy to ask you to help our city move to 100% renewable energy by committing to the Evergreen program. As, a Sonoma County, as Sonoma County residents and students have seen firsthand, climate change has affected our community so drastically. This last October, we had to miss school for multiple days because of the bad air quality from the fires, and I noticed increasing anxiety in my little sisters. Ramona, who is seven, woke up every morning scared to go about her daily routine because she didn't know when she'd have to get up and leave her home. Rigby, who is three, was upset because she had to miss preschool and not see her best friend, Leo, for almost two weeks. But the hardest part was not missing out on my normal routine or not being able to see my friends. The hardest part for me is watching my little sisters view this as the new normal. They've known nothing but polluted air and climate anxiety. I don't want this to be what they picture when they think of fall in Sonoma County. I don't accept that this is our future, and neither should you. So I want to thank you for all the work you have done on the behalf of the city of Santa Rosa, and I ask you for the health of our city and more largely our world to please commit to the Evergreen program. Thank you. Thank you. Ella Crenshaw, followed by Nancy Carter. Hello. Uh, my name is Ella, and I'm a 16-year-old who is a concerned resident of Santa Rosa. I am very worried for the state of our planet and my future and my children's future. Most scientists agree that at the rate which we are producing greenhouse gas, um, our Earth will heat to a point of irreversibility by 2050. At this rate, Santa Rosa could be 15 degrees warmer than current temperatures by 2100. At this point, my children's generation will barely be adults. These gloomy facts and more about the state of the environment are constantly on my mind. Every day, I face anxieties about my future. In 20 years, will I have a healthy planet to live on, or does my future hold dystopian-like realities? Will I get to enjoy hiking, skiing, and running in the parks that I love so much, or will the air be so polluted that I can't even go outside? These questions haunt and stress me daily. This is a generational justice issue. Climate change will disproportionately affect younger generations, and it is the biggest issue of our time. I find hope from these thoughts when I see what the city of Santa Rosa has already done to combat climate change. I greatly appreciate my city's efforts to increase electric cars, as well as declaring climate emergency. While these steps are going in the right direction, we need more urgent action. Our climate is near a tipping point and cannot support any more greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> For this reason, I want to urge you to switch to the Sonoma Clean Power Evergreen Program. Last year, I got to work with my school to change our power source to the Evergreen Program, and we officially switched to 100% renewable energy in July. We did this because we see how urgent climate action is needed, and this is a huge impact change that can be made right now. Furthermore, my school wants to be a leader in sustainability and a model to other schools of what we should strive to achieve. The city of Santa Rosa can do the same. If we switch to the Evergreen program, we can become a model city in sustainability, as well as taking a swift and effective climate action to, pre to protect future generations. The Evergreen program is also 100% local renewable energy, so the switch would support and produce local jobs in renewable energy. While the upfront cost is expensive, it would save money in the long term through lessening the effects of climate-related disasters. As climate change worsens, it will increase the deadly effects of natural disasters and the cost of them. 
For example, it is estimated that the Tubbs fire cost $1.2 billion in damage. Please consider my future and the future of younger generations and switch to the Evergreen program. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Carter, followed by Fatima <laughs> Rojas. Mayor Schwedham and members of the council, my name is Nancy Carter and I'm a teacher in Santa Rosa. Um, thank you for holding public comment again on this issue and attentively listening to students as they express their concern for a changing climate. I know you share their same concern. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to appreciate that this council made the wise and bold decision to elevate their climate action plan to a tier one priority level also boldly passing the ban on natural gas and new construction and declaring a climate emergency. All of this is a testament to your commitment to a livable climate for current and future generations. We see you. Thank you for being climate champions. Santa Rosa is poised to become a national leader in the implementation of a climate action plan. The Evergreen program is an extremely unique CCA to offer 100% local renewable energy. It is the first utility in California to do so. We are currently the only county in the state that has this option. It's essential that we participate in Evergreen to demonstrate to other cities and counties in California and others nationwide a model for boosting local renewable energy while creating jobs and supporting our local economy. Switching to Evergreen is the number one thing you can do to make the biggest impact in meeting your climate goals right now. And this is the case. Um, this is also the case a group of students at Sonoma Academy made to school board members last year. The board agreed that switching into the Evergreen program was more cost effective to meet its greenhouse gas targets than capital improvements. But also because the board knew it was the right thing to do. Because more small incremental change in the face of our impending crisis does not protect children. Action must be bold, and the city of Santa Rosa right now has the opportunity to lead. I've brought more letters from high school students who couldn't skip their class today to be here. These letters join the others that we submitted to the Climate Action Subcommittee this fall. Please join the cities of Sonoma, Sebastopol, Katati, and others to make the switch to the Evergreen program. Thank you. Thank you. Fatima Rojas, followed by Colleen Fernald. <laughs> Hello, members of the council and Mayor Schwedholm. My name is Fatima. I am a 15-year-old resident of Santa Rosa, and I am concerned about how my future is going to be affected by climate change. We've made choices that affect the environment without thinking about the consequences. Climate change is a generational justice issue. Our youth are going to suffer the worst part of these consequences unless we act. Future generations might not even be able to go play outside in the park because of the poor air quality. Even though impacts related to climate change can be seen all over the world, we don't have to look far. This past October, the Kincaid fire caused great loss. Even though wildfires are common in California, climate change intensifies them, therefore causing much more destruction. During the fires, most students could not go to school due to the poor air quality and evacuations. These natural disasters don't just cost money, but quality of life. I am here today to urge you to switch to the Sonoma Clean Power Evergreen Program. Switching to 100% local renewable energy would not only help improve our local economy, but also create more local jobs. The Evergreen Program actually removes greenhouse gas emissions by promoting local solar projects instead of relying on existing hydroelectric power in the Clean Start Program. Our sustainability leadership group at school worked with our board to switch over to the Evergreen Program even though it costs more. Santa Rosa is, all doing, is already doing great, but um, for example, the climate action plan and the increase in people using electric cars and choosing Evergreen is the next step. If we switch over to 100% local renewable energy, we will be an example for other cities across uh, the United States, even though making the switch to Evergreen might be seem more expensive, investing in renewable energy now will save money long-term from climate-related disasters. I ask that you please take great consideration into switching to the Sonoma Clean Power Evergreen Program. Thank you. Thank you. Colleen Fernal, followed by Dwayne DeWitt. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the mother of a Sonoma Academy student who's not with us, Charlotte Molinari. And Charlotte would tell you 
I was just like Greta, the girl who's Times Person of the Year ever s since she knew me. Because I saw Soylent Green in 1973 and they used the word the greenhouse gas effect. So I've been standing up for this for a long time. So much so that after 9-11, I created the Sebastopol Sustainability Conference and Festival. Through that, we created the Sebastopol Clean Power, and you adopted it for Sonoma Clean Power, not the one that isn't municipally owned. It was the cities looking into it. Your former council member and Mayor Jane Bender selected me to re represent you when the Climate Action Protection Campaign is putting forth the community to develop your climate action plan. And I have some really important questions to ask you about your decision. What return on investment do you get from renting your power, your real estate, or anything? With regards to climate changing gases, pure water vapor is a climate changing gas which is what comes out of the geysers, except is it pure? It's your wastewater. It's where there are severe contaminants. They wouldn't even have power if it wasn't for yours. Who built the pipeline up there? Why doesn't the city of Santa Rosa co-own that? And have you ever done the analysis on what those heat trapping gases of just your water vapor are doing to change the climate? Did you slow down your contributions to the atmospheric river when we were being flooded? These are important questions that were never asked or answered, except I asked them. So, what good does it do? What happened to Charlotte Anna Molinari? She came with me the day before 9-11 to what? Where SMUD was keeping the lights on. When we were being Enron and PG&E, which by the way, is a criminal entity now in bankruptcy. The lawyer lobbyist for Sonoma Clean Power, the same lawyer lobbyist for PG&E and station casinos. So you want to rent more power to create unknown consequences here by increasing, thinking that the geysers is green, because you've not done the analysis, because no one listened. You need to listen. And what else is in that? Is it just water vapor? Are there heavy metals? Is there anything left over from your wastewater treatment? Is it a really good idea where there's seismic activity to increase the risk with the pressure of inserting that wastewater there. All these other factors around emergency protection, when really, you could have solar on every parking lot you own. And Thank every you, Colleen. Other Dwayne DeWitt. <clears throat> Hello, thank you for your time, sir. My name is Dwayne DeWitt. I appreciated the comments that Mr. Sawyer had made and his question about asking what does the $1 million do and what will it go to. I think it's important as we consider this type of a topic that we look back to 25 years ago when the topic was about moving water from here to the geysers. Sooner or later that contract has to come up for renegotiation Mr. Dowd may remember that I would come before the Board of Public Utilities and ask them to see if they could get money because water's a commodity. Just a penny per gallon for what we send up there would raise a substantial amount of money and it would be able to pay for some of these things you're talking about here. I'm uncertain if you need to switch to a different power company and a different approach if you were to work with Calpine at the geysers, you could perhaps find a way to do that totally 100% local energy production for Sonoma County by having it done there at the geysers and distributed in Sonoma County. With us getting back a financial return because we had that commodity of water, which we sold instead of giving away. So I hope that they'll be looking at that if they do any type of an audit. It's an important point. Water is a commodity, even if it is a bit contaminated. And we've given away billions and billions of gallons of that water. Just putting a penny on a gallon and having it be in some sort of a financial negotiation with Calpine and energy production could actually help to lower ratepayers' costs and the city's costs 
and allow you to go forward with what appears to be answering an unfunded mandate from the state. I've heard here that you're being required to do that and the state isn't funding you to do it. So I hope you'll find a way to get um, compensation, reimbursement for the commodities that we give away at this time and then find a way to generate energy within our community such as these students wanted with 100% local energy production for Sonoma County. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dwayne. Bring it back to council. Any additional questions from any of those comments? Mr. Rogers? Yeah, either Director Ewan or, or Director Burke, excuse me, Assistant City Manager Ewan or Director Burke, what's the average water rate or, or water bill currently for the city? So if we're adding, if, if this is the direction that the council wants to go, and it was, uh, it looked like 90 cents a month would be what would be added to the average water bill. What is the current average water bill? Thank you, you know, um, uh, Council Member Rogers, I don't have that information right on the top of my head, I apologize. Um, but we can get that back to the council. It, we've calculated bills about what the average family of four would um, would spend and we can get that back to you. But on of that, for this particular piece, it would be an additional 90 cents. And I'm sorry, I should have had that information with me. No, it's all good. I just, I'd be curious to see that um, because we do talk about uh, how many folks are struggling to pay uh, their bills in the, in, the, in the community. And I know that we do have a low income uh, program that we try to do as well. Uh, and so I'd be curious to see how that would impact things. And we do have our H2O program, which does provide for um, offsetting the fixed charge for those that do qualify. And we have looked um, recently, we've up updated that program to provide for the entire fixed charge, whereas before we were providing 50% 50, 50 of that. Um, so, so that program still is available for those that qualify. Mr. Dabb, you had questions? I, I wanna to respond to the comment made by uh, Mr. DeWitt and I was the chair of the Board of Public Utilities when we were going through trying to find a solution to remove a cease and desist order that the subregional system had for a uh, raw sewage spill at the Laguna treatment plant in the winter of 84, 85. It took um, about 14 years to get an EIR approved uh, for the project which was selected and that was the geysers. There was discussion at the time by the board and the city council uh, to consider um, various options, which one of them was should we buy into the ownership of the geysers, which was then controlled by Unical. And the decision was that probably wasn't a good place for us to go as a municipality and a general partner in the subregional system because of the risk of getting into private business is what it really amounted to. And our real issue at that time is we had to get off the cease and desist order that was costing our ratepayers significant money. And the geysers came out of um, the, the blue uh, and they offered to put $50 million into their system to receive our water and they have constantly paid for the power from the Alexander Valley up the mountain to the, the Mayakama steam field. So uh, it's not that, that we couldn't see the agreement um, trend in different directions over time, but that's not an issue before us at this point. And I, I think looking at today's study session agenda, we have a responsibility to look at ways to reduce GHG and do it economically and effectively. And I see in my own mind that it's probably a combination of moving towards Evergreen as the studies show it to be meaningful and economic, and at the same time look at our own facilities to generate our own power. We have a lot of land out at the Laguna treatment plant where we could put in solar systems on the ponds or on uh, irrigation areas that we use. So I think there's, I think the proper solution in this is to continue pushing this concept forward and eventually probably get to Evergreen 
and also provide more of our own energy. Okay, any additional questions? Oh. No. Um, Mr. Goen, so this is a study session, so you, you're just looking for some feedback from the council. Could you uh, reframe the feedback that you would like from us, and then we'll go through each council member, and here she'll give you feedback. Yes, thank you. So I think the, the feedback we're looking for is, as we're heading into the budget cycle is what would the council like this, the staff to look at as we prepare the budget in terms of uh, re remaining on clean start, shifting towards evergreen, um, engaging in audits um, through either the facilities or others, and um, if we do switch to Evergreen, any input on timing um, and coordinating with energy efficiency efforts. And, Great. And if I can, if I can add, and, and if you have any additional questions that you want us to come back with, if we bring this at uh, the budget cycle. Great. Sure, Ms. Vice Mayor. I just wanted to clarify when we talk about it being a million dollars. We're talking about, and in the context of the budget is what you're asking for clarification about, we're talking about a quarter of it being not funded essentially by water. So are we talking about $250,000 to our budget as an impact? That's the estimate at this point, okay, yes. Okay, so Correct. that's a very different number than a million. Correct. Okay. Okay, Mr. Rogers, why don't you start the feedback opportunity. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I did have a chance to see this and push this forward at, at the subcommittee level. I think we saw it twice, if not three times, to have discussions. Uh, for me, uh, I, I completely uh, support moving forward with this. If you look at the city's budget, uh, including the enterprise fund, it's $439 million. That means that the, the full switch over to Evergreen is 0.002% of the city's budget. If you look at just the general fund, uh, the 250,000, as the vice mayor just pointed out, it's 0.0015% of the general fund. Uh, I know that those are big numbers. I know that we have been struggling, but this is a tier one priority for our community. And if you told me I could spend 0.0015% of the general fund and end up coming out of it with a 53% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions, I think that most folks in the public would see that as, as a victory. Now what I am open to in the budget is if uh, what I'm hearing from, from Mr. Nutt is that he would like to do a facilities uh, approach to it first on that side uh, to go through and find efficiencies and, and do the audit uh, on our buildings before we make those switches, I'd be open to that in the budget conversation. Uh, that would mean that we would still end up seeing a 75% uh, switch through Santa Rosa Water, which has already gone through this approach of trying to find efficiencies. I'd be open to that. I do wanna see us get there sooner rather than later though, of doing the full evergreen implementation. And then to Councilmember Sawyer's point, we also need to continue to drive forward on other types of infrastructure that will lower our usage, which will also end up lowering the rates long-term uh, on the public as well. To me, it's not an either or. To me, it's a yes and, as it usually is with uh, issues that address climate change. Uh, and so I'll be looking for that in the budget for sure. Mr. Dowd. Um, I, I concur with the council member uh, Rogers' statements in that we we move in this direction of re getting towards a being an evergreen participant uh, with Sonoma Clean Power. At the same time, we are looking at our facility to see where there's other things that we can do uh, to overall reduce the cost of our power. Mr. Olivares? Yes, I would say absolutely we need to look at how we can get there. I think we've always been a big leader in uh, doing more than what is required as, as it relates to uh, climate and the environment. Uh, so whatever we need to do to get there, uh, I, I fully support. If it means we have to engage in some type of audits to get there, that's fine. Uh, but I think uh, we need to start moving forward without, real, without any significant delay. I think it is a priority for us. So uh, this, as soon as we get that information that we need for the budget and even our discussions with our goal setting as well. Thank you, Mr. Sawyer. 
Thank you, Mayor. I agree with Councilmember Oliveras about the expedition of this. We do need to be to move as quickly as possible. I, I, I kind of flip a little bit on uh, on the priority. I want to make sure that whatever we do um, after energy audits and upgrades and energy efficiency efforts, um, that we are responsible and highly effective in, in how we move forward. Um, I see the um, sticking with 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 clean start for the for the time being i'm seeing the evergreen as a um kind of a um a capper um if you will after we decide what is really necessary what we can do ourselves we for all i know we may be talking about our own um uh, energy company. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Hillsburg has one, so um, or they, they have their own program. Um, th it's those kinds of conversations, actually, that I think will take us uh, well into well into the 21st century. And uh, so I'm I'm looking for uh, for the for that um, for more information. Uh, I'm not sure what part of our energy use uh, needs to come out of Evergreen. Um, but I'm willing to, with with that dedication to a to um, expediting these studies um, wherever we can, the audits and upgrades, et cetera, um, and then keep in keep in mind always the um, the option of pardon me um, the option of of engaging uh, Sonoma Clean Power to, to give us the uh, the evergreen ultimately um, to fill that gap. Um, it is attractive, the, the being being able to just to, to um, kind of make a phone call and make the switch is, does have an attraction to it, but I am concerned about how we can most effectively use um, the funds that we would be um, uh, expending uh, immediately on, the, on that program, even though it is less than, than, it, than it was before. I mean, the million dollar figure um, is perhaps not, Exactly accurate. I mean, it has a depending on the way you look at it, but um, I'm very much interested in doing some more analysis and, and being really responsible. Even though it is not that expensive to our ratepayers to make the change, um, I might want to be using to go to our ratepayers and ask them for even you know two dollars um, to get some really important work done that will bring us into the future. Thank you. Ms. Weissmeyer. Thank you, and uh, I echo the vast majority of the sentiments of my fellow council members uh, and had written down yes and before uh, council member Rogers said it, so yes and two times. Uh, the way that I look at this is that it's a ready-baked public-private partnership. We have the ability to flip a switch and not bear the burden of the infrastructure for getting one of our tiered priorities done for a cost to the city of a quarter million dollars. We spent a few million dollars just a few weeks ago on police radios and we're quibbling about a major initiative and how it's gonna get done for a fraction of the cost. I mean, when we think about public safety, when we think about our future generations, energy sustainability has to be part of it and absolutely, we do need to look at audits, but I don't believe that our children and women and children and elderly people are the most impacted by this climate emergency. We cannot wait. So when it comes to the part that's the city budget, uh, the non-enterprise bit of $250,000, I think that that's an absolute no-brainer. When we get to the water side of it, I'm fully in support with the caveat that our water billing, is, this is going to disproportionately affect lower income families and that when you live at higher elevations, your water has to get pumped one, two, three times, and that sucks up the vast majority of the cost of some of these water rates. And so I, I really do question the equity that is baked into our water billing system. And under Prop 218, it is not against the law to charge people what it costs, and I hope that as we go forward and as we continue to lean on our enterprise funds to fill the gap, that we really do so with a mind toward equity and fairness for our lower income families that live down the hill. Thank you. And I also, um, full steam ahead with the Evergreen. Um, I get balancing it. You know, you look at this building here from 1969. Uh, if we did the audit of this building, it'd probably be scary. You know, when we started the meeting, I'm seeing you know, employees on top of the roof. So I get the city's infrastructure has some big needs. So I think you know where the council will we want to get there. Let's do it as smart as we can, as quickly as we can, but we can't drop everything else. But I think this is a big priority. One of our mottos, we want to be leading the North Bay. You know, there's other cities that have been mentioned, but I think we do need to walk 
our talk, and this is important, so I do appreciate, A, the presentation and the direction that this council is going moving forward. So thank you very much for that. Did you get everything you needed? That's, per that's perfect, thank you so much. Teeing it up for you, thank you for giving us that feedback. Okay, we are gonna take uh, approximately a four minute break. We'll reconvene at four o'clock.
up, give a little thing of motion. Are we on again? Okay, let's reconvene today's city council meeting, Santa Rosa City Council. Uh, Madam City Clerk, can we have an announcement of the roll call? Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council member Tibbetts. Great, thank you so much. Uh, there is no closed session. Um, Mr. City Manager, you just wanna do a quick report on the study session? Great, thank you. All right, proclamations. Is there a Mr. Paul Cronin in the house? If you'd like to step down here, sir, and I. <clears throat> It's really uh, my pleasure to read this proclamation. Uh, for me, having been part of or watching down in Southern California, the two previous Cardinal Newman High School football teams that played for the state championships, not quite as successful as this team did, so it's really uh, an honor and privilege to recognize this. Before I read the proclamation, I also want to make um, just some comments that uh, due to your leadership, Paul, currently on our Santa Rosa Police Department, there's at least seven different former players of yours that are now serving the city of Santa Rosa. I know we have two of our female police officers are also graduates of either Ursula or Cardinal Newman, so it sets the stage. I know Mr. Graham Rutherford here, is here, but the community, uh, the commitment to the community from Cardinal Newman is just beyond reproach, so thank you all for being here. And it's my uh, privilege to read this proclamation. Whereas the Cardinal Newman High School football team won the California Interscholastic Federation Division 3 AA State Championship, the Northern California Regional Championship, the North Coast Section Division 4 Championship, and the North Bay League Oak Championship with a 14-1 record, and whereas the city of Santa Rosa especially celebrates the rock and 33 Santa Rosa resident players and coaches who dedicated themselves to hours of practice, study, travel, games and service work, and whereas the city of Santa Rosa wishes to recognize the accomplishments and contrib contributions of all those involved with Cardinal Newman High School football, including head coach Paul Cronin for exceeding the 200 win mark in his coaching career, and whereas the city of Santa Rosa acknowledges the difficult past three years for Cardinal Newman High School in overcoming fire damage, smoke disruption, power outages, a coin flip, and loss of homes. Now therefore it be resolved that I, Tom Schwedhelm, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa on behalf of the entire City Council, commend Cardinal Newman High School and recognize their accomplishment as the 2019 CIF 3AA State Championship football team. I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Sweathelm and the council for honoring our team. I would like to point out that 13 and one was not the record. So I don't know if they get an amendment that, that it's a 14 and one just to be right. But um, I will say that we're trying to get all the police officers to come from Cardinal High School. So I get less tickets throughout um, my <laughs> next 20 years here. But thanks a lot, I really appreciate it. And I'd like to commend this group of athletes that spent so much time and hard work and they're tremendous kids and young adults, I should say, and their parents. And, uh, we're blessed to have you guys in our community. Thank you. And this is just our first time, so you're all welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. We'll probably be going until eight o'clock tonight, so feel free to stick around. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we have our next proclamation. I think, Mr. Sawyer, you have that. Do you want it? You want it? It's, 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 yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was looking at that trick.
Nancy, are you going to come down to, to receive this proclamation? Okay, well, you can, so you two can kind of uh, come forward. Nancy, don't make us start calling like the, an ambulance or anything. We be careful over there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so whereas the Redwood Empire Chinese Association is holding their 20, 2020 Chinese New Year celebration at the Veterans Memorial Building of Santa Rosa, California on February 1st, 2020, and whereas we would like to publicly recognize the importance of this intercultural organization in the fields of cultural education by offering community participation, organizational networking, public interactions with intercultural activities, and their many additional events which bring members, friends, and families into social contact and understanding with governmental agencies and diverse people through events such as their Chinese New Year celebration, potluck socials, multicultural po poetry reading, and many additional cultural events. And whereas we acknowledge the outstanding work done by the Redwood Chinese Redwood Empire Chinese Association in providing programs to children and youth by giving presentations to local schools from elementary through college levels, for providing lion dancers who perform with, th with three dragons, and for providing opportunities for children to perform at community events, as well as pr for providing an active youth group which focuses on teen uh, self-esteem and positive community involvement and for the RECA's annual scholarship for Sonoma County High School seniors. And whereas we also acknowledge the benefits of the Redwood Empire Chinese Association's adult programs, including the Adult Chorus, Adult Tai Chi Club, the RECA's community involvement in assisting governmental agencies, businesses, and schools when, when, with requested assistance in matters concerning Chinese and Asian cultural and language issues. Now therefore, be it resolved that Tom Schwedhelm, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, to hereby acknowledge the success of the Redwood Empire Chinese Association signed by the mayor on this date. Congratulations. Thank you. Looks like it's so honor every year we're here to receiving proclamation. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry we cannot bring the, the Lion thing today because the kids is in the school. Um, I know we have a few concert already respond coming to our event. I'm really glad. I'm sorry, Tom, you cannot be there. Also, John, you have to be a phoenix. But it's okay, every year you are there, support us. I want to bring our new member, also it's gonna be active in our uh, RECA, the Re uh, Henry Huang. Um, so today I invite him to come in to receiving the, this proclamation with me. Thank you. I hope the public know, we already know this New Year event, 600 people with our wonderful cultural program and the dinner too. I brought a little bit of candies. And Nancy, your event is this Saturday, correct? At the Vets building? Yes. Six o'clock. Yes. Tickets still available? Uh, yes. Yeah. Great. We have a three Colonel Newman Chinese students come to our event doing the volunteer work. Great. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Mr. McClinn, do we have a fire recovery and rebuild update report? Yes, I'd like to invite Mr. Osborne down and uh, we'll go from there.
Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedholm and members of the council. I'd like to take the opportunity today to provide a brief update on the permit status and the rebuild, as well as some operational changes that we've made recently to the permit center. Um, the last update we've provided to council, the last substantial update on the rebuild status was really took place in December. And at that point, we were talking about the Bureau of Veritas Amendment. And we talked a lot about the service delivery in year three, and the focus was really placed on tracking the service delivery with the volume. And what we've seen, we're really in the early stages of this year, but we continue to actually see fairly significant volumes. So the total permit count, so these are the number of units that are either in the plan review process under construction or our final is 2,322. And how we're seeing that breakdown is about 1,300 of the units are in Coffee Park and around 1,000 are in Fountain Grove. So the Coffee Park percentage is 96% are in some phase of the permit process. And in Fountain Grove, that's about 72% that are in some phase of the permit process. Um, so when we really look at the delivery of services, we like to track that with the amount of permits that come in monthly to see what those trends look like. And in the last, quarter of 2019, we started to see permit volumes that were roughly around 30 to 40 a month. We saw a significant spike at the end of the year, which is usually the seasonal spike of 80, and now we're seeing more in the 10 to 12 range. So when we see that permit volume, it's reducing the foot traffic in the permit center, and it's reducing the call volume, it's reducing a lot of things that are really the upfront service. So in response to that, we relocated the permit center from room six at City Hall to room five. Uh, that actually provides two benefits. Uh, the amount of space they had up there was much more than they needed to provide this, the correct service to the customer, uh, so it's better use of space at City Hall. And the second benefit is it actually incorporates that process into our Room 3 service. And as we create that better interaction between our two different teams, and as the rebuild progresses and we start having less of a reliance on consultant services, it'll be a good transition to carry those services over to our regular Room 3 team. Um, this will not change any of our commitments about turnaround times. Those will stay the same. There should be no impact to that. It also does doesn't change any of our contact information. Email addresses, phone numbers are still the same, um, and we have signs that direct people from room six to room five. Uh, so that completes the update. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Council, any questions? Ms. Weishmeyer. So I'm looking at these numbers at 96% in Coffee um, Park and 72% in Fountain Grove. Um, when we've seen other fires like the tunnel fire, is this typical um, percentages of people being t uh, 20, let's say, what are we, 28 months out? Is this typical or is this slower or faster than uh, previous uh, rebuild patterns? From the research I've conducted, it's significantly faster. Um, when we first started, a lot of the comparisons were the Oakland Hills fire, different time. Um, but what we got out of the gate, and, and we learned this a lot from actually our interaction um, from United policyholders, because they deal with a lot of these communities and how people get up to steam, up to speed, excuse me, quick, um, is that it was our year one was pretty dramatic. We saw a lot of activity in that year one. And I think what happens in a lot of situations is in the first six months, there's more of a trying to figure out about what to do, or we saw significant volume two months after really the, the fire occurred. So it got out of the gate much quicker, and I think it progressed at a normal trend. We just got a much earlier start than I think most. So I want to say a special thank you to you and your team and the wisdom of the previous council and the city administration for making that happen. So so I, I think there, uh, I think Mr. Osborne's being a, a little self-deprecating on this. The, the word is, although I don't think there's a study, that this is a tremendous amount of activity in a very short window. And people have have noted this about Santa Rosa, and that's why this team keeps continually being asked to go around the, the state and the country to discuss this approach that they took and the benefits of it. Well, we certainly appreciate that you're not an understated person, but thank you very much to you, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> Compliment <You both>. stands. <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sort of on that note, I noticed that we are quickly approaching 1,000 structures completed. Uh, are there ways that, that we are continuing to uh, celebrate, to show the progress that's happening? I know we were very good about that, especially early on uh, with the, the key chains for folks when they started to move in. Uh, do we have anything planned as we hit some of these other mile markers? 
It's an excellent point. We have enough of yet. We're, we're trying to treat each individual success as an individual success. Right. Um, and, but at some point you have to have a discussion about how the community did this as a whole. And I think that's the important point. It wasn't just us, it wasn't the building community, it wasn't the residents, it was everybody coming together to do that. So we haven't really pinpointed that as, as yet, um, but we're coming up on those markers fairly rapidly. So those are discussions that will be happening in the future. Great, thank you so much. And I just want to add my thanks to you last night at the Coffee Strong meeting. You left the meeting to a round of applause, if I recall that correctly. That was you, right? First time ever. It was awesome, though. And I, I, having gone to many of those meetings with you, the information that you provide, um, and you're just, you don't sugarcoat it, you tell it like it is. And I know it's been the same experience when I've gone to some meetings up in Fountain Grove. So uh, your efforts are very much appreciated by all in the rebuild process. So thank you. Um, Mr. Merlin, is there more to this? That is, that is it for this evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. City Manager, do you have a report for us? I have nothing to add at this point. And Madam City Attorney? Uh, I also have nothing to report this afternoon. Okay. Uh, are there any statements of abstention by council members on tonight's agenda? Wow, seeing none, that's the first for quite a long time. All right, council members' reports. Who would like to start? Okay, Mr. Rogers. I mean, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and kick us off here. Uh, so last week, um, as the council is aware, I, I serve as the vice chair for the League of California Cities uh, Environmental Quality Committee. We had our first quarterly meeting uh, of the year. It was the new mayors and council members, uh, which I know a number of us were, were in attendance at, but specifically we met to talk about what the scope of work would be for uh, the, the committee, the Environmental Quality Committee throughout the year, and not too surprisingly, rebuild uh, and resiliency uh, came up as the number one issue for that specific committee. It is one of the top three, as I've reported before, by the Mayors and Council Members Association, so you should see significant work on that front. I wanted to uh, plug one of the discussions that we had and put a piece of legislation on the radar of the council, specifically it's SB 378. It's a bill that we as a council are going to be asked probably repeatedly to weigh in on given our experiences. This bill would require utilities across the state to address public safety power shutoff issues that have been identified, many of them from this council in our letters up to Sacramento and through our delegation. Uh, specifically, the bill would call for greater transparency and would require utilities to do an assessment of their existing infrastructure to identify where they have vulnerabilities and for the first time really put that out to the public alongside a number that shows how much they are spending to invest in their infrastructure to keep up that maintenance. So those will be public for the first time if this passes. Uh, it'll create a reimbursement program for customers and local governments, uh, and it will implement a fine $250,000 per hour for every 50,000 residents that you have if the California Public Utilities Commission deems that the shutoff was not necessary or was not done appropriately. So obviously this is going to be a huge conversation in Sacramento. I wanted to make sure that the council had it on their radar. Again, that's SB 378. Any other reports? All right, actually I have a rather lengthy one here. Uh, let's see, first of all, we had our long-term financial policy and audit subcommittee meeting on January 16th. Uh, we discussed much of the information that I believe Assistant City Manager McBride will be sharing on item 14.1. Uh, I, along with, I think there's three other council members attended the county's uh, community meeting <clears throat> out of the Burger Center in Oakmont on January 17th, talking about the temporary shelter out there. Great opportunity to talk to some of the residents about their concerns and working with the county on that ongoing project. And then last week also attended the Rotary Club of Santa Rosa's Public Safety Awards. Uh, Chief Gosner and Chief Navarro were there. Um, it's great hearing the stories about some of our employees. And on the police side, Detective Noggle was recognized for his work on a couple of investigations involving fentanyl in our community. It's one of those things everyone's writing the paper about the number of deaths uh, of this dangerous material. And he did some uh, standout work uh, not only um, arresting folks, but confiscating a lot of uh, fentanyl and other illegal narcotics from our community. 
And then uh, Fire Captain Michael Alcazar was uh, recognized for his efforts, not in the city of Santa Rosa, but he happened to be on vacation in Maui and saved someone who was having an epileptic seizure uh, swimming. And without his efforts, she never would have made it back. And what was great is that uh, Michael's father, Tony, was a recipient of the same award in 1999. Also uh, this weekend, participating in CHOPS Teen Club Youth Empowerment and Leadership Conference. Uh, it was quite exciting. Uh, over 60 middle school students were there. It's been a while since I had that many middle school students running around, but it was great all the work that CHOPS is doing on that. And then in this chamber on Saturday, we hosted a class from Stanford University uh, revolving around our wildfire. Only oh, Joining me on the panel of city employees included Chief Navarro, Chief Gosner, Assistant City Manager David Gillen, and Assistant Fire Marshal Paul Lone Adrian Burton's greatly assisting the coordination uh, of this event along with Julie Guzzi, very much appreciated. Uh, the class was very well received after the class. The professor wrote us yesterday was a complete success. The students were and are abuzz with questions, research topics, and admiration for the city of Santa Rosa and its leadership. And I love this next sentence he added. Uh, As I commented yesterday, FEMA has so much to learn from Santa Rosa and its leadership team about wildland fires. I just hope they listen. So it was very nice that he recognized that. And a little bit of what I understood too, many of these students were uh, engineers, and when they learned of the history of Mr. Gowen, he was like a rock star. They crowded around him, they wanted to talk about water and engineering. So it was really a very successful day. So thank you, Mr. Gowen, for being who you are. And lastly, uh, I welcome the statewide org statewide organization of Santa Rosa, the California Police Activities League. Uh, their statewide conference is being hosted in Santa Rosa this week. So I made some opening comments along with Chief Navarro and Violence Prevention Manager Jason Carter. Uh, but they were also very impressed with all that Santa Rosa had to offer, and I don't think this will be the last time they'll be coming to Santa Rosa for their annual conference. All right, on to approval of minutes. We have the minutes, special meeting minutes from January 7th. Mr. And regular, Mr. 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 Mayor, were you also going to make an announcement related to the adjournment of today's meeting? Uh, I, I will. How did you want to introduce? No, no, you, I, no, I would ask you to do that. Go ahead, Mr. Dowd. I failed to indicate that I will be abstaining from voting on the January 7th meetings because I wasn't in the council at that time. So the motion can be made on separates, then I will vote on the 14th. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, I'll, uh, you, no, I know what you're saying. I was just going to do at the end. Um, earlier today, I learned of the loss, the city of Santa Rosa loss. Um, Clay Van uh who was a 28-year veteran of the Santa Rosa Police Department, retired a couple years ago, uh, passed away uh, yesterday. So we'll be adjourning this meeting tonight in honor of his memory. And uh, all of our thoughts and prayers are with Lynn and his two daughters in this challenging time. So thank you for that reminder. Okay, so back to the approval of the minutes, uh, the January 7th special meeting minutes. Mr. Dowd will be abstaining. Were there any corrections to those? Seeing none, those would be ex accepted. Uh, January 14th, any corrections, updates to those? Seeing none, we'll also accept those. Consent calendar, Mr. McGlynn. So um, as, as I announced to a couple of council members before, 12.2 will be uh, rescheduled, uh, so I will be skipping 12.2 this evening. 12.1, Resolution Third Amendment to General Services Agreement Number F001621 with Creams Dismantling Incorporated, DBA Creams Towing. Item 12.3, Resolution Approval of General Services Amendment F002066, Parking Garage Steam Cleaning and Power Washing Services. Item 12.4, Resolution, Resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving the Third Amendment to Professional Services Agreement Number F001539 for governmentjobs.com, Incorporated, DBA, NeoGov. Item 12.5, Resolution, Resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending the City Classification and Salary Plan to move the classification of City Clerk from Unit 11, Mid Management Confidential to Unit 10, Executive Management. The salary range for the city clerk is 99914 to 128, $128,233. dollars Resolution uh, 12.6, resolution authorized to participate as a joint applicant in two grant applications to the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities, AHC, 
AHSC program for the Roseland Village, Roseland Village Housing Project and SRJC Student Housing and Sustainable Transportation Project. Item 12.7, ordinance adoption, second reading, state legislation zoning code text amendment, ordinance of the council of the city of Santa Rosa, amending title 20 of the Santa Rosa city code by modifying zoning code sections 20-20.020, 20.020, 20.020, 20-24.030, 20-24.030, 20-26.030, 20-36.040, 20-42.050, 20-70.020, 20-70.021. Madam City Attorney, did, did he get it right? <laughs> he did. I followed along very closely and he got everyone correct. Very well done. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Council, questions on any of the consent calendar items? Do we have any cards? Okay, Madam Vice Mayor, you have this. Yeah, I wanted to uh, say that I'm going to move all items on the consent calendar minus 12.2, but that I wanted to give a special thank you to Rachel Eden, Nancy Adams. I know that it may not sound glamorous, a resolution authorizing to participate as a joint applicant, la, la, da, da, da. But if this goes through and we get this, um, it's going to be not only um, in support of our uh, climate emergency, our tier one goals, transportation, economic development, there's really nothing that this doesn't do. And the amount of time and effort that these women and this depart these departments have spent on these grant applications and working well with other municipalities is really tremendous. So with that, I move items 12.1, 12.3, 12.4, 12.5, 12.6, and 12.7 and wave. Well, I'd like to see him read it one more time, but I'll, I'll waive any further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional questions? Your votes then. And that passes with six ayes. Thank you. That being five o'clock, we'll go on to report item 14.1. Item 14.1, report financial update fiscal year 2019-20. Chuck McBride, Assistant City Manager, presenting. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council. Um, we're starting off the uh, 2021 fiscal year budget process. Um, we'll be coming back to you uh, in the spring to start doing workshops. Uh, we'll be doing goal setting in March. So what, what I wanted to do tonight was just take a little bit of time and um, weigh out the same pres pres presentation that we did for the Long Range Finance Subcommittee and talk a little bit about what we're seeing uh, in the kind of macro economic environment and then talk a little bit about what's happening with the uh, forecast for the city of Santa Rosa. So the first thing we looked at when we were doing the forecast is uh, the economic environment, and this is kind of a, a national overview. So I look at two main sources. One's Beacon Economics. That's Chris Thornburg. So if you've ever been to any of the league events and seen an economist speak, um, he's probably the most entertaining of the economists I've seen, and he's uh, very well very well thought of. And he's uh, looking at the economy and seeing that we're going to continue this kind of um, moderate to 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 uh, to good growth in the next two years. He's looking at over the next two calendar years. He's seen 2% growth in 2020 and 2.5% 2 in 2021. UCLA Anderson is the other uh, major source that I use. Um, so they have four main economists there that that, uh, that look at um, what, what their forecasts are. And again, they also look at a two-year horizon. They're a little more pessimistic. They see 1.7% in, in this calendar year, 1.9% in 2021. Uh, it was interesting that they've been um, calling, they've been ringing the bell that a recession's around the corner. Uh, it looks like they 
they've backed off that a little bit. They, they said in the report that um, there's a significant ri risk of recession in 2020, but it's somewhat less than we previously thought, um, which is about as much optimism as you get from UCLA economists. And then another uh, focus area was the Wall Street Journal Economic Forecasting Survey, and they, they survey economists throughout the country and kind of gauge what their thoughts are on what's coming uh, in, the, in the economic outlook. And uh, about one-third of the economists that they gauge think that we have a, a recession coming the next year. Um, but keep in mind, that's against when they did this last year, two-thirds of the economists thought that. So again, kind of looking, looking a little bit better. And then if you saw the uh, governor's preliminary budget that came out this month, um, it's, uh, they usually are always very pessimistic about, um, about the economic outlook, and they're actually a lot more optimistic this year, especially in the state of California is doing very well. So um, why they're uh, feeling a little bit more optimistic, a lot of things are, are going well uh, at national and state level. You do see record tight labor markets. So the uh, unemployment rate at the national level is down to three and a half percent. That's the best it's been since 1969. And the uh, labor participation is 165 million uh, Americans working. So if you look back to 2008, when we went through the Great Recession, that dropped to about 135 million. So we've added uh, 30 million workers to, to the labor force since the recession, so that's that's good. And it, it seems to be um, continued strength. If you saw the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, report for November, we had another 260 plus thousand jobs in, in the nation, so that's that's very strong. And that's, you're seeing some bleed over of that into um, into compensation for employees. So earnings uh, are, are up across the board. Um, one of the things that Chris Thornburg at Beacon Economics cites is that if you look at uh, people in the world workforce that um, do not have high school degrees, their actual earnings have gone up by 15% since 2015, and that's double the rate for those who have college degrees. So it seems that uh, in all kind of stratas of the economy, you're seeing um, you're seeing positive effects from from these tight labor markets. Uh, interest rates, those are, those are the Fed rates uh, are down. So they were 2.25 back in July. They're now 1.5 to 1.75. So that's good for us from the standpoint of you know consumer loans and uh, mortgages and having people spend money in the economy, uh, and then housing continues to be um, relatively good. There's about 1.25 million housing starts in the U.S. in the last year in 2019. So for comparison purposes, um, uh, in uh, when we had the major booms in the late 90s, we were doing about 2 million units. So it's not at boom levels, but it's but it's healthy. Uh, and then if you looked at case show or S&P data, um, the uh, markets uh, overall are up in the United States price-wise, although one of the areas that, um, that uh, went down a little bit was actually the San Francisco Bay Area. Metro service area. So the economic environment, a couple things just to keep an eye on. Um, you keep hearing exports, which is a part of uh, gross domestic products, are down. Um, uh, some of that may be some bleed over from, from some of the uh, trade policies we've adopted, but most of that's coming from a really strong U.S. dollar, so that suppresses, um, that suppresses exports. Uh, an interesting thing that um, that UCLA Anderson talked about was this kind of auto credit bubble that we have, and they kind of likened it to the bubble that we had in 2007, 2008 um, with the housing markets. And what's happened is that uh, lending standards in the auto industry have been um, very relaxed over the last several years. So now you're seeing terms of seven years and sometimes more. Um, but what they're what they're more concerned about is is there's this trend for people to carry negative equity in their vehicles goes on to the on to the next loan so you sell a car that's worth twenty thousand dollars or and and uh, and you've got a thirty dollar note on it you roll that remaining ten thousand dollars onto the next note with the vehicle so you wind up with a vehicle that, that you have ten thousand more than, than what the vehicle's worth on the note um, so uh, UCLA foresees some legal or uh, legislative come up in the next year and they think that that's going to put some pressure on auto sales so they think that's going to take um, auto sales from 17 million units down to 15 million units. Uh, the only reason I, I bring that up is, is here in Santa Rosa, we're um, pretty heavily exposed in our sales tax to auto sales. About 15% of that comes from new new auto sales, so that could have some effect on us. And we've already kind of seen that in our in our sales tax numbers. Uh, this last year, we actually saw auto sales down about 7% in the second quarter. Um, and then federal deficits are a problem. We're running about a trillion dollars a year federal deficits in a $4.7 trillion budget. Uh, so that's not, that's not good and it, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, and then again, the political environment, uh, in Washington is, um, a little, a little mucky right now and, uh, probably not focusing on some of the fiscal policies that they need to be. 
So now we'll turn um, specifically to Santa Rosa. We did something a little bit different this year. Uh, we always do a 10-year financial forecast, but this year we uh, contracted with management partners and they have a um, forecasting model that they use. So they took all of our data, um, all of our salary data, they interviewed uh, um, uh, BED and talk to them about what they see coming in economic development, what they see coming in development um, of, of homes and commercial properties. And they, they re-ran all of our numbers and then we sat down with them and, and kind of um, discussed the assumptions of the model. And, uh, and this, is, this is what their model came out with. Um, overall, what you see is you see the expenditure line on the top there, that's that orange line. Um, and it's a pretty similar picture to what we've shown you before. Uh, essentially, the blue lines there, the revenues are basically at or below those expenditure lines, so we have this um, deficit. Uh, and that dis deficit continues out there till 2024, 25, when you see those lines diverge, and then that deficit kind of grows. And the reason it grows there is that we have two temporary tax measures uh, that fall off in 24, 25, and then we have an additional one that falls off in um, 26, 27. So that's why those lines start moving apart. The model, one of the things that management partners was able to do that we've, we've never done in our modeling is they modeled a recession. So that solid blue line that you see on the bottom is the recession line, and we'll talk about some of the assumptions later that they made in their recessionary scenario. Um, and then that dash blue line, we went in kind of uh, modeled what would happen if we took out their recessionary assumptions and everything kind of went along just fine. And that's what that dashed blue line is. So you see that what happens is that uh, we, we wind up almost in balance for the budget out until 24, 25 before we start diverging again as those, um, as those those revenue sources fall off. And then we were able to also take their model and, um, and make some different assumptions. So again, the previous slide is a little more pessimistic because we assume that three quarter cent sales taxes, which is $30 million in revenue to the general fund, fall off and that they're not replaced. Um, so we, we ran a separate model where we said, well, what if two of those measures are uh, successful at the ballot, they're um, re-implemented and they don't sunset, and then just one of those uh, falls off. So essentially at the end of the day, we lose $10 million in revenues. And you can see that while we still maintain this, um, this, this deficit scenario, it, it's not nearly as bad uh, as what you saw in this previous slide. And that gap closes after 24, 25. And that was one of the recommendations of management partners is that we start looking now at, uh, at what we do about the these, um, about these measures that sunset uh, in the future years. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the assumptions um, that management partners made uh, in the model. They assumed that the recession begins in 21-22, so the next fiscal year after this, after this budget year, and then that, that uh, we, we kind of come back from that over a two to three year period depending on the revenue source, uh, and then that recession recurs every seven years, so they assumed a seven year um, business cycle, which is, is usually what's in, what's in um, was the history that we see. Uh, so you can see with sales tax, I just kind of put up our, our major uh, revenue sources here. Um, for the general fund. The sales tax baseline is 2.9%. Uh, that's about right. When we go back and look at, look at our history with muni services, we're about 26 to 3%, uh, but it's very volatile. It just depends on what year it is. Um, so what they did in the recession scenario is they assumed that sales tax would drop by 5%, so we'd actually get a contraction of 2.1% in a recession. Property taxes, they assumed that we were at a baseline of 4.4%, um, which probably ordinarily would be a little bit high, but you consider that we have a lot of um, um, permits that are that have been issued uh, for the homes that we lost, um, uh, and then we've got addition to the inventory that's coming on. So that's 4.4 percent is probably about right. That's about what we saw last year. Um, so in a recession scenario, that drops by 2 percent. So your property taxes remain positive; they just lose 2 percent of their growth rate. Uh, again, probably a pretty valid assumption for recessionary s scenarios is those property tax revenues are kind of dampened by Prop 13. We don't see them fall as precipitously as we do with sales tax and TOT. And then that last column there is transient occupancy tax. Um, the baseline uh, you're probably thinking is pretty high at 12%, but again, that's assuming that we're adding those rooms back into the inventory, about a quarter of our inventory that was lost during the fire. So that's what's giving that baseline a, a bolster up to 12%. In a recession, that goes down by almost 4% and contracts to about 8% growth rate during the recession. 
So those were their baseline assumptions on those. And then the next thing I wanted to look at was um, we using the new model uh, and putting some of these new assumptions in there. Uh, and now that we're halfway through the fiscal year, we, we now are starting to get an idea of where we're at for our actuals. So what you see up here is uh, in the left column where it says budget, that's for the year that we're in. So those are the numbers that we gave to you when we came to you in June and adopted the budget. That's what we thought would happen this year. And then the projected column is where we are with all these revenue sources. And then the right column there is just what the difference is. So it's kind of a report card and you you can see overall, uh, we projected $181.5 million uh, in revenues for the general fund. Uh, we came in $1.7 million um, ahead, or we're projecting to do that as of June 30th. Um, so that's, that's pretty close. Uh, it's not too far off. The uh, property taxes um, are coming in $1.2 million higher. Uh, we've got uh, about 55% of those revenues in through December. So we, we think we have a pretty good idea on how those are gonna end the year up. Uh, and then sales tax coming in about $400,000 higher. Uh, the two measures there, Measure o and Measure P, um, are coming in uh, right about on par. They're about $100,000 higher on those $10 million revenue sources. Everything else is um, pretty much where we expected it to be. Um, uh, and then we've got the transfers of $2.8 million. Those are primarily some, um, uh, gas tax trans transfers and Measure M money for roads that we have that we transfer into the general fund for work. So we're looking pretty good there. Uh, we'll talk about um, some of the individual tax sources and what management partners did with some of our data. Uh, so this is property tax. The solid bars that you see there in green uh, are the actual revenue sources that are associated with that scale on the left side of the graph there. And then that blue line that you see jumping up and down um, is the rates that's associated with the, uh, with the rates that you see on the right side of the graph there. So you can kind of see in 1819 um, how the uh, rate for um, property tax spiked up uh, almost 10%, and then it's kind of settled into this band between two and 4%, which is about what we would expect for property taxes. Uh, so you can see in 2021, next fiscal year, they expect property taxes um, to come in um, relatively high, about 5%, and then, uh, and then they drop down over several years as that recession hits in 21, 22. Um, but what they assumed was that uh, they took most of our um, properties, about 97% of the existing stock, and they assumed that was within that, that Prop 13 ban. So it's growing by about 2% a year. It's the California CPI by that uh, Prop 13 restriction. The other 3% they assumed would change hands. So that gives about a 40% growth rate to any properties that change hands because then they, they mark back up to market. And then they took into account uh, the uh, fire permits that were talked about earlier tonight, um, how those are, are getting put into the model. And then they assumed that, uh, they looked at our RENA numbers, and they assumed that over, um, over, the, over the 10 years of the forecast, we'd add about 500 units a year to residential stock. Um, so that's what's, what's driving these numbers for the, uh, for the property taxes. Next thing they looked at is sales taxes. Uh, and as you can see, um, sales tax are a lot more volatile. So again, you can see that, that blue bar there uh, that's jumping between negative two and 8%, depending on what year it is. Um, and that's, uh, that's in keeping with the history that we see with sales tax. Um, they see uh, growth rates over the past 15 years were about 2.4%. And again, we look in a kind of shorter window with our muni services data, we see about 26 to 3%. So I think these rates are about right. You do see in 21, 22 there, uh, where, that, uh, where that blue line drops off sharply, that's that recessionary uh, scenario that we talked about where we actually get some contraction in sales tax. Um, we're starting to see sales tax slow a little bit now. We got data through the second quarter. Our sales tax data revenue lags by quite a bit, but we saw growth overall in the city of about 2%, but then it depended on where you looked. So if you looked at restaurants, you saw some growth in the sales tax, but then as I mentioned earlier, if you looked at new auto sales, you actually saw about 7% decrease. So, um, so we're starting to see a little bit of maybe stagnation in, in sales tax. And then transient occupancy tax is a, uh, is, is a pretty bright spot for us. Um, uh, we've had uh, high occupancies and ADRs in, uh, in our hotel taxes. Uh, and then what you also see happening in this graph, and the reason that blue line hops up so high there over 10% is because, um, again, we're adding back in those, uh, the lost room stock that we have uh, within the next year. Um, so that's, that's driving those revenues a lot higher. Uh, so TOT, kind of like sales tax, we'll expect to jump around more. It'll be a little more volatile, um, uh, but we, we expect that to remain a bright 
spot uh, for our revenue sources over the next several years. And then I just kind of broke out a couple of the other ones. We have uh, property transfer tax. Uh, revenue that we get from that right now is about $4 million. Um, you can see pre-recession growth rates. They assumed we had about 3.5% in growth per year. And then when the recession hits, that falls to 7%. Again, that's what you'd expect. We'd expect housing sales to fall off um, uh, pretty pretty noticeably during a during a market recession so so those look about right franchise payments we get from another a number of sources um, uh, garbage utilities and we get about ten million dollars a year in that uh, pre-recession growth there's two percent and that's two percent whether it's recession or not those are very um, very stable uh, sources of, of tax revenue and then business taxes about four point six million dollars that we bring in you'll we'll see two percent base rate and about a one point seven percent contraction in a recession. Uh, and then other revenues were um, licenses, center fund charges, and some of the things that just don't fit neatly into those other columns. And those are basically, um, when you blend them all together, about a 1.4% growth overall, no impact from recessions. And those are some of those things too, like rec fees and those type of things. So we'll turn um, and look at how we're doing on the expenditure side. Uh, so overall, we projected we would um, we would we would expend $189 million in general fund this year. Uh, we expect that to come in about 100. $105 million um, to the good side, uh, to the low side. So just walking through this quickly, as, 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 um, as we've seen before, the biggest chunk of the general fund expenditures is on the personnel side. Uh, so we projected $135 million. That'll come in um, about 134.7. Uh, so breaking that down real quickly, salaries are about a million and a half dollars high. But um, a lot of that is in our overtime. So we budget about $5.2 million for this fiscal year in overtime within the general fund. That's gonna come in about a million and a half high. And again, if you think we've already had two PSPS events with a fire, um, you, you know, those are the things that are gonna be drivers uh, that are gonna be kind of unknown variables for our overtime uh, costs. So that's what's driving those a little bit high. Retirement is, um, is spot on to where we thought it is. Uh, Again, because we get those numbers from PERS, those are highly predictable when we're forecasting. Uh, health costs are where we, where we thought they were, $14 million. Um, and then other, again, a couple of things going on there. Others just, uh, uh, is just those uh, personnel costs that we can't fit neatly into those other columns. So you can think of things like uh, vision, dental, uh, and some post-employment post benefits. The reason that there's a variance of $2 million is that, um, is, uh, uh, Municipal partners, when they did this, they, um, or management partners, sorry, what they did was they built a $2 million vacancy savings in there, so we're never at full staff. Uh, we always have some some uh, static vacancy during during the uh, during the year. So what they're doing there is plugging that in there and taking that number down by $2 million to account for that. So that's why you're seeing that $2 million uh, negative there in the other column. And then operations and maintenance, that's just everything other than personnel, uh, contractual services, fuels, all those things that we use to do daily operations for the city. Uh, that's expected to come in about $800,000 uh, under pretty much though what we expected. And then transfers down there, just things like uh, capital projects, uh, capital improvement projects. We transferred about $12 million this year. Uh, that transfer tax that we talked about, $4 million, that all gets transferred out. Um, so that's what's in that transfer line. So again, coming in pretty close to what we expected. Uh, a couple key line assumptions. Um, on the right is management partners assumptions. On the left is what, what we used to use in our model. So this is kind of what we agreed to through our discussions. Uh, no major changes there. Our baseline salary assumption uh, is the same at 2%. Uh, obviously we're in negotiations with all bargaining units this year. So, um, so uh, that number may or may not be a valid assumption. Uh, what uh, management partners did was built in a quarter percent for step increases. So that is employees that are just stepping up in their rate uh, uh, through longevity, um, so we agreed to that. Health insurance, based on our history, they took it down by one percentage point. Again, does not make a major difference within the modeling. One of the things that we uh, did agree to was to add two FTEs, full-time equivalent positions, into the forecast um, for those 10 years. And our rationale on that was that we've cut the, the workforce substantially since 2008. I think we've cut two, 200 FTEs. 
about 15% of the workforce. Uh, just last year, uh, when we were trying to address this, this ongoing budget deficit, one of the things that we did was cut 40 FTEs out of the budget. Um, so that's probably not a sustainable model in perpetuity. So uh, we, we thought that it was actually a valid assumption to, to, um, to address that in the model and say that we're going to have some growth within the workforce over the, uh, over the course of the next 10 years. So usually um, we talk about the pensions. Um, it's always a dark cloud. It continues to be a dark cloud. We have a $340 million unfunded liability. It's substantial. Um, however, uh, one of the interesting things that, that came out of uh, management partners' work was this look at what our long-term, our long-range uh, pensions are looking at, looking like. Um, and so you can see uh, as you go from, uh, from present, 2019-20 there, and you go up to about 2028, you can see that those those rates uh, go up uh, very steeply, and the scale there, what you're seeing that 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, that's the um, percentage of payroll, and that's the that's the uh, rates that include the unfunded liability. So that's the normal rate and the unfunded liability. So you see those are going up really, really fast, and that's kind of by design. So you remember, PERS took the rates down from seven and a half percent down to seven percent. So we see that really large uh, increase in our annual cost, and they they feather that. In. They don't do it all at once. They, they, they do it over a period of five years. So that's why you're seeing those really big ramp-ups there until about 2025-26. Uh, so on the top there, you can see police will reach about 60% of payroll. Um, fire plans, that red dashed line, will reach about 55. And then miscellaneous employees will reach about 35%. The good news here, though, is that as you move out to the right on this and you get out to about year 11, these costs actually start bending down. And then they they stop, start dropping um, so that by the time you get out there to 2046, um, which we'll probably still be dealing with, the, uh, you're, you're going to see those, those rates come, um, come down below where they are nowadays um, uh, or now. And so what's driving that is that we have a lot of those uh, PEPRA tier three employees coming in. So the new employees that are coming on and replacing those older employees, they have a much, much lower benefit. Uh, and if you remember, the uh, state changed the, changed the laws in 2013. So we're starting to, to see those actually come into the workforce. So in the miscellaneous group, which is the largest, um, largest uh, group within the city, that's about 900 of your, of your 1,200 employees are in that group, uh, already a third of those are, are PEPRA for employees so that they're much cheaper. They have a much lower retirement benefit. Uh, in police, you we're at about 16%, and in fire, we're just over 20%, 21% um, that we're seeing those pepper employees. So that's that's some good news on the PERS side. Um, I will say that there's there's a couple of things that are, that are built into this. So management partners uh, assumed that over uh, I think 25 years, uh, PERS is going to bring the rate down from 7% to 6% um, with their risk mitigation strategy. There is a chance that when PERS gets to, seven, we're at 7% now, they may decide to take that rate down um, like they did before. So they could decide to go from 75 to 6.5%. To if they did that in a three-year period, you're going to see again impacts like you're seeing on the left side of that graph where we where we get those rates um, pushed up again. And, and they're, they are looking at an investment market that's about 6.2%. So they do think that they're still a little bit high on their investment return assumptions. So the only reason I bring that up is, is just to say they're, we don't know what PERS is going to do, but, the, but if they do things like they've done in the past, we, this, this, uh, this model could change substantially. Um, so fund balance real quickly, uh, we talked to council last year and we, we aimed to have a 15 to 17% general fund um, reserve. Uh, we were at that at 20, 28 and a half million dollars. We're actually a little bit above our 15% um, target. Uh, so during the year, we've had a num number of budget adjustments. Uh, so um, we had uh, police radios, I think, for $3.8 million. Um, we had uh, a Haggerty contract for about $1.5 million. 
uh, we had a, the uh, uh, Bureau of Veritas contract for about $900,000. So adding all those kind of adjustments that we make throughout the year uh, on things that council approves, we took about $6.2 million down. Uh, so that brings the estimated fund balance down to about $22.3 million. And then, you know, we, ha we still have, we still have the rest of the fiscal year to deal with. So, you know, item 14.2, we'll be talking about how to pay for fire engine and that, that will come out of general fund reserve. So just something that we're, we're keeping an eye on. Um, we do at some point, you know, I talked last year about addressing our, our general fund reserves and seeing if we're at the right level. Still a conversation we, we want to have, but I think we need to look at some other things too, like how much we're funding our infrastructures, pensions, and those kind of things. So real quickly, um, we have some, uh, some uh, we talked about, we have, we have those three quarter cent sales tax measures that are about $10 million of revenue apiece. One's measure O, that's the measure O that was passed in 2018, temporary emergency funding there at the top. And then the old measure O that uh, supports safety and violence prevention. Uh, those two expire in 2025, and then two years later, we have measure P uh, uh, expire. So those are gonna drop off. Um, we can go to 10.25% within the city. We have 7.25% uh, state base rate, and then we're allowed to add on 2% on top of that. And then Sonoma's got legislation that allows us to go another percent, so that gets you to that 10.25%. Um, right now, when you add in all these other measures that we have there for the county, so you've got Measure M at a quarter percent, uh, the new Measure M for parks that was a eighth of a, uh, eighth of a cent, uh, Measure F, which was ag preservation, at a quarter percent, and then we had a library measure of an eighth percent, and then measure Measure Q, which was a smart measure, and when you add all those up, we've got 9%, so that kind of you know moves us towards that cap of 10.25. On the bottom there are our proposed measures that we're aware of, and again, these are just sales tax measures. Um, we haven't discussed property tax measures that could be coming down the pipes too, but we've got Measure G for fire, half cent tax, and uh, mental health um, that's being proposed by the county at, at a quarter percent, and I think Measure G actually goes in March, so those, old, those would bring that to 9 0.75, so just something to kind of keep in mind um, that we're starting to edge towards, towards that cap. And then issues and opportunities, again, um, you know, the unfunded liability, uh, we looked at uh, PERS valuation reports, look out to 25, 26. So we see some substantial growth there. Um, you saw that in that graph that I just showed you. We're increasing 34% in miscellaneous uh, as a percentage of payroll, 48% for police and 37% for fire. Um, so those are, are built into the model. We're, we're assuming those in the forecast, so we know those are coming. Um, but again, when you look at, uh, when you look at the long picture, with PERS, uh, and you see those Pepper employees starting to starting to kind of fill the fill the roles. Uh, that's going to start bending those cost curves down. Infrastructure um, continues to be something that we look at. We added seven million dollars in for infrastructure last year, but um, we do have uh, we do have some infrastructure issues and deferred maintenance issues, and those begin to become a lot more costly as, as you uh, as you let those things go. So, man uh, management partners brought up the scenario of um, of roads, and one of the things they pointed out is that if you slurry seal a road, it's four dollars and seventy five cents a yard. If you have to go in and replace, it's it's eighty some odd dollars a yard. So that so as you know, if you let things, if you let deferred maintenance become a big enough issue, it starts to really become uh, a much bigger financial issue. And then org structure is, uh, organizational structure is something that we continue to look at within the city. We, we uh, uh, removed a number of FTEs last year for savings, but we also rearranged the way that the portfolios within the city are done, and we continue to look at, look at that for potential cost savings. So that's kind of where we step off now. Um, as we as we start thinking about the the budget for um, for 2021, uh, we uh, we have public hearing on budget priorities on February 25th. So that's to get public input, um, and then uh, council goal settings uh, will be two days starting on March 12th, and then we'll come back to council for the first budget study session on April 7th, um, and then in May we spend two days with the council uh, going through all the department budgets and putting together the annual budget. And then if all goes well, we'll uh, adopt a budget on, on June 23rd. I will say right now, uh, uh, we're, we're thinking that this year's probably going to be a little more of a status quo budget because, you know, like I showed you those deficits that we have, they're, they're still there, that the picture remains, but it's, you know, it's, it, it's, it's starting to look like there may be long-term solutions, but it's going to take us some time to work through, through those and see where we can get savings to finally um, get those, get a long-term uh, uh, balanced budget uh, in place. 
So that is my. So before before we go to questions, uh, one of the things you've seen is the staff has done really intense work on the revenue side. What we, as, as uh, Assistant City Manager uh, McBride said, where we still have a, 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 a large ta task ahead of us is on the expenditure side. Um, they do not sync up, and we've got to have that conversation. One of the things we will talk more directly in goal setting about is the fact that right now, unfortunately, we're we're pretty much a if last year holds true a ten month year ten month a year operation. Uh, two months of the year are now being pulled out uh, in the the work that um, is being referred to now as the um, fire season and the investor owned utility shut off period. Uh, the governor has changed the nomenclature around power safety shut off and so that's what we're going to be dealing with but the the real the real factor in here is that come the fall we based on last year's experience we could lose two months of planning and exercise work so right after the budget process where we typically get geared up for the next year the staff is going to start engaging in that long-term financial work and we're going to need some assistance through council to do that work in the summer and into the fall and in because we can't get stuck in a place where we haven't done some of that work on the expenditure side so we're prepared as a as an organization to begin that work july 1 so um the staff is probably going to grumble with me a little bit but and it's going to be happy new year to us we're right back in this but that's i just want to give that operational perspective is that we got through the revenue part of this and you're seeing the, the results and the, the, the depth that staff has gone working on the revenue side, we still have a lot of work to do on the expenditure side. Okay. Thank you, Jack, for that information, Mr. City Manager, for your information. Council questions? Mr. Rogers. Thanks, Chuck. Really appreciate the, uh, the presentation. A um, couple of questions. First, the, the slide on the pension obligations, uh, slide 15. In order to uh, produce this graph, there had to have been an assumption about how quickly employees were going to be replaced by the new PEPRA employees that are at the lower rate. Uh, how did we build out that assumption, and does that actually track with what we've been seeing over the last couple of years in terms of replacing retirees with this new lower rate? Yeah, so <clears throat> basically, council member, we, we just took the, the experience we had. So like we've seen that, you know, since 2013, we've gone to, you know, a third of our miscellaneous employees are pepper. So we just assume that that rate is going to continue uh, as it is. And that, you know, that, that might be actually a, a little bit, um, I guess pessimistic because you know if we have an older labor force, you're probably going to see retirements, you know, in the next you know five years that are they're going to accelerate that that a little. But we we just took it and straight lined what those assumptions were. So if we if it's taken us from 13 until present to get to 33 percent, we assume those same rates would continue for miscellaneous police and fire. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I would be curious to see whether or not, particularly in police and fire, as folks get to retirement uh, or they're eligible to be able to retire, what we think that those assumptions will look like. So I'm assuming that same third rate is what was informing our long-term financial forecast, the slides five and six? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, through your presentation, I uh, always look for the dollars, trying to track where they, they might be. Uh, for expenditures, it looked like we have spent 1.5 million less than we expected to, as well as for revenue, we've had 1.7 million more than we expected to. Uh, so 3.2 million, that is a change from our budget from last year. But on the long-term financial forecast for 2020, 2021, it shows a $1.4 million budget surplus. Where did the rest of it go? Not, not sure I'm following. So if, well, if, if our expenditures and revenue for this year uh, results in a $3.2 million net savings or net addition to the city in terms of fewer expenditures and, and more in terms of sales tax and property tax coming in, but we're only showing a $1.4 million surplus on slide five, where did the other 
uh, 1.7 go? So it doesn't really go anywhere because some of those aren't ongoing. So like you saw, $1.7 million additional in property tax. That doesn't mean that you'll get an additional $1.7 million next year. So remember when we talked about those and those by year rates that we looked at for the different, different major revenue sources, those kind of go up and down depending on what's happening. So, um, you know, you may see property tax rates flattening out a little bit and maybe we don't get as much property tax as we're looking at next year. Same thing on the expenditure side. Just because we had a million and a half dollars in additional expenditures this year, um, for overtime that may or may not happen next year or may, may be exacerbated. So we kind of go back to what the baseline is when we go out to the future for, t for 2021. So you don't necessarily carry $3 million into the next year. Again, a lot of that is probably one time. Right. So then the one time funds would have been rolled into the general fund balance. Exactly. So if, if we add additional, if we wind up with $3 million additional at the end of the year, that's exactly what would happen. That would go back into the reserves. Okay. Exactly. So we won't, I guess that answer Here's my question right there. That additional 1.7 million that isn't an account, or excuse me, 3.2 million that isn't really accounted for will go into the general fund balance unless right. we choose to do something else with right. that point. Okay. But, it, but, and just to, to double on this, remember we're, we're dealing with projections right yeah. now. We're not dealing with actuals. And yeah. so, so we'll, we'll true up when the actuals. Right now, we're, we're looking at where those revenue project projections are tending us as we see it right now. Yeah, yeah and that was a couple of years in anticipation of uh, when we might actually have revenue that true ups at the end of the year. We had talked about a specific system where 50% had to go into, we called it buckets, whether it was pension obligations, long-term uh, maintenance uh, requirements, or the, the reserves. Uh, do we have that in place for the discussion, or is the council going to have to have that discussion? The council is going to have to have that discussion, and we'll be bringing that to the long-term finance committee as we talk about how to how to manage this going forward. Yes. Okay. What's our bond rating now? I think we're double A. We are double A. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, one of the things that I'm curious for us to track, and we don't need to get into it too much today is how our deferred maintenance, uh, as deferred maintenance goes up, what's the threat to our long-term bond rating? And obviously, because then that makes borrowing money more expensive for us. Um, and then just as a reminder, the 15% requirement for the general fund reserves, what was that number again that we need to make sure we maintain to meet that 15%? Obviously fluid since we don't have an actual budget, but based on projections. You're talking about the dollar number? Yeah, correct. So if we're looking at a $180 million budget, you're looking at about $26 million is where that should be. Okay. Um, so there might be some work that we have to do on that come budget time. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that's, yeah, there, there is work that we have to do there. So the, you know, what we talked about last year was if that, uh, if that 15 to 17% is even the right number. I mean, that's based on two months of, 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 uh, of reserves if we hit, you know, an, an event where we need that. Um, you know, with, if you look at guidance from some of the financial officer associations, they, they recommend if you, if, you know, based on how volatile your revenues are or how much risk you have to, you know, events like fires and, and those type of things, that may not be the right number. It, it may, we may need to bump that up. But it, but again, I think our, our kind of priorities are here are, are first to to address that long term deficit, and then we can start kind of kind of messing around with with things like the uh, like the the levels at which we're we're keeping reserves. Because I think we have we have you know things that are related to the reserves that we have to address, like fleet replacement, um, infrastructure, which we started to address last year. We started to address um, uh, stabilizing our, our pension rates. So, you know, those conversations are all kind of tied together. Uh, it may not just be a question of, of what our reserve levels are. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. And uh, just as a note uh, for the public, I just want to say what a fantastic job our team has done. Uh, we were around 19.1% in terms of our general fund reserves when the fire hit in 2017, nearly exhausted it. And now they've been able over the last, well, I think we said earlier, 28 months to be able to build it back up to be around that 15% mark. So really great job. Thank you. Mr. Howard, do you have a question? I do. Um, I suspect we'll have a great deal more work and information uh, about this, but how does this presentation factor in potential for FEMA and OES funds coming in as a result of the 
fire damage that this community has uh, encountered. Uh, and, and obviously we've had some significant damage done to our city-owned uh, infrastructure. Uh, how are we gonna reconcile that as we move forward through the budget and how is that accounted for in this, if at all? So, Council Member, it, it's, it's not really accounted for in this. Last year, we got about $8 million uh, from FEMA and one-time monies that, that did go to the general fund. Uh, we have a little in excess of $30 million, I think, that we're still pursuing. Um, but that's not within this presentation because it's focused on the general fund. Most of that money is going to go towards um, specific projects that are, that are outside the general fund. Um, however, we did last year actually, uh, council set aside money, about $3 million, um, just to start to address, uh, any of the, of the city's portion of those projects that we're going to have to rebuild because it's, it's not all, uh, FEMA and Cal OES money. We have, we have a local, um, uh, contribution that we have to make too. So we, we had started to do that. And that's kind of part of that conversation I was talking about with the reserves. We're going to have to come up with that money at some point. So, so, but the effects of the of the uh, revenues that we'll get in from FEMA for fire damage are are really not reflected within this within this presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? I had a couple. Um, just going back to what Mr. Rogers was talking about, because we had talked about those different buckets. So, I, what I heard the city manager say, we'll ha start those discussions with long-term financing, financial and audit subcommittee, because I'd be interested um, and just see how that timing would work with our goal setting. Because I think you know, we may be able to recommend, but there'll be some decisions that the whole body is going to need to make some priorities on. So, I have a big interest in that. And then on the local sales and use tax measures, slide 17. Um, is it my understanding that there's a Bay Area transportation tax and is that a sales or a property one? In so are you, t are you referring to faster? Is that what you're sure. referring to? Um, so we're having colleagues uh, come up on the 11th to do a presentation, but that is not factored in here. Um, we're under our understanding at this point is that we require legislation to advance that, but it is a one percent. Um, one of our one of staff's concerns is that uh, there seems to be some discussion, or, or that the magical number is ten percent. When you start to go over ten percent in terms of tax, it's going to be difficult to maneuver. So a concern about that tax, for example, would be if you haven't addressed your internal issues and you, you know your two your two measure O's out there you have or, or your measure O and your measure P however you want to look at it and all of a sudden you have one percent on top of that it may not degrade your capacity but the idea of going out and soliciting support over the 10 percent marker is a, probably a legitimate threat that the council needs to consider but we will have that presentation on that particular measure coming on the 11th of February great Thank you. Okay, Mr. Rogers. And just as a point of clarification, while we're on this slide, I do believe that the state legislation uh, that was passed to raise the cap from 9.25 to 10.25 actually was for very specific issues. So if I remember correctly, and just for the public's education, we wouldn't actually be able to use that 1% for city services anyway, absent, I think it was only fire, but there might've been one other thing that was in there. Okay, no additional questions. I have one card on this, Shelly Browning. Hello, hello. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank you, San Jose City Council, for endorsing our public banking uh, bill AB 857. As you probably are well aware, it did pass. Um, Santa Rosa was among 17 cities and counties that endorsed the bill. I don't see my time here. Sorry, I can't miss the time. Oh, I see, okay. Um, so uh, the bill does state that only 10 public banking licenses will be issued over a seven year period with a maximum of two public banking licenses per year. Currently, the cities of San Francisco, LA, Santa Clara, Long Beach, and San Diego are moving forward with feasibility studies and business plans for the development of public banks. Um, I, I looked at the uh, city's uh, monthly investment report for the, city, for the month of December, and we currently have investments in 17 different banks. Nine of those banks are on the um, 2019 fossil 
excuse me, fossil fuel report card, and that shows the top 33 banks in the world that are financing the fossil fuels. Um, we have an investment, currently the investments are approximately 360 million for Santa Rosa. We have $28 million in the banks that are the largest financiers of fossil fuels, um, which reflects nearly 8% of the city's entire investment portfolio. Uh, the Friends of Public Banking Santa Rosa would like to recommend a few items. First of all, that you agendize divesting from all banks that are the major investors in the fossil fuel industry. Sonoma County Board of Supervisors did just that in the month of December with a unanimous vote. Um, we also ask that the city amend the city's investment po investment policy to state that it would allow the city to deposit its funds into a public bank. And we also ask that the city draft a letter to the city of San Francisco encouraging them in their efforts to establish a public bank and let them know that the city of Santa Rosa would be interested in considering making deposits into the Bank of San Francisco once established. So we begin to um, establish some joint collaborations. We'd also like to ask that you guys begin to communicate with elected officials in surrounding counties um, on the possibility of establishing a regional public bank in Northern California. I can tell you that the counties of Napa, Mendocino, Lake, Humboldt are all very interested in this and we're really awaiting discourse between elected officials. Um, and, and just imagine what we could do if that 28 million that we have in the bank's faucet financing the fossil fuels were invested in a local public bank instead. It would give us the opportunity to invest our public funds locally in such things as infrastructure, renewable energy, rather than in the large banks that are and financing the fossil fuel industry. We would not have to be so reliant on increased sales tax and bond measures to fund the needs of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Colleen, do you want to make a comment? Yes, I did turn the card in. And, uh, are your pensions fully funded? Lean in, you do wanna hear, cause I'm your officially unofficial risk mitigation strategist. So I heard your staff report um, talk about concerns with predictions that you have analyzed there on exports, um, being something that you think that would be a benefit. I'd say not so much. Think about the greenhouse gas emissions and things being shipped all around the world. Think about us making America great again by making it a maker, Santa Rosa, a maker, California, a maker, United States. We make it here, we trade with ourselves as much as possible, social equity, environmental sustainability. Also, I heard concerns about the federal deficit. Oh, trillion a year. Will you have a study session with the high schoolers about the power you gained when you swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution? You know, the one that says Congress has to pay the debts? Are you doing anything about making them pay the debts? If you were working united with all the cities in the state, the county, the states, across the country, think of your power, right? You can do it. Additionally, what if what you are making is clean energy? Let me talk about the power of municipal power. Let me talk about the power of your investments right now with CalPERS. Are they toxic? Do they put us at risk socially or environmentally? What if CalPERS, world's largest investment pool, the entire world's largest investment pool, partner up with CalSTRS who seem to get shafted on their return investment and invest in what? California-owned businesses. What about taking over PG&E, city of Santa Rosa? CalPERS, CalSTRS, clean energy that you can trust, that you can rely on, cut out the graft, cut out the organized crime, think about the savings, your pension. Make that your vested interest and the rest of it will follow through really well. So, power, sit down with the high schoolers, talk about how you do it. Invest in yourselves, safe, energy, reliable, fully vetted, join the power with the rest of them. Calsters, how many of you are there? Don't you have some power as individuals and then collectively as a city and then the bargaining power? We know the CalPERS has done a lot of dirty work and they work to try to clean up the board and the investments, but you could demand a lot more. So if fifth largest economy in the world, took the largest investment pool in the world, and you invest in California-owned businesses. Where would we be? 
perhaps the world's largest economy? Can we call the shots and not be beholden to criminals who don't uphold their oath and cause us to be in so much distress, in so much bankruptcy, and in such risk? Think of the power of your oath. Think of the power of municipals. And Thank you. Thank you. Any additional cards? That's it. Um, do we need a motion or anything, or is it, we just received the report? Great, thank you. Okay, we'll go back to uh, public comment on non-agenda items. Do we have any cards? First up will be Michael Franz, followed by Colleen Fernal. Is Michael Franz here? Or maybe Frank. Hi, Mr. Mayor, Council, Mr. City Manager, City Clerk, City Attorney. Uh, I've appeared here a few times over the last 12 years uh, dealing with the issues of the Boy Scout sex abuse cases, um, asking for support in the community and be prepared for a time when we're going to have some success. As you may or may not know, Governor Newsom recently signed into law an open three-year filing period with no statute of limitations that don't just extend to the Boy Scouts. It extends to universities, summer camps, athletic camps, the churches, and other institutions. And it also allows for claims to be filed against the third party interested parties, which are, again, your service organizations. And it's big, and this area has many, many cases moving forward or going to move forward, as does Marin County. It's kind of what I call whole liner country. Uh, it's where a lot of things started. Um, it's been a long battle. And what I'm asking for and want to alert the city to is that your police departments, your fire departments have been very active in a lot of the programs that have been going on in this area, especially with keeping information uh, in the area, Wi-Fi, et cetera. The information isn't just here anymore, and people have to understand that the information has gone full circle. And I'm asking on behalf of any of the claimants that will be coming forward, the community support them. Uh, my advocate, it's Tim Lincecum. People want to know what Tim's been doing. Well, he's been very active. And sometimes you don't know this until it pops up. The fire department has been more than amazing. And the police department also. Um, I'm going to be going in with some additional reports pretty soon and try to close the gap on some of the information I have to bring the police department into uh, perspective also, so that any third parties or interested parties, uh, like the Pillsbury Law Firm in San Francisco, I was adopted, they handled the adoption, there were many agreements. Uh, I'm changing my name pretty soon, I'm adding my mother, my given name or her birth name, Swanson, to the record. And hopefully, thank you. Thank you. Colleen Fernal, followed by Dwayne DeWitt. Last time I was here was in May. And I spoke very deliberately about the role that the city of Santa Rosa, members of the council, the staff, police department, fire department played in the second degree murder of my daughter, Charlotte Anna Molinari, potentially the first degree murder of her as well. I said very clearly, you never get away with it. But if you never had a life after this one and you had to clean it up in this lifetime, even if you're not convicted, you don't get away with it till you clean it up. 
I also said, a mother's heart knows. And one of you lost your mother two weeks after that. My mother's death was preventable. It happened during this last fire. No one would listen to me once again. I don't know if it was murder. I just know it was preventable. My mother was vice president of R.W. Lynch, Randy Lynch. Does that ring a bell? Bennett Lane Winery, does that ring a bell? Your fire here two years ago, can, or however long it's been, Tubbs, Cal Fire went along with pg and &E and said, oh yeah, it happened down the road on private property owners. Heard Roy Miller, the attorney who I knew from work, on the phone saying, oh no, on Bennett Lane Winery, there's security cam footage of pg and &E's pole igniting the fire. And then pg and &E's conduct for the next 30 days. My mother helped him get really rich through the personal injury attorney network. Have you been injured in an accident? Disaster capitalist. So he had money for a race car and a winery. Where's the jury trial on the actual cars of the fire? It seems like the attorneys are just interested in keeping PG&E solvent so they can get their big payoff. And we're not getting to the truth of at least one cause of that fire, let alone the really interesting expose the Bohemian did on the fire recovery people in the aftermath, those same people who are the lawyer lobbyists for PG&E, Station Casinos, Sonoma Queen Power. There's a lot to be looked into with this. And my mom didn't get to hear me sing happy birthday to her because they pushed her in a home and the home stole her purse and her phone. Didn't get to hear me sing happy birthday. Didn't get to have me come there and say goodbye to her. Was it murder? I know it was preventable. And I know until you're willing to get to the truth about everything from the conduct that led to the murder of my daughter, led to that fire, ongoing fires, ongoing disasters, ongoing threats that are unmitigated. Thank you. Dwayne DeWitt, followed by Cornelius John Shea. Those are uh, sad comments to follow, so I'll take a moment to prepare here. <clears throat> My name's Dwayne DeWitt, I'm from Roseland, and I wanted to thank you for two weeks ago when you heard the Roseland residents come and talk about the Roseland neighborhood that we've been working for a long time to preserve and protect. I have here a poster of the unknown soldier's tomb in Washington, D.C with a soldier from the 3rd Infantry Brigade, marching guard duty, and below it it says, remember me and vote. I bring this up because yesterday some American military people lost their lives. It happens more frequently than we think about, and it'll get overshadowed sometimes when a celebrity dies or something happens, but it's been ongoing now all through this century since 9-11 happened. And I think that last two weeks ago when that meeting occurred, there was a disconnect. Some of the veterans that came and spoke, they weren't polished speakers and didn't um, know how to stress that they were trying to talk with you about the opportunity to be doing the Veterans Healing Garden and the Veterans Grove along Roseland Creek. Now this came up because during the planning process, the city of Santa Rosa told the neighbors in Roseland they had to have a community garden. So we veterans have stepped forward and said we would do that. We would take it upon ourselves at no cost to the city. And we would be the ones to maintain whatever was required. So I bring that up also because you did the climate emergency resolution. And I had mentioned during that the idea that urban forestry is helpful. If you invest in urban forestry, parks, and other green infrastructure, you get a return. And that was shown by the city of Minneapolis, and that was in your report. I just wanted to bring that up because essentially, if you would begin to work with the veterans now this spring, 
and let us begin to do some positive things there along Roseland Creek. It could be helpful. The youth from Roseland University Prep High School on the 22nd of February are doing their own self-organized creek cleanup, and they recently informed me of that, and I'm so glad for that. That's what this is about. We hope that the youth get the chance to not be as affected by the climate emergency as they feel they're going to be. We veterans would like to lessen it. So remember, this year, vote and help the youth. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dwayne. Cornelius John Shea, followed by Kevin Conway. So first of all, let me thank everyone um, on the city council for being here and taking comments. Uh, I have a complaint here about a notice that was given by the city, uh, and it is a notice about, um, um, oh, let's see, I should put on my glasses uh, for reading. <clears throat> and this is in regard to uh, tr uh, notice of, action, of public action, uh, uh, live oak tree removal. So, you know, I feel a little less ambitious than the other people here talking, but this is my neighborhood at Spencer and Slater in this area, and there are two trees that have been uh, decided to remove and cut down. And so today, when I found this notice, um, I have a property on Spencer and Slater, um, and so I received two notices. The notices um, were very unspecific and quite frankly, very confusing. The, the language was just horrible. You know, as, as an English professor, I was appalled at the first sentence. And in fact, the planning director that I, uh, one of the planning people that I saw in the city today, because I was going to make an appeal, excuse my sloppiness, a man by the name of Adam, um, Ross, city planner, had a difficult time with this. He didn't understand what was going on because it was, he wasn't sure what, when the 10 day period had started. And if you read the first sentence of this notice, it's, you know, it's just, it's not clear. So I also talked to the, um, um, to Clara Hartman, who is a um, deputy director of planning. And my complaint about this whole situation here is these guys are gaming the system. They took a tree out um, about five years ago with some bogus attitude about, oh, it's gonna ruin the foundation, and it just wasn't true. So today I was going to appeal this, and I was just kind of blindsided by what happened to me. So let me ask you a question, and these are for all the city uh, council members. How much do you think the scheduled fee for my appeal would have cost me today? Does anyone have any idea? Yes, no, no, no. Sir, we're just listening to your comments. Okay, so I, 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 I'd like a response, but I guess it's just one way. They want $500 for me to appeal this to find the information. Better than an our, um, our, you know, so I need your help. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Kevin Conway. Council members, thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. As almost all of you know, I worry about uh, what science is telling us about methane and the fact that natural gas is 80% methane. And I'm aware of the lawsuit around the all-electric reach code that the city's pursuing. I have no idea how much of an impact this is gonna have on the time frame for actually implementing that kind of a reach code. I know the city is taking on this challenge in a very determined way, and they're optimistic about it, and I'm very grateful for those two things. 
I also listened tonight to the report pointing out that we're about at a thousand homes that have been built since the climate change related wildfires have de devastated our city. I want to point out that if the council had passed an electric ready ordinance about two years ago, those 1,000 homes would be future ready right now. And those people that wanted an all electric home or may want one in the future would have the capability of achieving that goal. So I'm speaking tonight to put a bug in your ear that if the lawsuit or any other roadblock that might pop up is going to significantly delay the all electric reach code, that you consider again immediately passing an electric ready ordinance, a much easier lift. It wouldn't trip up the continued push for the all electric reach code, and it would move the needle to having future ready, even grid ready block of homes immediately in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. All right, we'll go back to the normal agenda. Um, and just for those of you in the audience, we'll be taking item 14.2. And 14.3, we'll be taking a dinner break, as many of you have been here as long as we have it. We started at 2.30, so 14.4 and 14.5 will be taken uh, after our break. So, Mr. McGlynn, item 14.2. Item 14.2, report authorization to purchase a replacement tractor drawn aerial TDA ladder truck. Tony Gosner, fire chief, presenting. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Tony Gosner. I'm the Fire Chief for the City of Santa Rosa. To my right is Battalion Chief Jason Jenkins, Sea Ship Battalion, and also in charge of our fleet. Uh, also with us, we'll have Chuck McBride if there's any questions regarding funding, and then Brandlin from purchasing is here if there's any questions regarding that. But essentially, today we are here to uh, ask your approval to purchase a ladder truck. The ladder trucks are different than fire engines. Ladder trucks are the long ones with the big ladders on the top. The city currently has uh, two first-line ladder trucks with one reserve. Uh, and we, what we would like to do is purchase a new ladder truck, replace one of, uh, and remove the reserve that we have as it's uh, outlived its life. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Jenkins, and we're going to run through a few slides and then answer any questions. Mayor and council members, uh, thank you for attending uh, and letting us present this today. Um, currently, we have a 22-year-old tractor-drawn aerial. Um, the useful life for this type of a piece of equipment is typically 15 years. Uh, the vehicle that we're talking about replacement has replacing has a long uh, history of mechanical breakdowns. Uh, a lot of the issues. Um, uh, revolve around the suspension. We've had ladder cracks, uh, torx box issues, which basically is the support structure that holds up the, the aerial uh, ladder in the waterway. And it's been um, a long problematic vehicle over the last few years. Uh, in total amount of down out of service days in the two year period, it's been out of service for 345 days. Um, when that occurs, it forces us to staff a rescue um, in its place, which then doesn't have the complement of ladders and an elevated master stream um, for fire operations. Uh, the fire department is incurring large repair costs and uh, the operational downtime um, frequently repairing the vehicle. What is proposed is uh, utilization of a HGAC uh, buy contract for the purchase of the vehicle. Uh, the price is 1.432 million. Uh, this would be purchased outright uh, for cost savings uh, to the city. That cost savings is nearly $50,000 uh, by purchasing outright. Uh, the replacement vehicle uh, would result in uh, reduced out of service days uh, and greater operational ability serving the city. It is recommended by the fire department that council approve by resolution uh, the purchase order to Golden State Fire Apparatus uh, in Sacramento, California for the purchase of the tractor drawn aerial ladder truck in the amount not to exceed $1,431,717.18 through the HGAC by cooperative purchase program. 
The contract number is FS 12-19 and to authorize one-time appropriations of 1.432 million from general fund reserves to be added to the fire department's fiscal year 1920 budget. Now, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Great, thanks for that presentation. Council, any questions? Mr. Rogers? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a quick question. If this uh, trek has been having issues over the last couple of years, why didn't we see this expenditure in the last budget or why are we bringing it now as opposed to seeing it in the next budget? Yeah, it, we have seen this, it has been discussed, but with the fire and the, the money we've spent uh, on recovery, it was our plan to extend as long as we could to give the city some breathing room before we came up with this purchase. It was just a, a big number uh, when we were seeing other costs, that, so we we're trying to defer that or lengthen it out for the city. Additionally, we're working on getting these big apparatus into the vehicle replacement fund and that's ongoing work. So a lot of these uh, uh, vehicles have been um, effectively leased and so we're moving from leasing to purchasing outright um, and moving these vehicles into a, a replacement fund. And so that's one of the big transitions happening behind the scenes and you're gonna see more of that in the formal budget process. Right, and the HGAC buy contract, I assume that that's uh, many jurisdictions buying in bulk uh, together to get a, a discount? Yeah, the way I understand it is for governments, it's a, it's a joint uh, conglomeration of companies that, that come in with lower prices. So instead of doing- an I'm gonna, RP, I'm gonna, I love the, the chief on this one, but I'm gonna ask the purchasing director to come down to explain the details on- <laughs> So long as Tony can translate after this. Okay, here you go. Good evening. Uh, Brandilyn Trammell, purchasing agent for the city. Um, the Houston Galveston Cooperative is actually a nationally vetted organization. Um, they specifically do national procurement for big volume purchases like this. And we did the analysis to make sure that the, not only the line item pricing, but to save the cost on the actual individualized procurement saves the city thousands of dollars to go through. It's also a widely utilized um, contract for this kind of aerial truck nationally. Okay. That sounds good, thank you. <laughs> you bet. Thanks. Yep. Any additional questions? Chief, I'm just waiting for the sirens. Every time you guys make a presentation, there's always coming by, but we'll see if you can last. Uh, I think uh, our vice mayor's got this item. Yeah, I have some more questions. Uh, if it's all right for the mayor, great. Uh, so the $50,000 savings, does that, I'm assuming, come from not having financing on this? We just heard what the great market there is for financing on vehicles. Is this one uh, not able to be financed in the same way as auto, other autos? It's able to be financed. The savings comes from paying it outright, right? We're seeing that's... Okay, and I was just curious, um, are there additional savings? Uh, do we know about how much it's been costing us annually to, in the last couple of years to maintain this vehicle? Yeah, the, the cost to, to maintain the vehicle is well over $100,000 over the last two years. Um, we had an, a, a pretty significant repair cost uh, where there was cracks noticed in the actual ladder itself, the large 100 uh, foot ladder. And so that bill alone was nearly $50,000. Um, th there's been a lot of related costs uh, to that we weren't able to do here that we had to send out. Um, very technical, specific uh, repair costs that uh, had to be, be dealt with in the Central Valley. Okay, so we would be saving ourselves not just the cost from buying it outright, but also the repair costs. Um, would the new um, truck, would it have a warranty on it? Would we be, or would we be on the hook for all um, is it similar to a consumer vehicle where you get a few years of service? Yeah, there's typically a, a year warranty um, and, and longer in some areas where they'll warranty the ladder for life. Uh, there are some definitely good enhancements um, with this manufacturer uh, that should reduce the overall costs of maintenance. And with this purchase, this will allow us to to send that vehicle uh, off to auction and then the reserve behind that that is currently in service today. Uh, that vehicle has got a brand new drivetrain, brand new motor, uh, so we're ho hoping, hoping that the re maintenance cost of that vehicle will be much less than what we've currently been facing. Yeah, that was my, I was just curious, where do these trucks go for retirement? But um, I won't take up any more of our council's time and uh, oh, we, I'll cede my, uh, the floor to the mayor. Okay, we do have one card on this item, Tom Conlon. 
Thank you, Mayor. Members of the Council, Tom Conlin, Sierra Club, Sonoma Group. I appreciate the comments from your dais about uh, just having some good questions about this procurement proposal um, for just a $50,000 finance savings. We are on the verge of the electrification of heavy trucks and other kinds of vehicles. And this particular decision strikes me as being something we do want to scrutinize a little bit. Um, I understand that the bus industry is transformed quite rapidly. It's much more cost effective to purchase electric buses now. Um, that is happening also in garbage trucks. I've just recently received some information about the transformation of the garbage truck industry. And I know that in the Bay Area, there have been at least one uh, jurisdiction that has explored the possibility of using fully electrified fire trucks. I realize it's a risky decision to make, to, to completely make an electric fire truck purchase to be the first ones to do it in the Bay Area or to do it tonight, but to commit ourselves to a lifetime purchase um, through a bulk procurement like this is it's a weighty decision. I would I would ask you to consider it seriously, without just a, a consent calendar like rubber stamp to this proposal from your staff. Thank you for your consideration of my comments. Thank you. Those are all the cards we have. You have this item. Yep. Um, I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving a purchase order to Golden State Fire Apparatus, Inc. for the purchase of a tractor-drawn aerial ladder truck in the amount not to exceed $1.431 million, $717.18, and authorizing $1.432 million to be, I'm getting this wrong, $1,432,000 to be appropriated from general fund unassigned reserves and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional questions? Your votes then. And that passes with five eyes with Mr. Sawyer stepping away from the dice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. McGlynn, item 14.3. Item 14.3, report the Santa Rosa Zero Waste Master Plan. Joey Henowitz, Administrative Analyst, presenting. Good evening, Mayor Swethelm and Council Members. My name is Joey Henowitz, Administrative Analyst for the Transportation and Public Works Department here in Santa Rosa. Uh, I manage the solid waste agreement that we have with Recology and sometimes in, uh, referred to as the garbage man here between city staff. Um, I'm joined by uh, Garth Schultz, who's here with R3 Consulting tonight, as well as, well as Claire Wilson over here. Um, so we're excited to bring this forward to you tonight. It's been um, about a year and a half, two years in progress to develop this plan. Um, ultimately, the Zero Waste Master Plan before you tonight aims to address pollution caused by solid waste and alter the way in which we view trash. Additionally, the Zero Waste Plan is designed to help guide the community in diverting waste from the landfill and institute sensible strategies to help reduce Santa Rosa's GHG emissions and carbon footprint. Uh, actually, the impetus for the Santa Rosa specific zero, uh, zero waste master plan actually came from the community here in Santa Rosa um, during discussions for the, um, our RFP process for our solid waste hauler, which ended up um, was chosen as Recology. And we heard loud and clear that the community input suggested a desire for tangible zero waste action here in Santa Rosa and in the local community. Um, as such, in fall of 2017, City Council approved a professional services agreement with our R3 Consulting Group to develop this uh, Santa Rosa Pacific Zero Waste Master Plan. A few years later, um, during goal setting in 2019, the City Council identified implementation of the City's Climate Action Plan as a Tier 1 priority and recently passed a climate emergency resolution. Um, adopted in 2012, the Santa Rosa Climate Action Plan aims to reduce the impacts on our climate by lessening greenhouse gas contributions. Addressing solid waste pollution is actually one of the central strategies of the Santa Rosa Climate Action Plan and accounts for about 25% of the local GHG emissions here in Sonoma County. 
Um, our Santa Rosa Zero Waste Master Plan expands upon the Climate Action Plan and outlines actionable strategies for implementation over a five-year timeline. Um, furthermore, it should be noted that not only is addressing pollution caused by solid waste the, the prudent thing to do, in California there are increasingly stringent laws around waste diversion, causing the industry to have to adapt and evolve. Many of these regulations are identified within the staff report before you um, and will be briefly touched upon during the presentation here tonight. Uh, lastly, it should be mentioned that the Zero Waste Plan was brought before the Climate Action Subcommittee in July and September of 2019. After initial, review in, after initial review in July, the subcommittee requested that we come back with more information around funding and staffing needs, and also with a truncated implementation timeline not to exceed five years. Originally, we had it about 10, 15, and 20 year time periods. Um, after these adjustments were made, the Climate Action Subcommittee approved the Zero Waste Plan and recommended bringing the plan to the full council for potential adoption. And now we're here before you tonight. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna pass this off to Garth Schultz to go into the, um, the plan itself. Thank you, Joey, and thank you, Honorable Mayor, Council Members. Um, I want to thank the community for providing a lot of input and feedback and really participating in this process, and we'll describe what that looks like. Um, so I'm Garth Schultz with our three consulting group. We are a solid waste consulting boutique service that's been providing some services to the city over the course of time. We exclusively work for local government entities. We are not a promoter of a specific uh, garbage contract or solution. We don't work for the private companies. We work for you and for ratepayers' interests and to advance your objectives as a community. Tonight in, in our presentation, we're going to address a, a few main points that will help you in your consideration of adoption, um, including answering what is zero waste, how did we get here in terms of this process, why does this matter, um, really what, why is it important, what can the city do in response, and specifically a recommendation of a goal. Um, we'll cover our community engagement process that we uh, developed over the course of uh, the project. Um, we have five priority recommended strategies in the plan, and we'll cover the details on those. Um, we'll highlight the connections to your climate action plan, and then uh, brief you in the end on the estimated cost to implement and the timeline for implementation. It's important to note as we get into it, however, we're not asking you to appropriate any funds or take specific action. Uh, the request to the council is adoption of the plan. Uh, future funding requests and implementation actions would, of course, come before the council uh, as appropriate as you move forward. Now first, what is zero waste? The way I like to think of it is it's a continuous improvement of managing the resources that we all use and consume wisely and responsibly. They're all valuable, um, and we think of garbage and trash as just stuff that goes to the landfill, but there's a lot more that can be done with those materials. Um, with the context of the city's goal, it's, it's not an absolute zero. Zero waste is more of a concept and a construct. Um, achieving absolute zero isn't something that we see as being completely feasible within you know, any city's immediate near future or time frame, but there is a lot of improvement that can be had even with existing programs in the field. This will detail uh, essentially the, the process that we came through in order to be able to present to you this evening. There was robust stakeholder engagement, um, and we'll show you what that looked like. Um, we reviewed all of the city's current agreements and uh, policies, ordinances, conducted modeling, uh, analyzed alternatives, um, presented a draft zero waste plan, um, and then actually put that out to the community for extensive public comment. And then, of course, Joey covered the subcommittee meetings. Now, let's start with, I'm um, sorry. Really, why does this matter? You know, folks have a three bin system out there, black for garbage, blue for recycling, green for your yard waste and food scraps, which we'll refer to as compost or organics. And folks put the materials in their bins. Seems to be working fine. What's the problem that we're solving here? What this chart shows on the very top line is the amount of waste material that is put into either landfill or recycling or organics for composting by Santa Rosans. And as you can see on the top line, roughly 60% of that material currently goes to landfill for disposal. It's a hole in the ground, it's put into the ground, there's no additional recovery of that material. There aren't folks sorting through that stuff for you. If you put it in the black bin, it goes to the central landfill. Below that chart, so that's overall for the city, um, below that chart shows kind of the breakdown by various sectors, single family, um, multi-family commercial, and then the self-haul sector is really those materials which are brought to landfills but not by recology into your franchise agreement with them. 
And what this shows here is that the single family sector is a relatively large contributor to the city's overall waste streams, whether it's landfilled or recycled or composted. Um, but they're achieving around a 50% average diversion rate. Um, which is, you know, a bit better than the overall for the city. So as a sector, they tend to perform fairly well, and this is true in other communities that we've worked in. Your multifamily sector doesn't develop too much waste, but is only recycling 10% of it overall. Your commercial sector generates almost as much waste as your entire uh, single family sector and is only recycling around 24, 25% of it. And the materials that go direct to landfill have some recycling potential, but do just get landfilled. So contrast, that prior slide against this slide. What this slide shows is simply the contents of the current materials going to landfill. So this isn't showing what's currently being recycled or currently being composted, but of what's going to landfill now without further sorting, what's in it? Well, it's largely recyclable or compostable materials that could be recycled or composted in the current programs that are implemented throughout the city. Um, roughly 70% or so of those materials could be recycled via one means or another, and roughly 60% of that could be recycled in your existing three-cart curbside system. You can see below that um, the kind of breakdown again by sector here. So within the single family sector of that amount that does go to landfill, all roughly 60% of that could be recycled curbside. In the commercial sector of the material that goes to landfill, almost two thirds could be recycled curbside. This is an indication that you have the programs that you need, but folks either don't have a, an understanding or an awareness or a motivation to be able to participate by putting the right materials in the right bin. Um, and as a, as a side note here, uh, we conducted a number of community engagement meetings with the public um, prior to the RFP that led to the city council's selection of Recology as your current waste hauler. And we had a number of folks saying, I don't know what to do. I have a PhD, my wife has a PhD. I don't know where to put this stuff. And that's because it can be confusing. It changes city to city, it changes over time, it changes in response to market context. So what you'll see is what we present here, the objectives of this plan are really to help folks primarily get the right material in the right bins. Before we get there, we, in the plan before you, we've proposed a goal for the city's waste achievement to achieve that continuous improvement. And this goal was developed both within the context of other goals that have adopted by cities up and down the state of California, um, but also goal policy recommendations that have been developed here in Sonoma County and have been adopted by other communities. Um, and I'll, there's a little bit of jargon on this slide, and I apologize, I'll look to define it here for you. But the goal is to reduce landfill disposal, that's the material that I just showed you that goes into the ground, to less than one pound per person per day of franchised material, meaning the material recovered by Recology that Recology collects for your community. So one pound, one pound per person per day contract is the goal. Right now, generally on the average, you have about 2.8 pound, 2 pounds per person per day. The reason we selected this metric, which we call per capita disposal, is this is what the state measures uh, in terms of overall uh, Sonoma County solid waste achievement under state law, but it's also easy to track and monitor over time. We also established sub-goals for diversion of materials. So unlike per capita disposal, which measures how much goes to landfill per person, this is of all that could be recycled, such as that as I showed on the prior slide, how much of that is actually being recovered and, and therefore diverted from landfill, moved into recycling or moved into composting. So the goals that are suggested are so, shown on the slide, they're progressive over time. You should note that you know, these, this is a long-term plan, 20-year plan uh, for goal achievement. The recommendations in the zero waste plan don't get you all the way there. They get you a portion of the way over there over the course of the next five years. And to get past that 75% and beyond really requires not just better recycling and composting, but actual overall waste reduction. And that's something which Santa Rosa can contribute to, but it's also a part of our overall economy in that we're really looking to state action and other governmental action or even individual manufacturer action in order to reduce that waste stream. That's the stuff that right now just can't be recycled via your current programs. In developing the goals and the recommended strategies that are before you, we did a whole suite of community engagement activities with a lot of response to an online survey, uh, several workshops, focus groups, lots of individual meetings with stakeholders. We really sought to get input from everyone that we could during the development of the plan, both in English and in Spanish. Now for the meat of a presentation, 
after all of the analysis and community engagement and the uh, modeling of really what, what are we trying to solve for here, we have five primary strategies. And there are other zero, zero waste plans that have 40, 50, 60 strategies, and I'm certain that there are folks in the community that are wondering why we advance these over others. But there's two reasons that we didn't put 40 before you. We really feel that focusing on five key areas or a limited number of key areas is really most appropriate for uh, Santa Rosa's action. If you have too many strategies, you can divert and dilute your actions and the impacts of those. So we're really focusing on high impact strategies, targeting a number of different areas. So first is to make participation subscription to recycling and composting mandatory via municipal code. Um, right now, folks are required to subscribe to garbage service, but they're not required to subscribe to recycling or an organic service. That's one of the barriers to that participation in those programs. If you don't have the service, you're not gonna put the recyclable and compostable materials in the correct bin. So it's one of the recommendations we have. It is a best practice. It also turns out now that it's gonna be required for at least commercial and multifamily customers under state law here very soon under SB 1383, which is listed here. I will cover what the state laws that are shown on the slide. AB 341 says commercial businesses must subscribe to recycling. AB 1826 says commercial businesses must subscribe to organics, but that's at the state level. Via this action, we're really looking for the city council, the city uh, code to enforce or to, to implement and put that into the city's actual expectations of customers, not just from the state. And then SB 1383 is a new uh, state requirement which will essentially seek to bring all of that organic material out of the landfills and get it composted or recovered. Second primary strategy, and this is really the, the, the biggest overall lift, this is your zero waste strike team. These are the folks on the ground working with commercial customers, multifamily customers, residents and businesses to make sure that they have the knowledge, the tools, the awareness, um, and to overcome barriers to be able to actually participate in streams the right way. Uh, so the first phase of this would be to leverage your recology agreement. You do have a number of these actors already engaged in the field, uh, waste zero specialists that recology has. Um, we want and recommend that you utilize them first and really maximize their utility in the field. But beyond that, um, there's an opportunity to really supplement those funds either with recology or through separate contracts or any sort of way, um, whether it's through city council or sorry, through um, city employees or a contractor or a third party. Regardless, it's about boots on the ground, folks actually working hand in hand with those businesses, not just uh, one flyer here or one brochure coming into their bill insert, but really meeting with them face to face, motivating, educating, uh, and even doing something as simple as saying, you can actually put this bin in the front of your kitchen rather than the back of your kitchen in order to get maximum participation from your employees. That's gonna have the overall greatest impact and it is one of the overall greater costs within this plan. A third strategy that we're recommending in the plan is to increase the requirements for recycling in your construction and demolition debris recycling ordinance. You do have an ordinance like this in place now. It does require uh, certain amounts of recycling by those who pull building permits um, to recycle their waste from their demolition or construction project. But in a stage of rebuilding, it's important to look even harder at that. And there are best practices, including mandatory requirements for source separation on a project site um, not just throwing it all in one bin and shipping it to a facility that'll sort it out, um, but separating your organics from your concrete, from your wood. Um, and there are even uh, communities that are implementing deconstruction requirements or a requirement to just to get your project evaluated for deconstruction opportunities. Um, we have specific recommendations in the plan itself, but really this is to get at that self haul sector that I showed on the prior bar. These are not necessarily materials that are all collected by Recology. They can be self hauled by uh, an individual homeowner or a contractor or other third party haulers that are allowed to do work here in the city. A fourth strategy is to support and to lead the culture change element. We have essentially uh, developed into a very wasteful society. And what we're looking for in this strategy is for the city both to lead by example, um, to support uh, greater requirements for zero waste recycling and diversion in city events, to support education in the school districts, um, and also to um, support community efforts that would be supplementing zero waste. This is not something the city can do alone. It's not, it can't be achieved by uh, go, just government action. You really need partners in the community and this is a way of recognizing that they both need to support the city in developing these goals, but also for the city to be able to support them. And finally, 
Oh, I'm behind on the slide, I see. That, that one might be a little bit better. Okay, the, the final strategy that is recommended is to really get at the upstream root of, of, of a part of the problem. There's so many materials that could be the subject of a, of a strategy like this, um, but there's already movement afoot here in Sonoma County and elsewhere throughout the state uh, to limit some of our most wasteful uh, products such as foodware, to-go containers, um, straws is also a subject that comes up in a number of areas, but this is essentially to say w these wasteful materials that we get, whether we want it or not, um, from other food service establishments, we need to find a way to be able to um, provide reusable alternatives or more recyclable or compostable alternatives through that. This is a regional level effort. There already is a movement afoot through Zero Waste Sonoma in order to put forward a model ordinance, and it's iterative. Um, so this would be, uh, rather than just getting folks to participate in the programs the correct way, this is about getting to the upstream source of the problem. Now, Given all of those strategies, um, we wanted to be able to highlight how these strategies are meeting the city's already established goals for waste reduction within the Climate Action Plan. Um, and I'm not going to read the slide, and there's a lot of information here. This is simply to show you that you have a number of uh, strategies identified for waste reduction in the Climate Action Plan. The strategies presented here in the Zero Waste Master Plan address all of them. So this is essentially helping you advance your progress towards your zero waste emissions reduction goals. And it's worth noting that roughly a quarter of all the emission goal reductions by 2035 projected in the Climate Action Plan are waste-related. So this is, in, this is consistent with already uh, adopted city policy. To that end, we modeled the potential reductions uh, from the waste reduction activities that would occur uh, in GHG emissions. These are in CO2 equivalents uh, per ton, um, and you can see what the equivalencies are in terms of the overall reductions here. So it's meaningful in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions. In terms of implementation and the next steps, we modeled costing for this, averaging to around $600,000 a year. Um, much of that is in the, the, the strike team, the folks on the ground, the technical assistance slide that we showed you, um, and this would be over the course of the next five years, after which time we recommend that the city uh, evaluate its progress and reevaluate the next steps towards zero waste. Um, and in terms of how that staffing, there's a variety of staffing models that could be uh, evaluated and potentially implemented, and I mentioned those already. This is a little hard to read, I apologize, but this is essentially the, the proposed timeline uh, for each of the activities. And then this is the estimated impact if we were, if the city council were to direct funding of this through the solid waste rates. It is common to fund these programs through solid waste rates, either by having Recology as your provider uh, provide the services or to have some sort of a, um, a city fee within the rates that would be able to recover the revenues. You do have a revenue recovery ability is the point, and it amounts to roughly 30 to 90 cents per month for most of your residential repairs. So this time, staff is recommending that the City Council uh, approve the Zero Waste Master Plan, and we are, want to thank our project partners who engaged with us on this and uh, open to any questions you might have. Great. Thank you for that presentation. It gets better every time I hear it. Uh, council, questions? Was that a yes, Mr. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Dabb. Well, Mr. Rogers is thanking you. Um, I, I would like to ask the presenters, um, this all sounds good. Where else is it being done and how successful has it been? Very good questions. There are roughly 30 communities throughout the state uh, growing every year that have adopted similar zero waste implementation plans. Um, and, and they are successful um, when funded and staffed accordingly. And I'll give an example here, uh, recently presented back in November to the Santa Monica City Council who originally adopted a plan back in 2014 but didn't fund it and dedicate staffing to it. They did not have a lot of progress during that time but they doubled down on their investment and actually are moving forward with a very similar set of strategies to what's proposed here. City of San Francisco, uh, City of Menlo Park, uh, they, they are seeing meaningful movements in uh, both waste reduction and moving material from landfill into recycling and composting. What's important to note is no one's gonna stand up and say we achieved our zero waste goal because this is really about continuous improvement over time.
uh, when you look at your cost estimate, it doesn't seem to be particularly punitive. Um, but I don't want us to incorporate a program that everybody has to comply with that's just a, a fairy tale. Absolutely, which is one of the reasons why we recommend the on-the-ground actions. You can specifically measure, document, and monitor changes over time in people's behaviors through those on-the-ground steps. Uh, just blanketing advertising or blanketing flyers out in the community, absolutely, I would agree with you. That would be money that you could not tie back to meaningful reductions in waste generation or the amounts to landfill. But when you have folks on the ground working with businesses, working with multifamily dwellings and with single family residents, they can actually show how we changed your subscription level for garbage from six cubic yards a week down to one cubic yard a week, and we've increased the amount that we're collecting in recycling and organics, and that is the demonstration of meaningful change. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I'm curious to know if we have had uh, uh, outreach with our city schools. I, I remember when recycling came on when I was a kid that I think that I was probably the biggest pest to my parents who were not at all interested in it at the time who are, you know, avowed recyclers at this point. But uh, I know that a kid bothering you, um, in, at least at my household, is one of the most effective things to getting something done. So I'm curious to that end how we can get our, our littlest advocates on board and, and what steps we might have already taken. So speaking from the staff angle, I can tell you at this point, there hasn't been much outreach to the local schools. It is something that is on my to-do list um, after we hopefully get the approval of this plan. Um, it also should be mentioned that it is contained within the zero waste culture change strategy recommendation on number five. Um, obviously, we would have to have a partnership with the San Jose City Schools as they are their own entity, but I think that that partnership would be fruitful. I think they'd be willing to, to work with us. Um, and, and just to note as well, during the community engagement sessions, that was also one of the things that was highly recommended from the public is that they wanted to see that upstream investment. They wanted to see um, the outreach to the city schools just for that exact reason. And I'd be interested to see us because there's all of these elementary schools that are not encompassed in the Santa Rosa city schools and really offer and invite our, our school partners to come on in a true partnership. Um, the other benefit of young people is, you know, we don't have to pay them. Um, so we, we don't have as much pension liability on that front, and, and they really will pester us, it turns out. So I, I look forward to hearing from you about what kinds of things we're going to be doing to bring, bring our, our young people along with this. And I just should mention on that, while the city hasn't done a whole lot of outreach, um, Recology as our solid waste hauler, they have done presentations and they do do outreach to the local schools here in Santa Rosa. Any other questions, Mr. Sawyer? Thank you, Mayor, and th thank you, gentlemen. Um, it's a lot of hard work here. How, I was very pleased to see the small increase uh, to our um, residents on their garbage bills, potentially. How dependent are these rates to the markets for recyclables? Not very dependent. Um, there is a change that they will have. There's an element of the annual change in rates that is dependent upon the markets. Um, but that I think the impact of that has already largely been seen. Um, and unless the recycling markets take more of a dive than they have over the last couple of years, we should be kind of getting to a point of stabilization. And I would assume that, that a good part of the educational, which is key and vital to the community because it is confusing and um, we've been you know our this community has been recycling for many many years and it still is hard to know sometimes which bucket to put that thing in um, so I'm, I'm the the educational piece is is so important and um, I assume that that's why it's so important to have a a person or people working on the behalf of the city to try to get people to understand their responsibilities um, and answering those questions about where do I put it. Absolutely, and it's really, it's a difference of passive outreach versus, versus actively engaging folks where they're making those decisions about whether and how to dispose or even how to reduce their waste overall. The typical approach over the course of the last 20, 30 years on a statewide basis is just, let's just provide the passive outreach. The industry is shifting towards active engagement because we, we know at this point, and Santa Rosa is not alone in this, that the passive outreach really has reached its limitations. Thank you. 
Great, we have uh, several cards here. First up, Colleen Fernal, followed by uh, Will Bach. Thank you, um, Vice Mayor Fleming, for sharing your personal story. My dearly departed mother a few years ago had sent me a poster I made about littering, and she took the time to mount it and laminate it. <laughs> it was um, really sweet. Uh, additionally, when I lost my daughter, I wanted to further her legacy with a project of the Pollution Prevention Puppet Show. So I want to encourage all the cities and the county and Recology to partner with me on that. It's something that Henry Trioni had said that he would be a benefactor of that I am still continuing to pursue. I also want to ask you to partner with maybe your sister cities in Japan. I understand, and I don't know which city it is, so you could ask them. They are human, just like us, but in some of those towns, they have 23 different levels of separation for their recycling. We can manage three. If they can do 23, go ask them how they're doing it. And uh, I agree that uh, treating all materials as valuable resources, except maybe not all materials. Um, when the dump was totally full and we had problems with the gravel mining from the river, I'd come to the Mike here or Water Advisory Committee or BPU meetings and say, how much of that hard scrap in your trash could be rubble for a road base to offset the need of gravel? And people would look at me like I'm crazy, but then years later, there's Miles Ferris, your public utilities director, saying, hey, you know when we gave you that low-flow toilet for free and we took your other one back? You're driving over it right now because they broke them down and turned them into road base. So I know it's a good idea to come here with your big ideas and see how they get implemented. Now, I don't think that human waste is to be recycled or used as fertilizer. We are too toxic. So go back to Japan where I saw a working demonstration up at Soul Fest, that's gonna be coming again in Hopland, all great ideas. They incinerate it, and then can put it into cement like they do with the fly ash from coal plants, but it's too much of a risk to turn into fertilizer. So we also have a problem in the regional recycling centers being closed down, and we had the benefit of financially and home challenged people being the cleanup crew unlike the children, you know, to take care of that. So how can you facilitate more easy access redemption recycling centers so you're not just throwing away the money that you just paid for the deposit and creating income and, and a way to help facilitate those who have housing challenges, transportation challenges. But let's see how we can work together as a team, all of us, at taking care of this. And then other ideas that look like a problem. Uh, the Board of Supervisors, Paul Kelly, talking about the dump and said, oh no, methane, leaking out. That's a resource, harness it. Thank you, Colleen. Will Bach followed by Guy Tillotson. Hey. Will Bach's uh, Renewable Sonoma, Sonoma Compost. Uh, let me first state that I fully support the uh, Zero Waste Master Plan as presented out here. Um, I've been serving on the local task force for probably about two decades now, uh, participated in the uh, Zero Waste Subcommittee that was formed out of there. I truly understand the complexity of uh, the um, Zero Waste Plan that has been put forward, and I commend the staff for uh, having put this here together. Um, I hope to be your future uh, compost uh, organics uh, recycling server. And as you saw in the slide, it is the largest proportion of uh, material that can be diverted from the landfill. Uh, the state has a mandate for a 75% diversion. They are counting for enlightened counties like Sonoma County to actually do more than 75% and strive for 80%. Uh, Renewable Sonoma, Sonoma Compost would be 100% there to help the city uh, meet that goal. It's in our interest as well as in the city's and the uh, residents of Sonoma's interest. Thank you. Thank you. Guy Tillotson, followed by Laura Nish. Council members, uh, thank you very much for taking our comments. Um, I'm in very much in favor of the zero waste ordinance, and I want to compliment the city leaders who put it together, and also Recology for doing such a fantastic job. Um, in all sustainability campaigns, we have to invest early and then the return comes. And um, investing in um, higher garbage rates with Recology is already yielding such wonderful education, awareness, and progress. 
Um, we have so many elements of our county coming together. There's a, there's a synergy of, of positivity and youth energy and great ideas. And Santa Rosa certainly is going to be a key player in making our county zero waste. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like the race has started in some of the smaller cities such as Windsor and Sebastopol and uh, Sonoma um, have passed their ordinances and got off the finish line, but we all know that Santa Rosa is such an important part of our county that once um, the legs get going, it's gonna um, be tearing down the track um, for victory, but we're all together on this. Um, I appreciate the plan, it's a fantastic plan, and um, I hope to do everything I can to help the city succeed in zero waste. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Nish, followed by Anita LaFollette. Hi, I'm Laura Nish. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa and executive director of 350 Bay Area, and 350 Sonoma is part of 350 Bay Area, and just wanted to lend my sincere congratulations and thanks for coming up with this plan and investing in it, and we're very excited to see it passed, and uh, very very much appreciate the, the City Council of Santa Rosa stepping forward on climate. Thank you. Thank you. Anita LaFollette, followed by Jed Parker. Thank you for looking into our garbage program and as it looks like to me that it's a day late and a dollar sorry because it's been years since we lost our compost. It was outlawed, remember? And no one in my complex does recycle. I see cans and bottles and electrical equipment and furniture in there. Nobody does, and so they really ought to add a community education program to this. Also, um, you know and I know that um, we are not recycling wine bottles like was promised to us years ago when we started recycling Coke bottles. That has never been put into place. And um, we can't, there are only a few places you can recycle cans and bottles anymore. You used to have a recycling place to do that. In fact, we used to be able to take them back to the store since we're paying for that. Also, um, you probably haven't seen all the pictures of the whales and turtles and other wildlife that are dying from plastic bags because people throw those in the landfill and end up in the wetlands and out in the ocean. Yeah, we're killing our ocean, I hear. So I want to recommend a fix-it program like they had over at the library. That was very nice, and people could maybe start fixing their electrical appliances instead of throwing them away and buying a new one. Um, it's uh, been years since, yeah, I said that, okay. So otherwise, I wanted to let you know that the pictures you have up there are beautiful. There's no names over here on the table. It was Paco Strawbridge, I think, that did those. They're very charming, and I hope everyone enjoys them. Um, I don't see anyone sticking around when it's public comment time. I just want to notice that where is Jack Tibbetts? So how, how come he's not here now? I know he can't sit there during. So, can you please comment on this topic? No, I can comment on what I want. No, you can't. Okay, turn we'll go to me the next off, one. Then we will. Jed Parker, followed by Courtney Scott. How do you do? Uh, I'm going to honor your. Um, need for dinner, so this will be brief. There's two reasons I'm supporting this. One is that uh, it's doable, uh, great strategy, great plan, and I, it supports all the other positive, planet positive uh, programs and things that you guys have been doing over, you know, for quite a while. So that's, it's a great piece of that. The other part is that my lovely wife, Abigail Zoger, asked me to do this as her birthday present, which is today. <laughs> Courtney Scott, followed by 
Zin C. Tan. Good evening. I wanted to thank staff and council for hearing this item and all the work that they've done over the last years. Uh, this item is extremely important for our future on this planet and I fully support it. I would also like to remind you that Zero Waste Sonoma has already drafted a model ordinance for the foodware disposal. It's called Disposable Food Service Wear and Polystyrene Foam Ban. Um, many other jurisdictions have already passed that or are in the process of it, and I hope that if this passes tonight, that can be agendized as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Zinzi Tan, followed by Sunny Galbraith. Hello, council members. My name is Zinzi, and I work for Zero Waste Sonoma, a joint powers authority of which Santa Rosa is a part. Our agency fully supports the Zero Waste Master Plan presented today. Some of the steps detailed in the Master Plan include adoption of certain ordinances uh, aimed at increasing landfill diversion, and our agency staff is prepared to provide some assistance on that front. During the presentation, one of the strategies discussed was the reusable and compostable foodware ordinance, uh, which my colleague Courtney um, mentioned, our agency calls it the disposable foodware model ordinance. So this model ordinance is ready for the council to adopt. And I sh as Courtney also mentioned, uh, other jurisdictions such as Sebastopol, Healdsburg, and Petaluma have already adopted it. One of the other policies mentioned in the presentation was SB 1383, uh, which I think most of you are familiar with. SB 1383 is um, something that a lot of jurisdictions are concerned about because it requires all commercial entities to divert your debris and food scraps from the landfill, and it incurs heavy penalties for jurisdictions that do not comply. So you can see how this fits within the Zero Waste Master Plan. Although Zero Waste Sonoma will be taking on many of the responsibilities prescribed by SB 1383, uh, the state agency CalRecycle has made it very clear that jurisdictions are individually responsible for implementation and will be the ones penalized for non-compliance. This legislation, as well as the Zero Waste Master Plan, are both very ambitious, and it is pertinent that Santa Rosa provide appropriate staff and funding to carry out necessary tasks. Thank you. Thank you. Sunny Galbraith, followed by Carla Maldonado. Hello, my name is Sunny Galbraith, and I'm from your sister city, Sebastopol, and I appreciate Councilmember Dodd's question, has this happened other places? And we have uh, passed the disposable serviceware food ban, food serviceware ban, um, and we also actually wrote a zero waste uh, events plan that we passed as well, and it's going swimmingly. Um, I'm on our zero waste subcommittee. We have a ton of community involvement, a ton of students. We're now doing friendly outreach visits to businesses about the polystyrene disposable food serviceware ban, and there's very positive reception. And it's zero waste is a wonderful community level activity. And so there's a lot of enthusiasm around it and a lot of positivity and a lot of places for students to get involved. And so I'm thrilled that Santa Rosa is, is joining into this effort. And I really urge you to back this by significant funding and staffing to really make it happen and successful. To choose climate action as a tier one priority and implement the zero waste plan as part of this priority and then to pass the disposable food serviceware and polystyrene foam ban. And the young people that I work with are just very, very passionate about this, and some of them are here with me tonight. And I want to invite you all, this, this disposable food serviceware ban will be part of our second annual Climate Action Night at the, the SRJC, April 17th. Um, Council Member Fleming, or sorry, Vice Mayor Fleming was there with us last year on the panel, and we hope you will all be there this year. Um, Senator Mike McGuire is going to be there this year as well. And students will be presenting on this issue and on state level issues related to zero waste and climate change. So um, yes, go zero waste. Thank you. Thank you. Carla Maldonado followed by Elizabeth Cobaruvius. Um, my name is Carla Maldonado. I am an AP Spanish student at Rosen University Prep, and we are going to make a project about climate change and participate in Climate Action Night. Our project for this class is to urge Santa Rosa to pass the Disposable Food Service Wear and Polystyrene Foam Ban Ordinance. My name is Elizabeth Torres, and our class, along with other Spanish classes, have written postcards that are brought here today, encouraging the council to pass the disposable food service 
We're in polystyrene foam brand ordinance. Thank you. Then we have uh, Alondra Lopez, followed by Angel Santiago. Hi, my name is Alondra Huerta, and I am a student at Rosen University Prep, and I'm in, I am taking AP Spanish with my teacher, Ms. Langen, and she has taught us about climate change. And one of the topics I have brought up for our project for AP Spanish is disposable, is disposable food service wear for polystyrene foam ban ordinance. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angel Santiago, and I'm an 11th grader currently attending Rosen University Prep, and I'm in support of the Zero Waste Master Plan, and um, this is because I, much like my peers in AP Spanish class, have learned about the impacts of um, non-biodegradable containers, and um, these, these are impacts that, by supporting this, I hope to reduce or maybe even bring to an end. Great, thanks Thank for you. joining us. Liz uh, Bordelotto, followed by Casey Williams. Hi there, oh, this is kind of low. Uh, my name's Liz Bordelotto, and I am a member of the local task force, AB 939 local task force. I'm also a resident of Sonoma, uh, Santa Rosa, and I'm also a member of the um, Impact 100 here in Sonoma County and also the Sonoma County Forum. So uh, I can tell you that there are a lot of people in those groups that are very, very concerned about our current waste problems and want to take action and don't know what action to take and also are, of course, somewhat confused about uh, what's recyclable and what isn't. And so I highly urge you to both support um, this master plan and appropriately fund it uh, because most people really want to um, help with some of the problems which they read about every single day, which is plastic prolifer pro proliferation, climate change, you know, species destruction, et cetera. Um, I also urge you to please consider when it comes up to pass the disposable food service wear and polystyrene foam ban model ordinance. When I was a kid, I knew it was crazy to buy things, use them, and then stick them in a hole in the ground somewhere. And um, during all that time, we haven't made the kind of progress we could make because our economics don't support it. We absolutely need you, our elected people, to take strong action so that these changes can actually be made. Thank you. Thank you. Casey Williams followed by Celia Ferber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, like my jacket says, I do work for Recology Sonoma Marin, um, and I've been in the materials recovery sector since 2005, but more importantly, I've lived in Santa Rosa my entire life, and I love this city, and that's why I'm here. I grew up in South Park in the 80s, and we didn't waste anything back then, and I'm really proud to see this happening. I gotta say that Joey Henowitz and R3 have done a great job at putting this together. I attended several of their workshops, and the community engagement and the input from stakeholders was right there. Everybody had their voice. Um, and we aren't just talking about an ordinance here. I think what we're talking about is a culture change, a change away from our single-use society. So I think passing this, putting this out there sends a message to our community that um, this is the future. This is our future, the future of Santa Rosa. Thank you. Thank you. Celia Ferber followed by Anita Miglior. Good evening, my name is Celia Ferber, as it says, uh, and I'm the Waste Zero Manager for Recology Sonoma Marin. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with city staff and R3 uh, on this <clears throat> Zero Waste Master Plan. It's been a truly collaborative effort the whole way through. <clears throat> um, I'd like to note that plans like this and the more stringent ordinances detailed inside, uh, they really help our recology boots on the ground. Um, when we're working with customers, it helps to be able to say, you know, if we're working with a customer that's not quick to take action, it helps to be able to say that the city supports this. It's a priority to the city and we need to, we need to you know, comply with this. So uh, adopting the plan will definitely help our efforts. Uh, Recology fully supports the city uh, in adopting this and we look forward to being a partner in its implementation uh, should council uh, choose that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anita Miglior. 
Good evening, Council. Um, I just wanted to also lend my voice. I, I'm also a Recology Waste Zero Specialist. Um, I worked for the San Francisco company for uh, 20 years, and I saw a huge change in that time period, um, just of the awareness of you know waste and what we're doing it with it. Um, obviously, it makes more sense to be doing something constructive with this material instead of throwing it into a hole in the ground. And it's been, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but San Francisco is at an 80% diversion rate. Uh, I understand we're about 40% here in Santa Rosa, so we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I'm working 10 to 12 hour days <laughs> uh, most, most weeks. Um, working uh, evenings, uh, doing presentations for community groups. I also lead uh, public tours, so once a month we have, um, the public is invited to come uh, to our uh, recycling facility and see how it is uh, that we're processing the material, so that's open for anyone that wants to come. It's a free program. Um, we wanna be transparent and show you what it is, the challenges that we're dealing with. Um, like Celia had said, it's it's uh, behavior change is, is our hardest thing, but we are making great strides. Um, I'm working uh, diligently with the schools. Uh, last year I set up uh, Roseland um, University Prep, and then uh, this week I'm working with uh, Roseland Collegiate Prep, Prep and also uh, Piner High School just started their program as well. And we're really, we're trying to have the children be empowered in this. Uh, that's my goal is to um, try to encourage kids to take the lead of Greta Thunberg and say, look, this is your future. We need to really all make a difference. Uh, the teachers and the custodial staff obviously have very full workloads and we really want to empower the children uh, to do this. So please be assured that we're, we're really working as, as hard as we can to make some really positive changes in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Logan Harvey. Hi, Logan Harvey, uh, Sonoma, California. I won't take up too much time. I'm also a waste zero specialist with the Recology Sonoma Marin. And I just wanna inform everyone that yes, we're absolutely out there. We are regularly attending uh, events that we have in Santa Rosa and within Sonoma County to educate people on what's appropriate to put in which bin. Uh, we've been going to schools. I recently set up North Valley School. They have an excellent uh, composting program that they got there and really, really great school where they're, they're serving fresh hot lunches that they make right there. So it's real easy for the kids to throw it right in the composting bin. So we're trying to, to educate children early, get them on board with the plan, uh, help them educate their own parents. Uh, we, we again, table at events and, and we have a lot of restaurants that are really engaging and, and contributing uh, to the program and, and, and becoming a part of it. I think one of the really things that makes, one of the really great things that makes Santa Rosa's program so successful is that composting and recycling is free. It makes it easy for businesses to move into that kind of that space where they can easily switch over, bring that bin on and, and bring the program uh, to light. So I appreciate what the city's doing here. Uh, city of Sonoma recently started moving forward with the polystyrene ban. I could encourage you to start that as well. I think uh, Zero Waste Sonoma has an excellent uh, kind of plan that they have uh, for the polystyrene ban. Very, very good. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is that all the cards we have on this item? Great, Council, any additional questions? I did have one just, um, I, I did take a tour of the Recology site uh, a while ago and I was amazed and actually um, disappointed with the number of sharps, needles and syringes that come through that people just discard. And I'm talking with the general manager, there are some programs that other communities have done to try to limit that, not only for the safety of the employees, but for our you know, environment. Thoughts about that or is there anything in this plan to address that specific discarded item? Yes, I believe there is. I just don't recall it off the top of my head right now. I know that's a comment that came up during the climate action subcommittee and I believe that we've sought to address it here. Um, and I believe we may have an answer. Wanted to give her an opportunity to participate. Thank you, Claire. Yes, so there's actually a state law that was passed during the process of the Zero Waste Master Plan Development, SB 212, that requires all pharmaceuticals and sharps to be um, taken back by the Big Pharma. Um, so that is in the process of regulations and is, but has been passed into law. There are a couple things you can do in the meantime and a couple grants through um, different nonprofits that you could work with, um, but that state law has been passed and it's been, um, you know, I think five to 10 years in the making. So at the point of sale, yes. 
I guess I, you know, we'll see how the conversation goes here, but you know, for me, it's all about education. You know, j just learning that a lot of people think it's okay to put them in your milk carton is just not okay. So hopefully a little community education might help with that. So yeah. any additional questions? All right, uh, Mr. Sawyer, you have this. So I, what I'd like to do is let's get a motion out there. We'll get a second and then solicit counsel for any additional comments. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce the motion to approve the Central Rosa Zero Waste Master Plan and wait for the reading. We have a motion and a second. Uh, anyone would like to make any comments? Mr. Oliveres, do you have anything you want to add? Okay, Mr. Sawyer. I just want to say thank you, um, Mr. Hanowitz and Mr. Schultz, Ms. Myers. Thank you very much. And since, like I said before, it's a great deal of work. And uh, anything that our community can do to, to lengthen the life of our waste disposal site, um, is really great. Not only all the, the environmental issues, every, everything combined is so important. Down the road, um, trying to place a new um, solid waste disposal site in this county or this state, perhaps even in the country um, by that time, uh, will be incredibly difficult, if not virtually impossible. So hopefully technologies will change, people's attitudes will change, and uh, get down to the business of creating less waste and as not putting it in that hole in the ground. So thank you. Mr. Dowd, any comments you'd like to make? Mr. Rogers? Thank you, thank you Mr. Mayor. So. I'll, a little less than a year ago, uh, the council made climate change a tier one priority, as you heard. Since that time, we put in place a climate action subcommittee. We've moved forward the all electric reach codes. We did evergreen today. We've now done the zero waste, uh, which hopefully we'll go through here in, in a moment. I only give you this quick recap because the mayor of Sonoma is in the audience and I want him to get on our level. Uh, it has been an incredible journey and thank you to all of you who show up consistently to our climate action committee meetings who have picked which aspects of our climate uh, our climate action plan, both the community and the municipal, we can move forward together so that sometimes climate change, addressing climate change and, and addressing the environmental impact doesn't feel like too much of a burden if we take it in small chunks. And I'll just leave you with two quick little tidbits because plastic reduction has been a really important uh, one for me. Every piece of plastic ever created is still in existence. And even plastics, when they break down, they become microplastics, and over 70% of breast milk tests positive for plastics. We have to reduce them, not even just recycle them. We have to reduce our reliance on them. Otherwise, we're gonna continue to see health impacts from that. The last comment that I'll make is uh, I would like to, in the future, see an addendum to this plan. It, it focuses on multifamily and commercial and single family, and we also know that there's a significant population in our community who don't have homes, that they don't have a bin that they can put things in, that I know also still wanna be a part of addressing uh, both our waste reduction and our climate goals. So I would like to see that in the future as well. Ms. Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you, and thank you to staff and our community for coming out. I echo my uh, fellow council members' comments and just wanted to add a couple of things. One is about uh, working with our businesses that create, I, I have one particular grocery store that I find quite convenient that I have a ton of plastic waste from and it's really frustrating. And I'm hopeful that we can band together, whether it's through League of Cities or National League of Cities, to work with these manufacturers on envisioning ways that we don't have so much so that we don't have to have convenience come at the cost of the health of our children and our oceans and so forth. So that's just one comment. I know that's a little bit outside the scope of this, but I, I hope that we can continue to reach further on that. And the second is that it wasn't until I toured the, the the recycling facility that uh, Recology has just outside of the Santa Rosa city limits that it became clear to me exactly how things were and were not recyclable and were and were not compostable, not that it's a compost site, but that that it, it's really, really hard to wrap your mind around it. And I'm hoping that, you know, we all get that thing in the, the our mailer that says, you know, what you can and can't recycle. And then you go and you argue with your spouse about what's, What's recyclable, right? I'm like, this yogurt tube is recyclable. No, it's not. 
right? But it sure is convenient. And so, you know, it'd be really good to have, um, you know, the Home Depot did this a while back, or Lowe's did this a while back, where they had this funny ad about one of their salespeople being kind of like a family therapist or something. I think that we need to have it be a little bit funny. I think we need to bring some of the humor into it, because we have all argued with somebody over what is or isn't recyclable, if you're in this room right now, I'm guessing. So to that end, um, I just want to thank you guys for doing the work and um, for the um, education that Recology has provided to me. I wish I could pass that along to everybody because I sure know that you don't put a whole bunch of sharps in a milk carton and send it along with your recycling. Not that I would have ever done that. But anyway, thank you. Yeah, and I want to echo my thanks. Uh, first of all, Joey and Mr. City Manager, excellent appointment. Uh, you're a rock star when it comes to this, anything regarding any of this. Every question I brought to you or any concern from the community members, you're all over it. So thank you for doing all that you do. And really, again, if this is the third time I've seen the presentation, I learned from everything, every, every time. Could you put up slide five? Because that one, the first time I saw that, it really had an impact on me. Because when I see slide five, what could be recovered, that is our potential. And when I saw those numbers as part of that education, it's like, holy smokes. Again, going to what you're talking about, these community conversations that my wife and I have had. I talked with the general manager of Recology saying, you may need to visit me because sometimes my wife doesn't listen to me. Um, but the potential is there, and that's what I see. That's what I see what this community can do by working together, not pointing fingers, getting educated, doing this. We're all in this thing together. Again, I'm glad Sonoma's here, Sebastopol's here. This is a region regional issue, and I think we all do this together, and we can be the um, model for communities across the nation to do what we're doing here. So with that, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. As I mentioned earlier, council is now going to take a brief 15, 20 minute dinner break. Thank you.
Okay, we'll reconvene tonight's meeting. Mr. McGlynn, item 14.4. Item 14.4, report ordinance introduction adding chapter 18-50, rental housing inspection program to the Santa Rosa City to Code. David Gouin, presenting. <laughs> presenting. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. This is asking you to consider a proposed rental inspection program. We're gonna go through some overview and background to provide some context. So in October 22nd, you held a, a study session on this item. Four council members were in attendance due to some potential conflict of interest issues. We are returning tonight with your feedback as well as the feedback from our outreach with stakeholders on this program. We also provide a program model and a fee estimate if you were to stand up this business enterprise, what would it cost and how we would staff it. If you wanted to proceed, we would outline the next steps and we close with recommendation and discussion. So by review, these are the components you, you saw at your study session. We broke them down into core components and some optional components. Um, of these listed, we'll go through them, but there was the optional component of local representation, representation and there was a question by council wanting more information about that. When we met with uh, California apartments, uh, board of realtors, uh, property managers, they said why? Basically, they weren't supportive of that. If there was an inspection program, they felt that, that they should be the ones to figure out how to attend an inspection and not have a local representative beyond their property management company. So we did not incorporate that into the ordinance. So you asked for community engagement. That is for education and promotion of the program. So we contemplate that in our staffing model. You said it should include all types of rental housing. And so that is single family dwelling, duplexes, triplexes, and units of four or more. You asked to exempt uh, units that are 10 years or newer, units that are owner occupied rentals. In other words, you own a house and you rent a room to somebody and to exempt uh, units that are occupied by the Section 8 voucher holders. You also provided feedback that the program should inspect property every five years. You wanted to allow for self-certification. And so you'll see we have an inspect in an eight year cycle. And this is at the staff discussion. We had a discussion, what would motivate someone to self-certify if the program is designed to inspect every five years? Well, some communities, you don't, you're not allowed to self-certify your unit until you pass an inspection. What we contemplate in this ordinance is that you can self-certify any time you would like and your unit is inspected randomly. And if, it, you, if you do self-certify, you have an eight-year inspection cycle rather than a five. We can talk more about that. Council wanted some flexibility with required permit. We call that a time penalty waiver. So for example, we come on a property and there's a accessory dwelling unit, an ADU, and we can't find if it was any permit for that. So we would allow time for the property owner to get in that into compliance. There's also some interest on the council's part to establish a relocation displacement fund. This is to, in the case of having to have a, a, a resident vacate the unit immediately due, due to health and safety. Property owner may not be present to help with those relocation costs and we're at risk of being homeless. So we built that into the program for your consideration and allows us to help that person until such time as our legal department can pursue remedies. And you also asked not to outsource the program. And so we look at it as a staff model within the city, but you'll see the only thing we suggest we outsource is the billing and collection function. So with that, we did another round of stakeholder feedback, and I summarize it here on this slide. Property owners are not supportive of the program. They cite a lack of data to demonstrate the need to set up a whole new inspection system. Um, part of that came from uh, the study session and follow-up conversations where code enforcement opened 214 substandard housing cases in fiscal year 1819 out of an inventory of roughly 35,000 rental units. They also make the point of to use existing city inspection services, such as code enforcement, the neighborhood revitalization program, the housing choice of voucher inspection, and also f the fire department. They do safety inspection for fire safety for properties that, that have three or more units annually. 
If you were a member of a resident organization, um, you were very supportive of the program. The feedback we got is that if, when you set this up to be sensitive to minority populations, our entry level neighborhoods, so they understand what is expected of the city the government coming in to inspect the unit, no confusion with ICE or other things. And also really want to emphasize the education rights and responsibilities of both parties. So with that feedback, we built a program model. So we would have a half-time program manager shared with code enforcement. We figured this would be split equally between code enforcement and rental inspection program. We would hire a half-time community engagement coordinator based on the feedback to do all the outreach and marketing and promotion. We feel to do the inspections, we'll get to the next slide, we, we should have 3.5 inspectors if we want to um, inspect the units every five years. A support staff person, I mentioned billing and collection vendor in the city overhead. So with that, working with our finance team, I, information technology, we estimate an annual program cost of just under $950,000. And so how do we pay for the program? It's broken down here under our fee estimate. And again, this is fee estimates. You're not being asked to adopt fees tonight, just to consider the ordinance. Fees are set during your normal budget cycle, fees for all city programs. But based on what we know, this is our estimate. There would be a one-time registration fee of $45 per property owner, not unit owner. And we estimate that if we exempt 10 units sorry, units that are 10 years or younger, there would be probably 14,000 roughly owners. There would be a one-time payment of a relocation displacement fee of $750 one time. And that number is admittedly arbitrary. We're trying to target a, a, a budget of around $100,000, and so that's where we came up with that number to use for that. Then there's a per unit inspection fee. That's estimated to be $172. It includes the inspection of roughly 20% of the total units, 5,500 5, units a year. There are a total estimated 27,540 units that are under the 10-year exemption. And then there's a billing inspection fee, $13.50 per property owner, not unit. So for example, if you owned a fourplex, you would be paying roughly $680 for the inspection and a one-time fee of $13.50 to bill and collect for that service. Then there was discussions about uh, AB 1482, state law that was passed since the study session. And in that law, it exempts units that are 15 years or younger from that particular um, set of, of rules that include rent increases, just cause evictions, things like that. So the request was, what would this program look like if we exempted units that were 15 years or younger? And so you can see the difference in unit count. It's, you can see the difference in the number of property owners. You can see the registration fee increases by a dollar, but the inspection fee would increase or decrease by $3. Um, and so those are, again, staff estimates to stand up the program. So again, next steps, if you wanted to proceed, we would first hire a program manager, train staff. We would certainly conduct a fee study to confirm the estimates and reminder that the fees would be set at during the budget process. We would begin conducting an education promotion campaign. And if things go well with recruitments, we would be begin inspections in the fourth quarter of the calendar year. So with that, it is recommended by the Department of Housing and Community Services that the council introduce an ordinance adding a rental housing inspection program as chapter 18-50 to the Santa Rosa City Code. Be happy to answer any questions. Begin the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Boyne, for that presentation. Council, questions? N Mr. Dowd, do you have a question? I would like to ask the question. I, I've seen it in the uh, in the material that we have been presented, but I didn't see it in this evening's presentation. Um, on an annual basis, what is the approximate number of units found to be not in compliance uh, with the appropriate codes? The, if I understand you correctly, question the the data point we have is through our code enforcement division 
and in fiscal year 1819, we had 214 open substandard housing cases. That's the, that's the number that I had about in my head. But, yeah. And th that's my problem with this, quite honestly, is that we find 215, 225 homes that need to be taken care of and haven't been appropriately, and we're charging 27,000 homes. Uh, I have difficulty with this. Okay. Mr. Rogers, questions? As a point of clarification, I apologize, when you say 219 open cases, what does open mean? Does that mean that it's been judged to be at a level that requires intervention from the city? Or does that mean that the city is looking into whether or not it's substandard? It's the, it's the former. So code enforcement is a complaint-based program. So we would receive a complaint about some standard living conditions. We would go out and verify it. If verified, then we would open a case. That's where we come up with the 214 number. Great, thank you. Any additional questions? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you. Just for clarification, um, in October, the um, unit count was 35,000, and now it's 27 plus. Um, what, what, why the difference, and what is, is it close, is 27, 450, or whatever it was, um, which is most accurate? Yeah, so the total uh, estimated rental units in the city limits is 35,000. But if we exempt units that are 10 years or newer, oh, gotcha. and we exempt units occupied by voucher holders, we come down to that 27,000. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and, and, and secondly, sorry, one more question. Um, the, the, um, I assume that there was a lot of work that went into the development of this, of this um, program. Was there a city that was used, or a number of cities and, and to, as models, and if so, who were they? Okay. We looked at the city of Concord, Richmond, uh, San Luis Obispo, but primarily the city of Sacramento. So much of the modeling of this ordinance is, is based on Sacramento. Thank you. Ms. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I want to follow on with the complaint-based uh, program in terms of enforcement and ask a question about the proactive arm, which I'm assuming that 214 number doesn't come from the neighborhood revitalization program. That is the not neighborhood revitalization program. Of those homes that get inspected every year, uh, do we have a percentage or a number um, that we can infer based on how many are inspected that do come up with code violations? Sure, yeah, so by way of background, the neighborhood revitalization program, NRP, selects focused neighborhoods based on windshield survey, uh, the condition of the property, calls for service, and then we proactively inspect just multifamily. And based on the age of the housing stock, we, we get about 1,000 units inspected annually, and at least 70 to 75% of those units fail that initial inspection. So with a proactive approach, we're looking at 750 out of 1,000 homes failing in multifamily. Obviously, you know, it's difficult to generalize that to all of our stock, but when you compare 214 versus, you know, 27,000, we're we're looking at quite a difference when we are proactive versus reactive. Would you? Say yeah, and this correct? this is our in our focus neighborhood. So Apple Valley, Papago, West Ninth, um, uh, Aston Avenue, things of that nature. Thank you for your clarification. Thanks, Dave. I have a question regarding NRP because um, we've gone through different iterations. And I think it used to be much more robust a couple of years ago. What is our current? How robust is NRP? Can you explain what resources we have? Yes, uh, right now the NRP program is a limited part-time rental inspection program based on one code enforcement technician and a fire safety inspector. Uh, as many of you have been on the council for a while, over the course of several budget reductions, NRP went from a multi-department, full-time effort to now as simply a rental inspection program. Okay, and then the other side from code enforcement who handles these 214 complaints, what's the staffing model of that and what are, what are their assignments? Are they just focused on complaints or do they also have some co-compliance in other parts of the city not related? Oh, oh yeah, the code enforcement division has uh, six people with the senior and they respond to 
any and all complaints regarding commercial properties, residential properties, um, things like that, of that nature. And so these are the same folks, Justin, I know a lot of the rebuild areas, um, when people are talking about, let's just say a, a burned tree that may be an issue of a vacant property, it, these are the same folks that look at those as the code enforcement. That's topic. correct. Great. Mr. Oliveris, do you have a question? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on the 214 open cases, I want to confirm open cases mean that there were potential violations, violations were found and the case was being investigated. That's correct. So do, do you have a number for the total number of complaints that were received? I can get that for you, but I don't have it with me tonight. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Yeah, just <clears throat> by way of, of process, <laughs> Sue, uh, last time we were here, we had to literally pull a name out of a hat to make sure that four council members could be present at the dais. Can you just give uh, for the public and, and others watching at home, uh, can you give a little bit of background on why now there's six of us up here? Just figured that might be helpful as an explanation before we even delve too far into the policy. Sure. Um, after our last, um, or at our last um, meeting, um, when we had the study session, we were requested to um, check with the um, Fair Political Practices Commission, the FPPC, um, which uh, governs uh, conflicts of interest and can give opinions. Um, and if we get a written opinion, written formal opinion, um, that will protect uh, any council member from a future uh, enforcement action from the FPPC. FPPC also issues informal opinions, and prior to the study session, we had obtained an informal opinion. Those are done quickly. And the answer came back from the informal, on the informal, um, opinion, uh, the recommendation that council members who had uh, either owned a rental uh, or rented under a lease or uh, rented a room in their home, that those council members recuse themselves out of an abundance of caution until such time that a formal opinion could be uh, uh, could be had. When you do an, a for when you request a formal opinion, the FPPC legal counsel uh, researches uh, all the regulations, looks at the facts that you've given them, and then they write up a, a formal opinion. So we did, uh, following the study session in October, we did ask for a formal opinion from the FPPC, and we received that uh, late yesterday. And the conclusion was that all of the council members can participate in this discussion. Uh, because uh, there is a, although there would be, could be a potential financial impact on those council members uh, that are either landlords or renters under a lease, the impact on the council members was no different than the impact on what is considered the public generally. And the standard is whether the, for, for purposes of this ordinance, the standard is whether the ordinance would impact 25% or more of residential uh, housing units uh, in within the city of Santa Rosa. We have run all those numbers and we are well above the 25% threshold, which puts us into the generally uh, public generally exception and therefore all of the council members may participate. And again, that was based on the formal uh, legal opinion from the FPPC. And that's, thank you for that clarification. Okay, we have several cards here. Uh, first up, Colleen Fernal, followed by Lisa Thomas. So I lost my housing because Sebastopol in 2016 was not keeping up with the city of Santa Rosa in just cause eviction issues. And I wanna tell you something from my Residency in Santa Rosa on Escalero, Marble Street, Stanislaw Way, mold is devastating to human health. On, es on um, Escalero, no, on Stanislaw Way, unfortunately that home was bought my in-laws, a foreclosure, they hadn't been fixed up, where smokers and pets using the carpet that was not renovated before our family moved in there. 
No one listened to me once again until it got severe. We had major health problems, we got the air sample. It was the worst possible kind. So finally, they had put the work into doing this certified restoration specialist, a lot of money paid to remediate. They returned my vacuum to me completely untouched. So you gotta watch who's even doing the work, inspectors. Because on Escalero, on that home, the person doing the work was replacing with moldy wood in the shower. I called your police and they didn't help me. I said, this is an environmental crime and I wasn't helped as a renter. Tables got turned and bad results happened on that address. So in your city, I've had experience with toxic mold where my daughter was last living in an apartment building where they weren't listening to me, when their bathtub was dripping down to the people below and the manager's not listening. And that mold was so bad that after she's murdered, they had to rip the whole face of the apartment building right over on my bride off to remediate it. That child suffered repeatedly because of landlords, including our own grandparents, didn't pay attention to mold. So I want you to use every possible force and effectiveness to get your housing stock clean. And in those cases where you gotta remodel, maybe you can consider letting the restrictions change. So maybe going up a second level to have more housing stock instead of more sprawl would be an option where there might not be room for an ADU or wherever. But these problems can be opportunities, provided that everyone's invested in the outcome of healthy, affordable housing stock to rent, to own, whatever it is. So when I see money coming to the JC for building, I'm going, where's the green part of your building? That's what we need to be implemented in here because what price can you put on your health, right? And if every breath that you can take doesn't have mold or toxics off gassing, that's priceless, isn't it? So it's worth investing in. Landlords, thank you. Thank you. Lisa Thomas, followed by Keith Becker. Good evening. I'm here as a landlord, having bought a duplex about a year ago, which I'm very excited about. I think I'm a good landlord. I take care of my property and I look after my tenants, like many, if not most, landlords in this city. I do not want to see any substandard housing for anyone. Uh, and I appreciate the city has a responsibility for enforcing housing laws. But I think we're looking at a sledgehammer to crack a nut. There are only 214 complaints in a year. 39% of those come from property owners with four or more units. But the vast majority of people that are gonna be subjected to inspections are single family dwelling and duplex triplex owners. So this is a big thing to rain down on all of the landlords in the county when it's a small problem relatively and confined to an even smaller population of landlords. So I don't see that this is really an appropriate solution. 0.006% of all units are subject to a complaint. And you're talking about spending, or asking us to spend over a million dollars a year to subject ourselves to these inspections. That seems a little bit of overkill for me. As a realtor, I also think it's a big disincentive to property investment in rental properties. I sold three properties last year that were rentals, people leaving the rental stock and selling them as single family homes because rental issues are too difficult for most landlords to deal with here. So this is not okay. We only have 35,000 units in the rental housing stock in Santa Rosa right now. That's tiny. We need a lot more housing. That's part of the problem with homeless. It's part of the problem with low income. It's part of our problem here. And we need to focus on how to solve that problem. And I really don't think that the solution to that is to drive more private property owners out of being landlords. And the more imposition we have of regulations that really are not needed and don't make sense just increases that. So you're gonna vote on whether you wanna add a million dollars to the city budget and carry an overhead and create a bureaucratic system that's going to weigh down on 35,000 
people who own over 35,000 property units. I strongly urge you to say no to this. Let's go back to the drawing board and come up with something that's a little more clever and really addresses the real issues. Thank you. Thank you. Keith Becker, followed by Susan Carell. Good evening, council members. I can't imagine that you, as members of the City of Santa Rosa City Council, have the opportunity to speak with housing providers in any sort of depth, but I do, and I speak with hundreds of them. And 2014, 15, 16, the different efforts to institute rent control in Santa Rosa, and now we're talking about AB 1482 and SB 329 and SB 644 and all of these other alphabet soups of regulations and my clients and housing providers are like, okay, okay, okay. And depending on how this conversation and your vote tonight goes, I will be communicating with my owners and my clients tomorrow morning and explaining them what has happened. And at some point we reached the tipping point. I have one very savvy client who owned four properties, all of them single family residences, all of them in Santa Rosa, and over the course of the last three years, he has divested himself of all of them. Not to get out of the business, he took his money and has left Santa Rosa and bought properties in Oregon and Oklahoma and Idaho because there's opportunity and it is becoming increasingly difficult for owners to look at having opportunity here the numbers, there are so many people who have said this and will say this about the number of, of violations and the number of overall properties. I don't want to get into that, but what I do want to say is the solution, this inspection program itself is, is overkill. If you want to really make a solution, one, do provide some sort of protection for whistleblowers because there are people, there are tenants who are fearful of reporting substandard housing because they're worried about, somebody mentioned about ICE, for example. Provide whistleblower protections for people who know that they can report problems in safety. Two, make it financially impossible for slumlords to operate in Santa Rosa. The penalties, if somebody is in violation, make it prohibitive. Three, we need to bring back scrims or something like it an advocacy group that basically provides information for both owners and tenants to make the industry better for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Carell, followed by Chris Lopin. You made this. Okay. Good evening. And I'm very glad to have the opportunity to address this, and I appreciate Lisa Thomas's remarks. She's right on the money there. I am in a front row seat of the rental housing market. Um, when I read your proposed ordinance with this um, housing inspection program, I was, I was horrified. Uh, I am the owner and broker of my own property management company, and it's been in business since 2007. We manage about 125 single-family housing properties all over Sonoma County, with the majority of them being in Santa Rosa. Um, I live in Oakmont and my business has been there since 2012 and I have two employees. So I do really understand the rental market. I'm very much in opposition to this passage of yet another housing program that creates additional burdens, financial, not to mention the laborious paperwork and nuisance. <laughs> I wonder how aware you as a city council are of the impact that the price gouging penal code 396 and the rental caps that have recently been installed as of January 1st. I wonder how aware you are of how this has set the rental market into topsy-turvy crazy land. I mean, it's, it's, it's been hideous to have to deal with these, um, as Keith referred to, the alphabet soup legislation. There's an awful lot of it in place, and most owners don't even understand it. They need to be educated about it. I don't know the details of this program. I didn't see them until I looked at your presentation. But I do know that there were less than um, 200, well, there are 215 tenant complaints. And again, this is like, you know, killing, a, what, what did Lisa say? Killing a mallet, using a mallet on a, on a nut. Um, if there are 25,000 rental units, then, you know, 200 is less than 1%. And I just don't understand why you would do this. If you impose additional fees and restrictions on rental housing, 
you will create consequences that you're not even aware of. Landlords will sell their properties because of the hassle, they will be which will in effect reduce the, the rental housing inventory when you're trying to achieve more rental housing inventory. And you will create a disincentive for developers to build more housing here, and they will simply look elsewhere to invest their money, as Keith suggested. And where is the money coming from to support this program that's in fantasy land? I mean, you need a million dollars to support it, and your and your budget person this morning, or this well, was wasn't this morning. I believe he said, "quote We have a lot of work to do on the expenditure side." So I think this this ordinance is insane, and I hope you'll agree with me. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Lopin, followed by Adrian Lobby. Thank you for the time, Council. My name's Chris, and my wife and I own 26 units out of your. 37,000, we are the extra small business here. <laughs> but um, I, I've read this proposal three times, and, and I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm a little nervous that, yes, there are no fees, there, there are fees suggested but not set, and I'm just worried that this million dollars is just gonna keep growing to be a bigger and bigger chunk, and it's coming out of our pocket. You know, we have a, we, you guys talked about zero zero based uh, uh, the, the the whole trash thing, and, and and our trash has gone up 250 percent in the last two years. Our insurance has gone up over 20 percent in the last two years, and now we're adding more fees into this industry. We can only absorb so much, and the only result is that the rental price has got to come up, and that's not what we need right now, guys. We gotta keep those rental prices down and adding more fees is, is not gonna help us do that. There's an expression, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> Guys, we have less than 1% is, is what our issue is based on those numbers. And we have, we're penalizing the 99% to pay for that. I have customers, I don't have tenants. That's the way I look at it. And on March, 14th, we actually have two licensed handymen going through each unit our own. We do it every year. We walk in, we check everything. We recock the bathroom, even though somebody doesn't know how to use bleach and take care of the mold. And we do all of that stuff because we want our housing to be clean and, and above par. I think if we add in this government oversight and these fees, it, it it's just gonna be detrimental to the industry. And I urge you to look for another solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian Lobby, followed by Carol Alexa. Good evening, I'm here as a member of the Intersections uh, Coalition. Well, I, I guess I wanna start with some history because I was also here when the Hone Avenue problem emerged where we found tenants who were living in extremely substandard housing and to everyone's surprise. And that sparked a tenant renters movement that almost passed rent control here. I also was here recently where uh, an older motel up on Mendocino Avenue was condemned suddenly and a whole lot of renters were faced with sudden um, homelessness. The people, the 215 people who complain are, they are not part of a, they are random complaints. They're, some of them are people who have the courage to, to complain about their landlords. That's a very small group of people because under the rental hospital, the rental situation we have now, you don't want to complain about your landlord. You do not want that to happen. So back in the rent control, I was in this chamber and I heard many, many landlords and owners and um, apartment owners saying, look, don't we don't want rent control. That's just at draconian. We can't handle it. It's way too much. So let's do a rental inspection program. This, what, this initiative came out of that. It was a compromise. So now I'm listening to people say, well, there's not enough data or it's just too much. I'm on a Section 8 voucher. I get my house inspected. Uh, now they put it on a two-year cycle. It was on a one-year cycle. It's not really a big deal. You keep your property up, 
you have to make an appointment, you have to show up. It's not a big deal. So the other thing the owner said is that when you do a rental inspection program, it levels the playing field because everyone has the same set of standards. And you don't actually have the random neighbor or the random person who doesn't like you complaining and bringing in code enforcement. Everybody gets inspected. If your unit is good, you're good. I do want to mention the faces that are looking down at me today, which are faces of homeless people in, in uh, Sonoma County. And appreciate the exhibit and the photographer who made these things. Obviously, this is our community. The tenants and the homeless community have an enormous overlap. And we want to keep people in their houses, and we want to keep people safe in their houses. And I highly encourage you to uh, vote, vote for this. Thank you. <clears throat> Carol, I'm not sure the last name could be Lexa. It is. Okay, followed by uh, Clayton Engstrom. Thank you. Good evening, Council, Mayor Sweathelm. Um, I'm Carol Lexa. I am this year's president of the North Bay Association of Realtors. So I do speak um, on behalf of realtors in our community. And we do remain deeply concerned um, about the proposal before you, um, the policy itself and the process by which we arrived here. Um, it is comprehensive, citywide, massive, costly, and it is punitive to property owners, especially without worthier data to support it. This um, city currently already spends multiple dollars, perhaps millions of dollars on code enforcement and has the neighborhood revitalization program to support it, inspecting um, about a thousand units annually. It's necessary to fund those systems that we currently have and ask ourselves what problems we're trying to address as numerous people have mentioned that the numbers of the properties that have complaints are relatively low I would ask you to continue to use that program, investigate where there are problems and make sure that that housing stock is brought up to code. Um, the process by which this came before the council is somewhat troubling um, in that it was driven by a former council member and direction was given to staff. They brought forth a proposal and has come back with actually a more costly and more stringent proposal. So we urge you to take pause, collect additional data on complaints, and find out how your current programs are functioning and if those programs are actually funded properly. Um, please fortify the Neighborhood Revitalization Program before considering a comprehensive model. By making ownership of rental property more expensive and onerous, there will be fewer homes to rent. And rental properties are necessary to keep people in our homes here in Santa Rosa and not exacerbate the problems of hom homelessness that we have. So please be careful with your decision and keep it so it's possible for the good landlords to continue to provide rental housing. Thank you. Thank you. Clayton Engstrom, followed by Forrest Jinks. Thank you, Mayor Schwedhelm, Schwedhelm, members of the council. Thanks for indulging me. I, I'm sorry I'm here tonight. Um, let me tell you, I'm one of the 214. Uh, guess what? The neighbor called on my tenant. I've gotten this notice for several years, probably three times in the last five years. I've got a absolutely marvelous tenant. Uh, well, maybe not to the neighbors, but he is a wonderful gentleman. He's a disabled Vietnam vet. Started there with Section 8. For some reason he lost his Section 8. Continued to raise his family there. I worked with him on it. I've raised that rent twice in, two, in 20 years. Uh, He's a great guy. He is a horrible housekeeper, absolutely horrible. So these three notices, I get them. I go over to him. Now they're charging me money for the code enforcement aspect of it. I 
have asked him to pay for this. He cleans the place up, kind of goes away. I got to tell you, on my other rentals, this is every five years. I've had two rentals that it took only two years from the time that these things were brand new, spanking clean new. Two years to absolutely trash them to over $8,000 in damage. So let me express to you that when it's so funny that we're having a good discussion about bad landlords, which let me express to you, I have no tolerance for. These units need to be cleaned up. Mold is a huge four letter word for us as landlords. Uh, code enforcement needs to do their job. And wh whatever needs to happen there and whatever cost recovery has to happen there, that's where it needs to be. But I gotta tell you, if the inspector goes into my house where my wonderful 20 year Vietnam disabled veteran is and his three generations are living in the house currently, I will probably have to vacate the unit in order to, to clean everything up. Out of four, what, 1482, I'll be paying him one month's rent and we will shake hands and say goodbye to each other. And I will probably spend whatever it takes to renovate that house. I will not be putting them up in a hotel for the three months that it's gonna to take to renovate the place. And I'm just expressing to you that if your problem is 214, and I'm one of them, that was, e my problem was easily solved by me going over there and having a conversation with him and he took care of it. And I'm telling you, it's happened to me three times in the last five years. That's how tenants are. You're trying to make it like it's a landlord problem. It probably isn't, but I can tell you the unintended con consequences is removing really, really good people from these rentals to go find something else. Thank you. Thank you. Forrest Jinx, followed by Jennifer Coleman. Did Forrest leave? Jennifer Coleman, followed by Lisa Badenfort. Thank you, Jennifer Coleman, Santa Rosa. Uh, I agree with everybody, uh, the landlords who are my colleagues who have spoken about the 214 number that keeps coming up. Um, you know, I come here with good intentions, but the, one of the things that crosses my mind is that this number is so low, it's less than 1%, that I, I can't help but think, why is the city of Santa Rosa taxing landlords to fund code enforcement under a different name called the Rental Housing Inspection Program. That's the first thing that occurs to me. And I, I do also agree that landlords and tenants, it takes two to tango. I really keep my properties up well, but I gotta say that uh, they're the basic wear and tear, and I'm a tenant as well for 20 years, comes from me. I take really great care of the property that I rent. In fact, I left my, my unit better than when I took it over when I was um, displaced four years ago, or, or I'm sorry, two years ago. Um, and it's a lot of wear and tear, but um, I do my best to keep the properties up and I do my annual walkthroughs. And then every three years, we have um, a building inspector go in. He's an independent, unbiased. He's no skin in the game. He's uh, usually what you use when you wanna buy a home. You have an independent inspector go in there and um, let you know. They do in the crawl space, they go in the attic and look at the electrical, plumbing, everything, and tell me what's wrong with it. So I do that on top of it. I self-regulate. And when I do my walkthroughs with the resident tenants, and they are my customers as well. Um, I always ask them, please tell me what's wrong with the house so that I can fix it. I don't want deferred maintenance. Don't be afraid to call me. Um, excuse me, I'm just looking. Um, one of the important points is if there are process concerns with this, provide anonymous systems to report those complaints to code enforcement to the Neighborhood Revitalization Program. And please don't reinvent the wheel. Revamp the wheel that you already have and save money. Code enforcement is a good process, so let's use it and find a way to fund it, but please don't find a, a circuitous way, or I'm sorry, not a circuitous, but a roundabout way that insults my intelligence to fund it by calling it the revital, the, the home reinspection, home inspection program. Because really in the end, it's all coming down to just dollars that you're generating that you're passing on only to landlords. And if you really need to raise money to inspect homes for code enforcement because you've only got one guy on the job, then tax everybody. I don't like taxes, but don't, don't hand it down just to the landlords. You're slapping down the small percentage of, of homes that are 1%. And, 
Uh, one last thing, when people are displaced, I require uh, tenant liability insurance, uh, and one of those things are loss of use, and it's a valuable tool to have, I have it. If I'm displaced by mold or any other things, I have loss insurance uh, where my insurance will pay for me if I'm displaced. Thank you, it's very cheap, thank you. Thank you. Lisa Badenfort, followed by Aaron George. Thank you, good evening. Um, Lisa Badenfort, I live on Aussie Avenue in District 7. I come to you as a 15-year uh, renter and a fairly recent homeowner here in the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, and this comes at this really relevant time for my husband and I and my family. Um, and this is kind of part of a growing list of concerns for us. Um, after living in 15 different rentals in Sonoma County, most all in Santa Rosa, um, we finally became homeowners after saving for a very long time. Um, it's a dream come true. It's a pretty frightening endeavor, frankly. Uh, but we're looking currently at, um, we've always wanted to keep the house as a rental, if we could. As we look to move, how do we keep that um, as part of our portfolio and part of our business plan? Um, as we look at the costs and the risks and the alphabet soup of it all, uh, retaining the home is looking, uh, as a rental, is looking less and less possible. Um, a program like this really is frankly quite burdensome and unnecessary for an owner such as myself. It would cost hundreds and require hours of coordination, all to inspect a home that was built in 2000 um, that I maintain impeccably I say this not as a poor me situation, but to highlight how this affects thousands of landlords, independent mom and pops, the majority of your landlords in Santa Rosa um, own fewer than four units. So combined with um, other recent rental property laws, the cost of owning and renting out our home, it's almost a wash. And I just wonder how many other owners are in the same situation, deciding to sell their rentals instead. I also really want to express that in the 15 rentals that I lived in, um, in this city as a young, financially challenged applicant and renter, um, I've rented many below market rate. I have had to contact my landlord many, many times for repairs and upgrades and leaking this and broken that, and I didn't love it, but it was my responsibility to do it. And I have never had one landlord respond negatively, not once. If anything, most addressed the issue much faster than I ever expected and thanked me for notifying them, even when it was my fault. I've never been asked to replace the screen door that I broke or A, B, and C, and D. We have a fantastic landlord community and I have been grateful for each and every one. Please reconsider this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron George followed by Daniel Weinzig. Thank you, Mayor Swedhelm and the rest of the council members. My name is Aaron George and over the years I've been a uh, property owner and provided units available for my tenants. Um, as you know, the ownership of property comes at a great expense to property owners. Uh, not only that, but responsibility and also risk. My goal has always been to provide an excellent housing maintain not only a nice relationship with my tenants who are taking care of my properties, but also communicate um, and keep communicative relationships with my renters. And I believe I've been successful in that. I encourage my tenants to report any issues that have come about in their property because again, it is our investment. It's time, It's I'm prepared and happy to take care of those. This ordinance is substantial. It's not only substantial to the property owners, but it's also substantial to the city of Santa Rosa as well. I would urge you to please take a look at reallocating these funds, not only to code enforcement, but also to affording more affordable housing available out in the community, which I'm a firm believer that this will cause the cost of housing to go up, especially for our renter pool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Daniel Weinsweg, followed by Anita LaFollette. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. We're all here tonight because we want a healthy, thriving community. I myself, I'm a landlord in the JC neighborhood, and I am highly involved and invested in both my property and my tenants' health. 
And on the surface, I am against the idea of paying more fees to regulate something that I immaculately manage and maintain myself. But I think a proposal like this, we need to think deeper than the surface level reactions. I've seen the unhealthy conditions that my friends, my colleagues, and my clients live in, in this city. The impacts on their health that are, inhibit their ability to contribute to our community, it impedes their ability to become financially stable because they're sick, they're dealing with issues. So a rental inspection program, in my eyes, does not just provide a safety net for the most vulnerable, it also allows us to gather the data that we need about our rental units and our landlords to help us better analyze, with this data we can better analyze policies and uh, we can make better informed decisions going forward. Right now we don't have enough data. We've got 214 cases that are open, but we know there's probably a lot more out there that are not reported. As you know, housing conditions are directly connected to individual and community health, and living with improper plumbing or in a mold-infested unit creates unsafe conditions for our most vulnerable. So I'd like to thank you all for your continued effort to protect all members of our Santa Rosa and all the work that you're doing to create a healthier future for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Anita LaFollette, followed by Brian Ling. I, I really don't understand how it is that you can be making this decision since I know that you all are landowners or yeah, probably investing all your finances in the housing market, right? Because that's the only way you can make money these days is flipping houses, right? So I know that you uh, have a loophole whereby you all get to make this decision, but it doesn't seem like it's legal to me. Um, Heaven knows you should make any kind of a financial burden on any of these landlords. My goodness gracious, uh, let's not take on the landlords who uh, charge exorbitant rents and apartments. Do you know that there are many apartments available in Santa Rosa now as there are homeless people? And if everybody just lowered the rent, maybe we'd put all the people into houses. Wouldn't that be interesting? That's what they're doing there in Oakland, right? And um, we do have an emergency proclamation. So you did say there was no gouging allowed, but in fact, they continue to raise rents. They continue to charge high rates. And in fact, nobody can pay them. That's why we have the vacancy rate that we do. So has the DA even ever prosecuted anybody for gouging? No, nobody's even calling anybody on gouging. I know because I pay too much rent and it went up, not because the rent went up, because it's affordable, but the utility is exorbitant that you can't pay, yeah. So I think um, if you uh, should not discriminate against House Section 8, too. That's another thing that's going on a lot. It's still going on. In fact, they're putting it in papers. And I don't see any district attorney following through with those rules you made a long time ago against discrimination against Section 8. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Brian Ling, followed by Ananda Sweet. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, Brian Ling, Executive Director of Sonoma County Alliance. Uh, first, I've uh, voiced a concern to a few of you about the trend in recusals the past couple years, and I just wanted to say thank you for uh, taking another look at that, and uh, I totally appreciate the fact that uh, you, you've reconsidered it and got some other opinions and uh, to allow the additional participation tonight, which frankly is what we all elected you for. So thank you for that. Um, our group and myself were opposed to the proposed inspection program. Um, as an alternative, as it's been mentioned, to continue to take full advantage of the city's existing inspection programs and your existing assets to, to deal with these problems. The, the net result 
of a program like this, it may or may not have a significant decrease in the rental inventory in this town, but surely it won't add one unit. And that's really what this gets to. The community scream from and human cry is we need housing. We hear housing, the housing need is up here every day, every Tuesday in this council, it's up here. The human cry on bad landlords is somewhere way down here. I think that really answers the question. We can't continue to put increased regulations on housing. We need to pass rules that will encourage housing investment. This isn't it, thank you. Thank you, Ananda Sweet, followed by Isabel Fisher. Good evening, Mayor Schwethelm, members of the council. My name is Ananda Sweet. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. I want to start by thanking you for moving decisively over the past two years to enact innovative policies to lower costs and barriers to new housing development uh, and encourage desperately needing housing stock in Santa Rosa. We urge you, however, to reject the proposed rental inspection program as it would do the exact opposite. Um, it would cost significant time and financial resources to create a new bureaucracy that would be expensive and punitive for good landlords and discourage development, resulting in lower housing stock and increased rents. Uh, there are several currently approved multifamily housing projects that are finding it difficult to, difficult to pencil. Uh, and issues like this or initiatives like this could be the tipping point to stop a project from moving forward. Um, the city's worked really hard to convey recently that it's open for business uh, to development. However, actions such as this, when viewed through the eyes of developers and investors, send exactly the wrong message from a community that desperately needs to increase its housing stock. When this conversation started, uh, fear of retribution was one of the key points that was made, uh, but tenants just received tremendous protection from the Rental Protection Act from the state of California as of January 1st. State law ensures strict protections and strong legal system to tenants um, who need it. Locally in Sonoma County, uh, we have an active and skilled legal aid organization and a strong panel of lawyers who take tenants' cases on contingency. Rather than creating a new bureaucracy, the city could dedicate a fraction of the proposed resources to enhance existing successful programs like the Neighborhood Revitalization Program. Um, it could create an information campaign so that attendants understand what their current rights are. Uh, these types of solutions would eliminate the negative outcomes of the proposed program um, at a greater effectiveness and dramatically lower cost. Thank you. Thank you. Isabel Fisher followed by Brianna. Good evening, Council. Uh, I'm Isabel Fisher. I'm the chair of North Bay Organizing Projects Housing Task Force. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, at a previous meeting, a council member said that becoming a landlord is a choice. And another council member has said that having a tenant is more than a financial contract. It's a social contract. It's a relationship. And if you're, if you're not prepared to treat it as a social relationship with another human person and provide them with a healthy home, then you shouldn't be a landlord. Um, so I strongly urge you to pass this ordinance um, for several reasons. One, I want to respond to a lot of the comments that have been made and just say that a lot of tenants are too afraid to report uh, repairs that need to be made to their landlords for fear of retaliation. That's, that's the truth. And uh, the protection for whistleblowers, that's called just cause eviction. And if we had just cause eviction for all units, all rental units, then tenants would feel safe to report any repairs that needed to be made. And so only units that needed repairs would have to deal with that. And so until you're ready to pass just cause eviction for all rental units, we absolutely need a rental inspection program to identify those health hazards that tenants are too afraid to report. Uh, secondly, sometimes a tenant won't know if there is a health hazard in their unit until maybe they start showing physical symptoms. Like I might not know that there's mold in my walls until I start having asthma. 
And so an inspection, someone who is trained to identify signs of that kind of thing would be really helpful, not only to catch them early before a tenant starts to have health problems, but before they do too much damage to the unit, so it will be easier to take care of. And finally, uh, related to catching something early, uh, before a, uh, a, dam a hazard can do too much damage like mold, if it's caught early and can be dealt with without having made too much damage, uh, improving that unit and making that repair will increase the value of the unit. So thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your time. Um, and also, we're in a housing emergency crisis, so if we could have the housing items higher up on the agenda. Thank you. Brianna followed by Thomas Ells. What a beautifully timed um, sound effect. Uh, so um, we have a lot of people here who are landlords and um, like the young lady just said, it's not a thing to be taken on lightly. You're responsible for people's livelihood and lives. And um, uh, if you're going to let someone live in a house with mold, that takes a certain level of some sort of discare for the other person. Um, which is a mental health issue. And then it, a lot of the bad renters, quote unquote, who um, have hoarding issues or whatever it may be, uncleanliness issues, that's also a mental health issue. Um, so uh, clearly there's a issue in the community um, with not understanding that and um, addressing that as such. Otherwise the problem's just going to continue. Um, so I'd encourage you all to Look into that. Um, I forget my other point. Okay, um, that's it. It's just remember that it's a mental health issue often. Thank you, Thomas Ells, followed by Alex Coffin. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you for addressing this. I support this measure. Um, one unit does not uh, one bad unit out of 20 something units, as I understand, does not make a slumlord, but that's a slumlord. Have a lot of units, not one unit, but if there's more than one unit, that's a slumlord. Uh, Leona Helmsley, very rich, wealthy woman, many units. She was a slumlord, she went to prison. She belonged in prison. Um, we have 75,000 units here in Sonoma County. Uh, excuse me, in Santa Rosa, 50% of them approximately are rental units. That's already too high a percentage. Um, I understand $172 was the um, the fee for the inspection. It's on an eight year rotation. That's $21.50 a year. I think my numbers are right. Uh, if the total cost is $944,000 and there are 750 current not code cases open, but I understand there's 750 uh, inspections. Uh, related to that, that's 1000 to $1,500 per inspection or per family that would be subjected to uh, substandard conditions. And the reason for this universal inspection is that I believe that during that conversation before, it was suggested that people who were not really residents would be unable to, you know, they're not, they're not legal residents of the United States or California, and they would not really be able to complain. Now, uh, I was an appraiser myself, and I did appraisals. I did 27 uh, appraisals of rental units in one complex, uh, which was a, a condo, but they were used as apartments. And um, the owner told me, inspect these three, because they're empty. Go ahead. Looked at the three. Everything's perfect, everything's really good. I said, to do 27 appraisals, I've got to look at the other ones. And he said, oh, they're all the same. They're exactly the same, same square footage, same same plan, you know, three different plans for the 27 was, all. Well, they were three different plans, but uh, the point is they were all in different condition. Every one of the, this, the, all three of the ones that were empty were all completely rebuilt and all the other ones were lived in. 
and every one of them had leaking roofs and mold and moisture inside of it and it was terrible, terrible conditions. Every one of the 24 other ones that the owner didn't want me to inspect, so I inspected all of them. Uh, my point was is that out of those, uh, again, that would be about $1,000 to provide or $1,500, a lot less than the medical costs or the lifetime costs of those poor people who would be injured by living in those conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Alex Coffin, followed by Eric Frazier. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of the council, Alex Calfin with the California Partner Association. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and comment on this item. As your staff mentioned, um, we have worked with the city for the last few years on this issue, um, and I would love to be up here saying that we're in full support of this item, but unfortunately there are way too many issues that we do not support in this ordinance. Uh, what seems to be happening here is that there is an overall belief that somehow the folks that spoke today from the landlord side are not folks that are actually providing the housing. Most of the folks here are doing the right thing. They are maintaining their units, yet we are punishing them by subsidizing bad behavior of the ones that don't. And that to me just doesn't seem right. Um, no one here is in support of substandard homes. I'm sure of that. And if they are, they shouldn't be in the business. But to put the entire burden of the units that are not up to code on everyone that does the right thing is just not right. Um, the other issue that we have with the ordinance is that it seems to be very vague in, in the sense that we don't really know what is being inspected. What is going to happen? What are we looking at? What happens when staff person enters the unit? Um, it would be nice to know what those things are. I think that's a big issue. Um, I, I also believe that there's just some other issues um, relating to damage. I mean, if we're ready to have a conversation, I think we should. There was a comment that said we should think deep. I think we should. There are instances where the damages are done by the tenants. What do we do about that? Do we put that on the shoulders of the landlord? What if they have multiple tenants to do the damage, then what? It's becoming more and more difficult to have a property and manage it in the state of California. And this adds another layer, potential layers of fees, which quite frankly, while they're called out in the ordinance, and I appreciate that, they're not really set tonight. We could have a conversation at a later time and talk about different set of fees. That also makes it very difficult to plan ahead and to understand what your expenses may be. There's just an incredible amount of new law that's coming down, and there will be more this year so if we want to address the issue, let's address it efficiently. Let's focus on the problem properties. I think we know what they are and address those. I think making everyone pay the price for a few folks that are not behaving is not the right approach. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Frazier. Hello, City Council. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your time this evening and recognizing me. Um, I have a long history of being both a renter and a property owner in the county. And I have to say my um, experiences as a renter were really quite bad. I had to raise my family here and I had to suffer through inhabitable conditions on a couple occasions. But that was hardly the last straw. I mean, I've had my security deposit illegally absconded with so many times. Most people just sort of forget about their security deposit and assume that it's never gonna be returned. My point is that the problems are much larger than what's addressed by this ordinance. This ordinance is in fact a mallet that's striking down on the nut. It's, it's going to have the opposite effect of what you intend. It's gonna increase the cost for tenants. It, you're only going after a very small slice of problematic properties. It's not below 1%, let's get serious, that number is wrong. But it's not 70%, that number is wrong. It's probably somewhere certainly in between, probably 10%. It depends on if your standard is state law or if you're burdening everybody with additional regulations and considerations. If it's state law, I would say that an overwhelming majority of properties here would probably pass with flying colors because the state law isn't that onerous. Now, there has been changes to state law when it comes to unjust evictions and other things that haven't really been contemplated in the construction of this ordinance. 
And that's also a big problem. Quite frankly, a million dollars a year could be better spent on a risk abatement pool. A risk abatement pool for everybody could offer landlords the relief that they need with problematic tenants trashing their place, which does happen. And it could also alleviate the burdens of security deposits and, and uh, credit uh, application fees if administered properly. It would be welcome relief to both sides of the equation. And that million dollars actually wouldn't be spent. It just sits there as an asset. Our study indicates that in risk abatement pools that are applied to Section 8 housing, <clears throat> that the redemption rate is somewhere around 1% to, as payout for problematic tenants. We need to think out of the box, and this continued approach of creating uh, controversy and creating stress where it doesn't belong is not good for anybody. And however, my heart is with the, the tenants, but understanding what it takes to run a business and to be sure that we have the housing for tenants, I would say that this ordinance is definitely in the wrong direction. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Those are all the cards we have. Council, any questions after hearing public comment? Mr. Olivares. Thank you, Mr. Gwain. Uh, there was a, a question asked about what an inspection process would look like. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, yeah, so the, we would model it after the International Property Management Code. It's a universal uh, inspection tool, forms and noticing, and all the administrative details would be rolled out as part of the program promotion. Any additional questions, Mr. Rogers? Yeah, Director, just two quick questions. One is, uh, how long would an inspection like that typically take? Depends on the size of the unit. We estimate between 15 to 25 minutes. Okay, and does the tenant have to be present? We encourage the tenant to be present, but they do not have to be. The property owner or the representative does. Okay. Anything else? Okay, uh, Mr. Dowd, you have this item. If you want to put a uh, motion forward, you have the first. I, I, I will not, uh, my recommendation is not the motion that is before us, but a, a motion that uh, we continue to look at a way to more economically and feasibly take care of uh, rentals which are not adequately taken, have not adequately been taken care of. I don't support this particular recommendation about the housing inspection program. Okay. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion? I'll make it. Go ahead, Ms. Vice Mayor. I'll move an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa adding Chapter 1850 Rental Housing Inspection Program to the Santa Rosa City Code and wait for the reading of the text. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any additional comments? Mr. Sorry, anything you want to? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I, I wish I'd had an opportunity to be here on October 22nd because then my comments this evening would be um, perhaps a bit of a repeat. Um, I am, I, I feel that this, well, many hands have touched this ordinance. Many eyes have seen the ordinance, um, and many voices have provided input into the ordinance. So I, I honor all of the effort that went into this. I know that it was not easy. A great deal of research was done to, um, to come up with it. Um, but I believe that it is a solution looking for a problem. Um, I am... I was very um, encouraged by the words of, of Keith Becker who mentioned um, that there needs to be, uh, in no uncertain terms, major protections for whistleblowers. Our tenants need to have, the, a, a, to have a safe harbor in which to um, convey substandard conditions to the city of Santa Rosa. Um, whether that needs to be 
um, whether we need to, in, to in, enhance what already is in place legally or by education. I'm, I'm not, I don't really know what the answer is. I'm looking for really to go back to the drawing board uh, and, and as, as much work has already gone into this, um, I just don't believe that spending a million dollars a year in this way is going to benefit the, um, the tenants, and I think that this, the way this is written is onerous, and I can't support it. Um, there are elements of it that I, I, I understand the, the frustrations of the, te of the tenants, but I have a feeling that those tenants that are frustrated are, have been victims of bad landlords. And I also liked what, what Mr. Becker mentioned that we need to make it very, very expensive, if not impossible, for slum lords to exist in the city, and make and, and find ways, whatever, in whatever way is necessary, to identify them and go after them with every um, every ounce of of legal ability to to either find them um, in one way or another that, to help support other programs for for tenants. Um, to perhaps approach some of the concerns that they have um, without going into this kind of comprehensive um, rental inspection program. So most of, most of what I'm concerned about was voiced by the, by the landlords this evening. Um, I am a landlord, I have one a house with a studio apartment. Um, so I'm not a big landlord, uh, but I know what it takes to keep a property in good shape, and um, I think that this, this would be um, an unnecessary addition to the requirements already um, being placed on the landlords by the state of California, um, and I think that the protections right now, there are the protections, the necessary protections are in place um, for our tenants but I would go after the slumlords um, as, as, as much as we possibly can, because I think that they need to be eliminated from our city. Thank you. Mr. Rogers, any comments you'd like to make? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think that whenever we run into these conversations, we uh, always run into what are the good landlords doing and what are the bad landlords doing. And that's what makes it the most difficult is when everybody acts as positive towards their tenants as some of them do. And actually tonight I think is the first time we ever had a landlord stand up and say, I was one of those uh, that, that you're talking about. I think that that's a first for this chamber. Um, and I think, John, I think you just hit it on the head about where the neighborhood revitalization program fails. And, and that's first and foremost, uh, it, it's underfunded, uh, period. And then the second one is that lack of protection for whistle, whistleblowers that, and, and those of you who we've had conversations know that I've struggled with this particular item because I can see it from both sides having been a long-term tenant. I didn't want my unit inspected. I was under market uh, and I knew that, and I knew that my landlord would have taken care of it if I asked him to, if there was an issue. But I didn't want him to come into the unit. I didn't want him to, to even things that I thought I could take care of. I didn't want to ever risk that my rent was going to go up or that there was an opportunity where I wouldn't end up uh, in, in housing. Uh, I thought somebody also pointed out that the issue that we're really talking about here, that the challenge that we're talking about here is that that whistleblower protection isn't there even under the state's just cause ordinance, that it doesn't apply to every unit, and that scares people, particularly when we talk about our undocumented folks in our community who, for them, one mistake, one report, really changes everything for them. And so we need some form of anonymous system uh, and whistleblower protection for those specific individuals uh, that, that don't have any type of protection from retribution. And even some folks who are undocumented who are in uh, a unit that would be under just cause eviction, we know that there's still that threat that if a landlord really wanted to get rid of them could call ICE. And we have heard those stories and we've heard that story from, from employers as well. Um, if the council decides that this is not, that the rental inspection program is not the direction to go, 
we need to come up with some way to protect people so that the, re, the neighborhood revitalization program can be effective, that they can know what, what's happening. Um, and so I would urge us that if the motion fails to go that direction as well. In the meantime, I will support the motion. Mr. Adam, any additional comments you'd like to make? Well, I, I appreciate the comments that uh, Council Member Sawyers has made and Council Member Rogers. I don't think we have a perfect rental environment in Santa Rosa. I just don't think this is a proper road to go down, but I think we need to look carefully at the code enforcement uh, program that we have in the city, uh, the whistleblower protection, uh, however we can do the things that renters in this community need help with, I support. I just don't support this particular uh, program. Thank you. Ms. Weissman, do you have any additional comments? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I do believe that this is and can be one part of our overall housing goals. Uh, and even though we, again, we're playing around with some numbers and some unknowns, we talk about the 214 open cases. These are verified cases. Again, we don't know how many complaints were received. We don't know how many people have not complained for the reasons that have been stated before. Uh, and, and that's one barrier that I would like to, to eliminate. I, th I believe that our landlords do and should understand and know what codes are within the city of Santa Rosa related to a, a, a residence or a rental. Tenants don't, they don't understand what's what's the code and what's not. They could, there could be electrical violations that they don't know anything about. They don't know that it's, that it's right or wrong. Uh, so, so I think that burden is, is on us to help protect that. Uh, again, I don't think we, we will able to accurately uh, survey and identify what the, the magnitude of an issue like this, unless you're out there reaching out to all uh, tenants uh, anonymously to give them a chance to weigh in and talk about what's going on as, wrong, as far as their own uh, rental experience. Uh, but again, I, I think that this is something that can be a part of our overall efforts to provide adequate housing to all Santa Rosa residents. Ms. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to frame this conversation in terms of power dynamics. We are, from what we hear here is that landlords are at some, in some way disempowered by regulation. And I've heard testimony from so many wonderful landlords tonight who I imagine care about their tenants and are excellent business people. And as such, this, this fee and this small amount of regulation to me is not if you're as good as you say you are, and if you're as good a business people as you say you are, I think this is very similar to we all make choices. You know, when you make a choice to buy a car, you're gonna have to go to the DMV on a regular basis, every five years or so, sometimes more frequently. That's just how it is. And we have taken it for granted in a lot of senses, you know, but the other thing too is that it's an investment. You know, when you make an investment, when you buy a stock, there are risks associated with it. And one of the risks associated with this type of it, with this type of investment is one, it's damage. And I feel for you, and that is terrible. And we should look into that. But again, it's an investment and it's a choice. Nobody is making anybody become a landlord unless you inherit a property or something like that, which you could dispose of pretty easily. So you're asking us to essentially put the risk of your investment onto people who are inherently less powerful than you are. If you're here in Santa Rosa and you own a home that you're living in and you're renting out a home, you have a significant financial advantage over your tenants in general, not to each of you and not to every tenant. And that doesn't mean that I don't have great respect for my landlord. I've been a landlord in the past. I've been on both sides of it. and. Um, I think that what we have to do is we have to stop conflating a couple of things. One is the complaint-based system with the neighborhood revitalization program. One is for people who have enough empowerment to feel comfortable calling and making a complaint. And even though our director here at the outset said that 75% of homes in the neighborhood revitalization program don't pass an inspection, a number 7,500 out of 1,000, each and every one of you landlords came back and cited that 214 number. And so 
what we're really doing is we're not being very logical about it. What we're doing is we're saying we don't want regulation because it's uncomfortable and it's burdensome. I'm all for streamlining the burdensome nature of it and have been batting around ideas with staff around how to make this less difficult for landlords. Last thing we want to do is make it more difficult, but I'm unwilling to shift that burden of your investment onto our most vulnerable residents. And so I'll be supporting this motion enthusiastically. So this council has had plenty of discussions about this topic and seen this final product, you know, some things have changed for me, namely um, AB 1482 and then seeing the price tag of that $944,000, uh, the cost benefit analysis, you know, um, it, it's concerning to me and also it's concerning to me and it's, and it's we own the responsibility, those of us that were before us um, and our current council with our investment in NRP and code enforcement um, because I think this is a little bit, um, some, some folks in the audience made comments about the city's open for business. A concern that I've had, and I know one speaker mentioned it here today, and I've heard others where people are getting rid of their housing stock because they don't want to deal with the rental game here in Santa Rosa. And I just, um, that is great concerning to me, and I believe this ordinance may um, have greater unintended consequences. I, for one, want to see what the positive effects of AB 1482 will have on that. So with that, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that motion fails with three ayes and three noes. Uh, myself, Mr. Sawyer, Mr. Dowd voting no. Mr. Rogers? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that in the budget process, we bring back a revamped neighborhood revitalization program that includes with it a whistleblower protection uh, and some level of anonymity to it and increased fines for substandard housing. Second. Motion second, other comments? Comment I'd like to make on that because what I was hoping for, we have a variety of different um, priorities. And yes, this is a priority, but to take it on a one step, I, I'm very supportive of getting more information, but to take it out of context because I think we just passed the Evergreen. We're gonna have to find some 250K for that and there's other needs in our next presentation. There may be some additional financial concerns for that. So um, I, I think during our normal budget process and during our budget priorities, we can give that direction for the city manager, but I think it should be in context about the other priorities that we have. So uh, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Well, uh, um, one of the things that I did not mention in my comments was my support for the in our, in, for neighborhood revitalization program and, and enhancing it. It was something that we um, spoke to and during our goal setting um, last year, the, the fact that it had been, in fact, it was Council Member Oliveris that mentioned um, pretty clearly how it did, that program had been gutted over the years um, due to budget cutbacks and all sorts of, of reasons. And I, I always thought that it was, it was an important program. Um, and we do have a lot of, of challenges with our budget coming up um, in the next few months. But I would like to um, be able to have a conversation uh, in, in, with in the enhancement of that program um, because it was always, I think it was a great success and I was always sad to see it whittled away um, over time. So I'll be supporting that motion. So, so I do want to step in here a little bit and just for, so that I can get some clarity for staff if, as we're going through this motion. Is this program arose out of exactly the deficiencies that the staff was asked to explore this program because of the issues facing NRP and the challenges of restoring a program that was essentially uh, severely cut in 2008. So one of the assignments to count to the staff was to develop a ability to finance a reestablishment of this program. And I know not every council member has sat through this conversation or been able to participate. So I'm, I'm a little, you know, I just want to make sure that we understand and that, that that is fully on the table is that this program came forward as a response to the challenges that NRP was facing. And so I, I just share that because I know there's been folks in this conversation at different points, the conversation started in a different council, and I just I want to make sure that, that you are all aware that that was one of the challenges set out for staff, was that we knew we had deficiencies in the NRP program, 
we were asked to, to explore a rental inspection program to make up some of those deficiencies. And that the, the, the issue was is that those programs had been cut in 2008 and we were looking for resource to um, address that particular need. So I just, I wanna provide that context um, as we go through this and however this motion comes forward, we're gonna to need to have that conversation again about how we structure and finance a particular item. All right, with that, is everyone clear what the motion is? Okay, we have a motion to second your votes, please. Oop. I was looking for someone, who, would anyone else like to comment? Does anybody wanna? I just wanted to add that uh, I, I will be supporting the motion, but. I do have an additional reservation in, in addition to what Mr. McGlynn has said is that the landlord community came forward and suggested this as, as a solution to some other things. And so what I'm concerned about is that we keep whittling away. Well, if you do, don't, we don't want this, then we'll do that. If we don't want this, then we'll do that. So let's try to cultivate our institutional memory as we move forward and make some follow through instead of asking staff to continue bringing us forward things that we don't end up following through on. Any other comments? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think what part of the um, evolution of this comprehensive um, inspection program was through bringing together the industry um, to help inform and direct the uh, how, how to advance this program. So I would recommend um, perhaps before our budget hearings when we start to try to, to cobble together um, some enhancements to the to the NRP that we go again back to our the industry the rental industry and ask them for some recommendations to help do exactly what Mr. McGlynn's concern is is how do you if we cut it we cut the NRP because we couldn't afford it well if we revive if we enhance the NRP that same question is going to be before us is how do, how will we afford it what's gonna pay for it. Um, so I would encourage the industry, um, I know that they would be willing to come back to the table and uh, also the um, just, just landlords in general and try to come up with, a, with something that actually uh, will have some life to it and not be cut because of, our, because of budgets. And because again, I think it was a very important program and I hated to see it go or be diminished. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second in your votes, please. And that passes with five ayes, one no, myself voting no. Thank you. Any other motions or are we good on this topic? All right, M Mr. McGlynn, item 14.5. Item 14.5, report. Community Homeless Assistance Program CHAP Review, Dave Gwine <laughs> and Kelly Kuykendall presenting. Again, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. This item is to ask you to review your community homeless assistance program we affectionately call CHAP. This is a program where we've, years ago, we invited the community to help us with those homeless issue, and this is a chance to review how that program has been operating. But first, we wanted to set some context before we jump right into the CHAP program. And so we wanted to review with you briefly some guiding principles by which we evaluate our programs. A snapshot of homelessness in Santa Rosa. A look at Santa Rosa homeless solutions and strategy and our current programs and initiatives. So we wanna just tee those up and then we would get into the review of the CHAP program, share with you prior council feedback and look at the potential expansion of this program. 
So the guiding principles we operate as staff is the is current capacity is not scaled to need. And what we mean by that is we had Ian DeJong, an international expert on homelessness, in Santa Rosa in October, uh, reviewing a few things, especially all of our programs. He actually uh, wrote a book about how to end homelessness. And he basically, we asked him, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What should we change? And his message was pretty clear. We're doing every, all the best practices to try and solve homelessness, but the city of Santa Rosa, this area is just not scaled to meet the need. So with that, we were looking at how do I, we identify new funding sources so we're not always leaning on the general fund. And there's some ideas we're exploring at staff that there's current state program called HAP, Homelessness Housing Assistance and Prevention Program. It's going through the home Sonoma County. The chair and staff are meeting to set that agenda this week. So we're gonna talk through how might we access those funds. The, um, we established a consistent regional partnership through home Sonoma County. We look at anything we do in our program is based on best practices and it's focused on the goal of resolving the person's homelessness. So here's a snapshot of the current situation. There's an estimated 1,600 people experiencing homelessness within the city limits. This is based on last year's point in time count. We have an emergency declaration we're operating under. The programs, like I said, are based on evidence-based practices. And as staff, since we had the visit with the Indijong and scaling our programs, we've developed what we call our homeless action plan that we're vetting internally and we will have a conversation with the council eventually on this. But some examples are our outreach. So the we city sponsors two outreach workers through the host team, and then the county sponsors two more. So that's four total people countywide for an estimated what, 3,000 homeless population? It's just not to scale. Also our downtown enforcement team, if we were to have ongoing um, encampment interactions with the host, we would need more officers. We're also piloting a, a, a parking program, no overnight parking in two locations. And so how might our parking ordinance come into play? Written years ago, where it didn't contemplate people living in their vehicles as they are now and also the resources that are really working, the master leasing and other housing options. Your current budget to this program is 3.4 million. And again, we think that we're stronger together through home Sonoma County and that that's why that partnership needs to build on for these resources. So a quick review of the strategy. Your programs are based on to achieve functional zero by following the housing first model in alignment with federal, state, and the continuum of care known as home Sonoma County. By moving the person as quickly as possible into permanent supportive housing where services are provided. That's based on the common denominator of homelessness. This means there isn't a home. So that's the goal and the strategy for all your services. So a quick review of your programs and initiatives. They're in five key areas. Under day services, there's the Homeless Service Center. That's on Morgan Street. It's a multi-service day center providing showers, laundry, telephone, mail service, referrals and shelter intake, all with the goal of ex exiting participants out of homelessness and into housing. It were, it's where the homeless outreach service team is housed and coordinated entry program operations are based at this facility. You also support two low barrier housing focused shelter navigation center, the family support center on A Street, 138 bed emergency shelter for families. The center provides food, clothing, children's activities, medical and dental care, and client focused family action plans and services to overcome homelessness. Then there's Samuel Jones Hall around Finley Avenue, provides up to 213 year round beds. 138 of those beds are for individuals with the highest vulnerability in conjunction with the regional coordinated entry system, which includes set aside beds for the Nightingale program for medical respite. It also has public safety beds plus 75 beds prioritized for the homeless encampment assistance program. St. Joseph Health also operates a mobile medical clinic at this location. And the council approved just recently an additional investment of $1.6 million for capital and programming improvements to include repurposing the large dorm room to better accommodate persons with disabilities. 
There's also uh, outreach and engagement. We mentioned the host team. This is a street outreach team working to engage persons experiencing homelessness into services and housing in collaboration with the Santa Rosa Police Department and other service providers and community partners. Kern City Investment supports just two outreach workers, as I mentioned. There's a homeless encampment assistance program, HEAP for short. This is a citywide multidisciplinary team focusing on a compassionate approach to address the health, safety, and shelter needs of persons living in encampments and to ease the impacts of the surrounding communities. Encampments are prioritized based on the number of individuals estimated at the site and an assessment of their vulnerability due, due to living outdoors, associated health, safety, and fire risk, and property ownership. There's a variety of programs for housing support. We have rental assistance in the Housing First Fund. We have the HCA Family Fund, that's the donor's initials, which helps with security and deposits. And the Housing First Fund provides flexible funding for landlord incentives, risk mitigation, housing assistance, including rapid rehousing and master leasing. We utilize the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program to provide vouchers, project basing HUD VASH to provide permanent supportive housing. And then there's the work of the Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa Housing Trust, which sponsors the development of permanent supportive and affordable housing for low income persons, including our work on the former Bennett Valley Senior Site. And then lastly, there's the community based solutions, and that is the Community Homeless Assistance Program CHAP. It allows for property zone for commercial and assembly uses to establish safe parking, safe camping, and temporary overnight shelter with access to restroom and storage facilities. So we just put up here to close the, the setting the context. This is a screenshot of the city's web page that lists all the, all the things you're doing under the homeless solution. So if you go to the city's web page, and you click government, you'll see boards and commissions, you'll see city council, and then you'll see homeless solutions and you can go drill and get the data, resources, and understand more of our strategy. So we just wanted to share that with the council and with the community that so far the work has been informed by your strategy and program and services, and now we'll go into an evaluation of the possible expansion of the CHAT program. Thanks, Dave. Here's a slide. Um, there is, on the chat program, um, there's a detailed chronology provided for you in the staff report. I will do my best to, to recap that in one slide. So going back to October 2015, ne nearly four years ago, Council approved the initial pilot. This provided a limited scope of services and was for the winter months only. In October of 2016, a year later, Council approved an expanded CHAP, which provided a broader scope of services and year-round, and it was allowed for under a declaration of homeless emergency. CHAP um, currently allows for services on properties that meet the zoning code definition for a meeting facility, which is typically churches and commercially zoned properties. And the program allows for safe parking, safe camping, the placement and maintenance of portable toilets and access to existing bathroom facilities, provision of temporary overnight shelter and storage for personal belongings, which Dave covered briefly in the slide before this. Um, there are currently three participating property owners providing approximately 30 safe uh, parking spots in three locations. In 2016, Council approved $20,000 for CHAP grants to support the program. The current balance remaining is about $6,000. Dave and I were before you uh, last year in February 2019, providing an update on the program and seeking your input on potentially expanding it, and staff received in input from the council in six primary areas. First, to engage property owners, to understand barriers to their participation, including insurance costs, and also to learn ways to increase their participation to expand the definition of safe parking to residential and public properties. As I just described, it's um, currently restricted to commercial, commercially zoned properties and those that meet the meeting facility definition. Public property, identify, site, identify sites, public sites for safe parking, specifically city owned property and develop a, a budget for safe parking. To adopt the state of California's housing and community development emergency building standards, 
and ensure that any potential expansion of CHAP aligns with the city's housing first strategy, as well as that of our homeless system of care, Home Sonoma County, which Dave discussed. Moving on to engaging property owners. So Dave and I reached out to CHAP participants, so the three um, participating property owners. We also reached out to faith-based leaders and we received the following feedback. There was definitely concern around insurance and other costs. Costs And speaking to the CHAP participants, there is one um, participant, one property owner, the First United Methodist Church, who's been operating a safe parking program I believe since 2014 or 2015, and I know there's representatives here in the audience which can speak to that later. They can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they initially experienced an increase in their premium costs, but that has since leveled off. I reached out to the other two participating property owners and they haven't seen any increases in their insurance premiums related to operating safe parking. I can share with you that I've recently read New Beginning Safe Parking Program model, and that's a Santa Barbara-based safe parking program that's been around since the early 2000s, early 2000s, and they said that um, having a host agency or operator that provides the liability co coverage is a key incentive to obtaining uh, participation from property owners. Additionally, in their experience, it's not easy to insure a safe parking program, and not all companies are willing to insure it. There were also concerns expressed from meeting with these, uh, with property owners about uh, potential risk of liability, as well as interest and capacity from within the congregation. Some expressed a lack of interest and some were concerned about not having capacity to operate a safe parking po program. It was also expressed to Dave and I that it's great that the city has CHAP and allows for safe parking and other services as well as the grant funds, but the, the drive or the will to operate safe parking has to come from within the, co within the congregation, its own leadership, and they really need a champion within their, within their um, congregation to decide to implement safe parking. There were concerns about neighborhood objections. Um, you know, I've received very few complaints over the years about safe parking. I know there was strong objections to the Methodist Church's proposed safe camping program a couple years ago, but we've received very few um, complaints about the, the current safe parking um, lots. There have been some complaints or concerns about the CHAP grant application being burdensome, and I'll share with you that the application is based off our community advisory board grant. Um, process and has been vetted by a, our city attorney's office and I have since worked with our two um, property owners that receive grant funding through the, the CHAP program to streamline that process and I think that they would share with you that process has improved. And other program models, we were urged, we were encouraged to look at other program models and one of them was Mountain View which I reached out to and they run a program similar to what the county funded a few years ago that was operated by Catholic Charities, which involved both pu public property, so there's a county site, and um, churches, so it was a combination of a public and a faith-based program. Um, there was interest in a roving safe parking model. Um, I haven't found a community that's actually doing that yet, but I know that there's a lot of interest in, in doing that out there, and that would be similar to the Redwood, Redwood Gospel Missions roving shelter program, where rather than a church providing their parking lot for ongoing safe parking, they would provide it one night per month on a rotating basis. And there was interest expressed that they might, that the faith-based leaders weren't necessarily interested in hosting safe parking or offering up their lot, but the possibility of funding a faith-based model. Oh, I skipped one, let me go back. City participation. Um, we received feedback that um, property owners wanted the city to have skin in the game. And one way to do that is to provide um, city parking lots for safe parking. Moving on to expand the definition. As I discussed in the summary slide, there's interest from the council to expand the def definition of safe parking to private residential and public properties, and this includes vehicles, trailers, and RVs, and or RVs. Our existing declarations of shelter crisis and local homeless emergency provide for greater flexibility. The city also has existing urgency and resilient city ordinances that allows for the um, 
the placement or the provision of temporary housing under certain conditions. And subject to council direction, we could de develop similar criteria for CHAP to allow for the placement of a vehicle, a trailer, RV, or temporary housing on private residential property. Public property. So potential city-sponsored sites for your consideration include the Finley Community Center, Utility Field Office, excuse me, Sam Jones Hall, City Hall, the former Bennett Valley Senior Center, and the Parking District. I will say that our outreach extended to city staff, and Dave and I met with um, staff from departments that would might be impacted by safe parking on city um, property. And I would like to highlight that each of these sites presents unique constraints as well as opportunities for safe parking. Moving on to a housing fo focus program, program, and this would be similar to what I discussed with Mountain View or Catholic Charities, former county spon sponsored program where there's an operator that oversees and runs the program. This could be implemented on public or private property. We reached out to Catholic Charities as a former operator of a safe parking program to develop a, a budget for the program um, per your direction. And the estimate to operate an overnight scattered site program is approximately $530,000. Now, for a 24-7 single site, the budget is approximately $600,000 to $1 million. And that's based on information we put together for an item that came forward to council in February of 2018. So I just want to emphasize that these are estimates. A potential scope of services includes intake and placement, linkage to coordinated entry, lot monitor and hotline, portable toilets and hand washing stations, and housing staff. So specialized housing staff, including navigators, locators, and housing stabilization case managers. Subject to council direction, we could sole source a contract with Catholic Charities or go out for a request for proposals or qualifications. <laughs> Community outreach. So Dave and I met with or presented to the following groups. The Community Advisory Board, Downtown Subcommittee, Santa Rosa Together, the West End Neighborhood Association, the Rotary Club of Santa Rosa East, Homeless Action, and their newly formed nonprofit states. We also developed an informational one-page fact sheet, which was distributed to CAB neighborhood groups, Home Sonoma County's Urgent and Emergent Issues Task Group. An article um, or post was made in the City Connections newsletter, and a news flash item was uh, created for the city's website. Moving on to feedback received through this process, We've heard that safe parking and camping should be allowed citywide and not concentrated in you know, one area of the city, and that it should also be allowed in all, in all zoning districts. Again, city participation, there was a request that the city provide um, city lots for safe parking. There was concern if CHAP extends to resid residential property to what level um, the nearby neighbors would be engaged, so neighborhood engagement was, con was a concern. I received feedback that expanding CHAP could potentially attract persons experiencing homelessness to Santa Rosa. Costs related to insurance were also, was also a concern. And CHAP grants, so I said we have approximately 6,000 available. There's interest in increasing those funds and expanding the uses for that program. And fundraising or match grant, being able to use the CHAP grant to leverage other funding for a safe parking program and incentivizing participation that the city consider making ch changes to its general plan to incentivize property owners to participate in CHAP. Emergency building standards, as I mentioned, these, were, these are coming down from the state, Department of Housing and Community Development. These were adopted January 1st, 2020 for all California cities and counties, and they allow for emergency housing, including sleeping cabins, manufactured homes, recreation vehicles, trailers, and tents, so long as they're constructed or assembled in accordance with the new state codes. And you have to have emergency declarations in place to use these emergency building standards, which the city does. We've had those in place since August of 2016. 
Lastly, the last point of the six key areas that council provided feedback on was housing first alignment, and Dave talked about that earlier in the presentation. Just that whatever we do with CHAP, that we're doing so in alignment with the city's housing first strategy, which does recognize promising practices such as CHAP, as well as um, Home Sonoma County's goal to achieve functional zero homelessness. Next steps. So staff were seeking direction on components of the proposed CHAP expansion covered in this presentation, including expanding CHAP to private residential and public property, whether or not council is interested in funding and implementing a safe parking program, and ensuring CHAP alignment with housing first. Just wanna add that currently our colleagues at the county submitted uh, requested proposals to operate two indoor outdoor shelters that include safe parking. Those proposals came in yesterday afternoon. We're part of the review committee. We expect to know more about that in the next in the coming days, if not week. I just want to share that context with the council. So if you were considering a safe parking program, you might want to learn what came into the county to do the same. Just Dave, with that, um, we one of your earlier slides had guiding principles. Do you know our the county's guiding principles consistent with our guiding principles for that RFP? To to my knowledge, um, some for regarding resolving the person's homelessness, but the rest of the guiding principles, I would have to go back and check. Okay, thank you. With that, I'll move to the recommendation. Um, it is recommended by the Housing and Community Services Department that the council by motion provide direction on components of the potential expansion of the Community Homeless Assistance Program. This concludes our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Great, thank you for that presentation. Uh, council, questions? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I'm curious about the, the number of vehicles in, in the chat program or the number of people. Did, did I, you mentioned a number earlier in your very first part of the presentation. What is the maximum that we currently allow under our chat program? I guess that would be individual. Like, right, you're at a site? At, at the site. I can tell you that none of the sites exceed that amount. I mean, we, one site provides 20 park, safe parking spots. There's one that provides two to three spots and another that provides 10. I'd have to look back at our CHAP guidelines, but I think the cap is about 30 per. We've never run up against the cap. Okay, well, which, you know, I think part of the resistance for neighbors is, are the number of people that are, that are in attendance in any one um, program, if you will. So being able to keep it, um, allowing for smaller numbers or scattering it around the community, um, I think would probably end up being less resistant by the neighbors or resisted by the neighbors than large numbers. So it's just it was just it's just a thought. I was, I was curious what our cap was. Any other questions, Mr. Rogers? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if you could go to slide 14 first. So I wanted to ask you specifically about city-sponsored sites. Uh, and first, I wanted to point out that everything that was up there and in general, the groups that you met with are typically west of South E Street. And there's a whole lot more city than just that. Uh, and I think we've had this conversation before about where our service is being concentrated and how do we get a better geographic distribution across our, our community. And I would hope that if we are gonna consider city sponsored sites, that we are considering them equitably throughout our community and not just in one spot. Yeah, so when we looked at city owned real estate, what does the city own that you could consider on public property? Well, you have parks. So, you know, park, some parks have parking lots. And so you, you know where your parks are. You have fire stations. And so can a safe parking program fit on a fire station lot? And is that a good idea? And then there's public facilities, and that's what you see listed here, which is um, another consideration. Well, as a because we've done these uh, with our open government task force meetings, where we specifically went to different locations, I know that there are city-owned spots out in Oakmont, but I don't see them on the list. 
right? So I want to make sure that if we are actually going to have this, this conversation about how we're going to address homelessness as a community, that we're actually talking community-wide. So that was the first comment that I had. Uh, second, for the overnight scattered sites or the 24-7, uh, one of the questions that I always had about the so can, can, can we back up a little bit? I think I think one of the things that we're glossing over here is that city staff was looking at this also access to bus lines and services um, because again, even though there were maybe a safe parking, there may be reasons to do that. So I think there are, there are inf there are supporting and infrastructure reasons that that some of these other locations were chosen because of that connectivity issue. We're willing to look at other considerations, but I think the one you're citing is exactly one of those issues about some of those connectivity conversations. Even, you know, we talk about safe parking, but that doesn't necessarily mean that sometimes the vehicle can move and there are other ancillary. So I think we're open to that, but I think I just want to say that there was some consideration of those locations, but these are some of the questions we were asking about some of those locations. And I understand that and I can appreciate that, but also locations like the Steel Lane Community Center is next to public transit, would be an appropriate site for consideration. So I'd like to see a more full list for the council to be able to consider. Uh, for the cost, I've never really understood with something like City Hall, if we did a safe camping or a safe parking program at City Hall, why it's gonna cost half a million dollars. And I understand that that might be because we're layering on access to facilities, uh, security costs. I'd like to know what that actually entails so we can have a conversation about which components do we think are vital and especially since we're in a homeless emergency, how can we do this bare bones to to provide multiple sites, not just one site. So the 530,000 is not just for City Hall parking lot. I wanna make that clear. The overnight scattered site program is for up to 100 spots. And the cost is- uh, 100 spots or 100 uh, 100 places? parking spots, 100 okay. parking spots. And it would depend on the capacity of each of those parking lots, how many locations we would have. Got it. Catholic Charities prior safe parking program had up to 80 spots. One location was the county site that was 50 spots and then they had the balance of the 30 scattered at eight to 10 locations at churches. So the church spots were typically small, ranging from like two to 10 to 15. Um, that program was bare bones um, and it provided intake and placement, a lot monitor and, and hotline and portable the portable toilets and hand washing stations. It had staff to oversee that program. The cost was about 150,000 annually, but it wasn't focused on getting people into housing. It's not to say that they didn't have housing incomes, and there was value in that program because it provided a safe place for people to to stay in their vehicles overnight. However, Dave and I were developing estimates or budgets based off of council's housing first strategy and to have a housing focus safe program is very staff intensive and that, that additional cost there has to do with the, the housing staff. So that cost would include, for example, an additional host outreach worker? It includes housing staff, so there's the navigators, the locators, and the housing stabiliz stabilization case managers, as well as um, program management staff and the lot monitor. I'm not aware of an outreach worker specifically for this program. This is not funding an additional outreach worker. Okay, uh, is would there be some capacity in this? We hear a lot from the public. Can't we hire somebody as a site manager who is a homeless individual who wants to, to also work and wants a safe place to go. Would there be a capacity for us to build something like that into this program? If that was the direction of council, we would include that in our solicitation for proposals for this program. One observation that Kelly and I make is that if we're looking at a, a safe parking program on city real estate, run by the city, it, it really isn't an, an expansion of CHAP, it, unless maybe the community involves themselves somehow. It's really another city-run program. So we can build anything you would like to give us direction in in our request for proposal. Okay, and then uh, there are obviously also county sites within the city. I know that they are working on their phase two now for a sanctioned encampment. Is there any collaboration around this uh, 
vets hall, the fairgrounds, some of those sites that we've talked about, is there any room for us to collaborate with the county to do some form of a program at that, even if we help fund it, but on their, on their property? That's based on my comments earlier, council member, is those proposals came in just yesterday. They moved pretty fast, uh, just several weeks out with those. And so we wanna understand, re review those and understand what the options are if you wanted to have that information to make that decision. Okay, great, thank you so much. Mr. Dowd. I seem to, I, I, I see the acronym CHAP and I, the conversations about housing first, but nowhere in this presentation was there anything about services to help the homeless with the issues that got them into that homeless situation in the first place. And where does that fit into anything here? This, this seems to me like just spreading out uh, more sites that look like Joe Redota almost. Uh, and it, without dealing with the underlying causes of that homelessness, I don't see the people moving on from that situation. So how, wh how, where does that fit in? So thank you for your questions and your comments. Um, I would say that the Joe Redota Trail is not a managed encampment. And what we're proposing here is not an encampment, but safe parking, and it would be managed. So in my opinion, it would look nothing like the Joe Ardota Trail. Um, additionally, there's staffing here to help people um, address the needs and what brought them into homelessness and to move them out of homelessness. Um, in this particular program, and I would say, in continuation or as a continuum of the other services that the city funds and that the county is funding through um, Home Sonoma County. Okay, so it, it is a piece of this puzzle then that that will be attended to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I would add, Council Member, that those program and initiatives we teed up earlier in the presentation are where that rule work begins. Okay. Any other questions, Ms. Vice Mayor? So this is tagging on to uh, Council Member Rogers' questions about the financing for running uh, a safe housing encampment coming in at a half million dollars. I understand that a previous council went forward with a model that essentially requires all of these services. Is there um, a chance that we're allowing uh, the ideal of perfect as in housing first, which is a term of art, which means we don't have barriers to housing, not that we provide everybody with housing first instead of these other things. So are we essentially handicapping ourselves by having tied ourselves to a model to which we're unable to follow through on? And is there a way to maintain the spirit of it, which is to not preclude people from housing and get them to it, while not making it so expensive and cumbersome, do we have a more of a Goldilocks solution? I know this is a tough, I could see, I could, all right, all right, all right, all right. I, I, I'll, I think, I'll, I'll rescind the question. Uh, thank you. Late. I mean, I, I think that this is part of the question the staff has of the council is, the, 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 the cost centers that you see in front of you reflect our commitment to the housing first. If council wishes us to, roll that back, then there are different ways to approach a problem. But but we've been committed to doing this. This has been the protocol that we've followed. We're gonna need direction to say that there's some other approach that council wants us to take on, on these particular issues. But right now you're seeing the cost centers associated with a housing first model. I think there's all, there's always a question of what, what it is that you want to see addressed in a particular approach. And we can structure an RFP to address that exact question. Right now, we're working under that auspices and we're working with the folks that we currently would be quickest to deliver services in, a, in this type of situation, but we haven't been able to canvas an RFP or receive the direction. Well, I, uh, I will just, wonder rhetorically, are we allowing our ambitious policy and our caring policy to get in the way of, act of, of doing more caring? I understand that we are housing quite a number of people, but that we're unable to serve as many people as we might like to, and I don't need a, a answer to my, my curiosity. Any additional questions? Yes, Mr. Alvarez? Oh, Mr. Rogers. 
Yeah, I just got one more and it's along the same line. What, what would the practical impact be if we were to just say, we're not going to enforce our anti-camping ordinance on city property between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m.? I, I can't. I can't answer that. If you want us to do that, we can do that research and bring it back to you. What if we were to relax something like that? So, I mean, it requires that would require us taking that back to staff and evaluating. I'm not going to put these two in the to respond to police and all those other things. We need to do that assessment. We can again. We provide us direction. We can look at that. And we can bring something back. Okay, and then specifically, Dave, I forgot to ask you, you and I had a conversation about a couple weeks ago about uh, utilization of the city hall uh, parking lot and sort of playing off of this uh, indoor outdoor shelter concept. The, there's the building that has ADA issues that was at first and D uh, that's there that the city owns. If you were gonna look into potentially if there was something we could do there, open up a bathroom or a heating center, uh, do you need some direction from staff to look into that or uh, how would you like to proceed with that? We would like to have direction from the council on that. Um, the, the concept we discussed with, between us was if we had safe parking on the city hall lot, perhaps the ground floor of the right. former West America building could be a warming center in, on certain nights. Um, it, it doesn't meet ADA for restroom facilities, but we could also put cleaning stations, restrooms in the city hall lot. And Sue, if, if you could also, if the council is interested in looking at that, uh, I'd be interested to know, yes, obviously we want to come into ADA compliance, but under our homeless emergency, if it's not a permanent thing, but a, a temporary or, or occasional thing, would we still have to come up to ADA compliance to make that building accessible? Um, our uh, declaration of emergencies, both the uh, declaration of homeless emergency and declaration of shelter crisis, um, do give us some flexibility. Um, devil's in the details. Um, so we would have to look at the building itself. What are the uh, what are the issues there? What's the extent of our flexibility? So, you know, with council direction, we would uh, we could look at that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I've got a couple. Um, on slide three, you talked about identifying new funding sources versus the general fund. Could you expand on that a little? Sure, we're in discussions about the possibility of retaining the services of a professional grant writer, just to scour federal, state, resources, foundations, philanthropic groups, to see what might be available to scale our programs up to meet the need, such as outreach workers and things. There's also the funding, as you know, through the Continuum of Care Home Sonoma County that is being discussed. How might that help our scalability of our programs? Um, that is primarily the two alternative resources right now. And so absent the home Sonoma County, which you know we have a voice in, but not the decision makers, um, is there a price tag attached to that? Yeah, we're estimating some scaling. So for example, to add two more um, outreach workers would be an estimated $140,000. So specifically about the new funding sources, the grant right or whatever uh, title you just described there, how much? Well, we would be uh, looking at um, up to $50,000 to pay someone to bring us a work product and then decide whether we proceed with the rest of the work. Okay. The reason I'm asking this is that, again, you've heard me say this before, is that whole return on investment. So w w where are we going? We're trying to get to functional zero, and if we have 50K, let's just use that as an example. What's the best investment? You know, we may or may not say that 50K for a grant writer is the best investment versus something, you know, Mr. Rogers just talked about or any other council member. Sure. And then on um, slide eight, you talked about the housing first fund. What's the status of the housing first fund? And again, I'm asking from the perspective of these are investments that the council has made, and I'm looking for, again, the return on that investment. So status, are you looking for housing outcomes? Uh, um, basically, are we housing people, and is there any money left? Well, there's money left in landlord incentives and risk mitigation and tenant assistance. Catholic Charities is rapidly drawing down the housing funds, and we're looking at making adjustments in the budget so they can continue to move people into housing. I did look at some data today. Um, 
We are, so I think I'd shared with council recently that last year through our city sponsored programs, we housed 306 um, households, which is fabulous. And I did look at the first quarter data for this fiscal year and we've housed across our programs 97 so far. So we're trending upwards. And for hosts specifically, if I can see these numbers, there was 42 housed in the first quarter. And I'm still, we have the second quarter reports, but I'm still reviewing those and they're not final yet. And so for members of the, the public, Mayor, if they went to the city's webpage and clicked the data, that's where they would find this information. Yeah. Our, I, our dashboard. And I really appreciate that, that, that dashboard um, because one of the ways that I look at this too, you put some cost to the overnight scattered sites at 530K and the 24 seven single site, 600K to a million dollars. How would that equate to, let's, let's say our rapid rehousing fund or a master lease program? How many people could potentially be housed with that same dollar amount? In other words, do we do an overnight scattered for 530 or do we house X number of people? Do we have that data? No, but we can certainly do that analysis. I, I would be interested, that's the way I would look at it. Okay, if we have, and again, I, I know the answer from the city manager because we're not sitting on a half million, million bucks of unallocated, we are have to make some decisions about what's the best investment. So I think that would be a data point that um, I'd be interested in understanding. Any other questions from council? Okay, we have several cards on this. Uh, Colleen Fernald's up first, followed by Gregory Furon. Colleen Fernald, on the card there, what's my address? I said here, I am one of many homeless people. The cause of my homelessness is not substance abuse, like a lot of people might guess is many homeless people's reason for being in that situation. You broke me. You did nothing to protect me or my child from the rapist, nothing. You protected the rapist. You broke me. My trauma remains until you're doing something about it. So fix me by doing something about it right now. No public bathrooms in your very expensive square for homed people or unhomed people. Is there access to your bathroom here? Here? No, staff only. If I wanna drink a water or take a pee, I have to leave the building. If my name's about to be called up and speaking, that's a problem, isn't it? Right here. What are we gonna do about it? Well, you know, your partner's with the county and you know how people get a reduction in property taxes if they agree to keep the property in wild land or in agriculture, but there's no accountability for the wine industry and how much water's taken out, how many chemicals get put in, and people who probably could afford to pay, they don't. I want to see another kind of like S overlay. There's a Z overlay, I want an S overlay, social value. Work with the county. How can you give property owners incentive to create housing that people can afford? Because general assistance will pay $400, you're lucky to find one room that's $1,000, right? to say, we'll give you incentives, you promise to keep it 50% market rate so these people can be housed. Now we don't want toxic stock, and not everybody wants urban density. I've had tinnitus for 25 years, not a solid second of peace and quiet for me. So when I need a rest, I need quiet, not urban density. I wanna be in nature, I wanna garden, I wanna take care of a forest to feed my soul. How could we do this? Green Tiny Home Building Guild, partner up. Redwood Empire Green Building Council, JC just got some money for construction trades. Where's the green in that? Sweat Equity, Habitat for Humanity, any organization that's doing this, any builder, where's the guild? Where we come and bring our knowledge, learn, take and go. Where's the Tiny Home Village Building Guild, where we learn how to get along. Some camps need 24 facilitation, some don't need any. Some are totally private, some are totally public, some are a combination. Let's Thank you, Colleen. So, uh, Gregory Furon, followed by Kathleen Finnegan. 
Good evening, I'm Gregory Farron, Santa Rosa resident and board treasurer of Sonoma Applied Village Services. I encourage you to act boldly. I'm gonna read you the first paragraph of this and jettison the second and third because the staff have covered most of that. But I wanna tell you, first of all, we didn't come in here asking for a half million dollars for a whole, you know, for a, a Cadillac, Goldilocks, whatever. We came to the staff and I appreciate all of their work, but we said basically, you know, 30 sites or 30 spaces have been operating for three years and what have they used, $14,000? This is the cheapest, most effective use of your money you could ever do to help homeless. Most of the people in safe parking are uh, pretty self-supporting. A lot of them have jobs. They just need a place to put their car. Okay, let me read you the paragraph and then I'll quit. I encourage you to act as boldly as you can to expand the use of CHAP. Building on the success of the program, SAVE submitted an application that David and, and uh, um, your staff have said basically they are going to apply or they're going to review. We applied to the county for a comprehensive safe parking program that includes Sebastopol, Roner Park, Santa Rosa, and the county. Because we've had people from those cities say, what are you doing in Santa Rosa? How well have you been doing it? What's your best practices? We'd like to start some in our cities. So what we're applying for is a regional, collaborative, low-cost, safe parking on those parking spaces all over the county. We aren't trying to build you a giant parking lot in Santa Rosa that has, you know, a whole lot of cars on it. We know that small village, just like people, is the best model. We don't want to have huge uh, however effective that is for having uh, services, it doesn't work for people. Um, so we submitted an application. We're being considered as a qualified applicant to be able to help expand it. Not all those churches want to be able to be direct applicants for any money. They would like to have their costs covered. They'd like to have best practices, but somebody's got to be the glue to hold it together. SAVES has been operating under homeless action and when we were out on uh, Challenger Way in RVs, for a lot of these folks. We've been the people who have been helping for at least two years, and we want to do more. We're going to try, but we're not asking for the money you're talking about. Uh, housing first is a problem. It burdens a whole lot of people with excess cost. Thank you, Kathleen Finnegan, followed by Sonali Sikand. Kathleen's gone, okay. Sonali Sikand, followed by Daniel Weinzweig. I don't have statistics, spreadsheets, or dollar numbers to share with you. What I have is a four letter word, love. I have personally witnessed people activated by love, compassion, and kindness, by the community that has been coming together to support our vulnerable brothers and sisters, to hold their hand to bring them a home-cooked meal, folks that take their precious resources and share with them. Interestingly, it's those folks that have some of the least that have been sharing the most. Others are afraid that by doing so, people will become degenerate. That's not so. People are activated by purpose. It brings them to life. Those that are down and out try to help those that are worse off than them. Scott helps Tara. Nikki helps the kid, a young fellow who's up there looking down on us, who can barely write. Karen helps Michael, them and so many more. I never thought I'd find some of my best friends working with the homeless than I have. Folks that share my values, folks would, who would come to bat for you if you needed it, and they could help. Folks in this room like Adrian and Catherine and Althea and Marcos and Thomas and so many more, and people out there on the street. Our system is ripe with inequities that contribute to this mess. We are responsible for it, not just those individuals. 
People who have vouchers have no place to go because of high rents. For others, finding jobs with living wages is impossible. There's a woman on the trail right now who works at Sonoma Valley Bagel who has no place to go. I spent the last week trying to advocate for one of the most vulnerable on that trail, and our system is a damn mess. You listed a lot of resources, many of which I intimately interacted with and could not help. Among others, the Council on Aging couldn't help because she was three years too young. I never got a call back from IHSS or health services, nor a return call from City Council Alegria. Mental health couldn't help because she didn't sound dire enough, yet the police came knocking at my door in the middle of the night because of a call from the neighbors. By the grace of the universe, we found her a spot at Los Gilicos. On the way there, she shared her dream, and that was to find a place that was safe for other people to come and take refuge. These people want to help. We need to help them. Please open City Hall, as Chris Rogers has said, effective immediately. Please help. We need you on our side. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Weinzweig followed by Anita LaFollette. How do we put a price on the value of a clean restroom or a safe night's sleep? The health implications of having a safe place to call home for a night is invaluable. And CHAP is a much needed and very creative way to leverage latent resources to address this urgent need. This program is a vital tool for governmental and non-governmental stakeholders to fill the immediate need presented by our homeless neighbors until more permanent housing solutions can be implemented. Expanding CHAP will give more property owners the chance to participate in the program and help our neighbors access the needed services to improve their mental and physical health immediately. I urge you all to continue to expand the low barrier solution that is CHAP. Thank you. Thank you. Anita LaFollette followed by Brianna. Good evening, ditto, ditto, ditto. Thank you, Brianna, followed by Gail Simons. Hey, um, okay. So um, I really appreciate you guys, especially Chris and Victoria, um, looking for good and new solutions um, that hopefully will um, help actually help people. Like your staff has said, um, this is all on your direction. You can make directions to save people. Um, if we bring it back to the last big point, um, which was the slum landlords um, and it being a choice to be a landlord, um, it's a choice to be a city council person. It's a choice to um, uh, be the mayor. And it's your choice to have people who are um, literally sick and unable to really help themselves or they're, they are able to help themselves and just need a, some space and um, not to be attacked by your police. Um, what you have up there on your walls is actually a, a, a wall of the photos of your victims, of the victims of your police department who harass them constantly and take their stuff and, and um, make it harder for them to get jobs. A lot of them want jobs. A lot of them aren't fit to work, but a lot of them want jobs um, and could help. Um, and if you talk about slim landlords, um, unfortunately, the biggest one sitting right here, Catholic Charities. Um, if we talk about mold, there's mold, horrible mold at Sam Jones and 600 Morgan Street. There's no mold in beautiful city buildings. We go to all these meetings at all the beautiful city buildings and they're immaculate and stocked to the brim with paper towels. We have more than enough resources. It's a choice for you guys to make these people sleep on the streets and in puddles. And it's a disgusting choice. Um, it's, 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 it's criminal, and you should hold yourselves accountable, and you should direct your staff to make whatever, um, open the armory, um, open City Hall, um, open as many, um, like you said, it's been a year and a half that I've been asking, hey, how many people can we help with the money that we have? 
bare bones. And you just finally asked that question tonight. Thank you. That was my question. You're welcome. Um, let's do it. Let direct your staff. Do it. And stop giving Catholic charities money because they spend it horribly. But, and we have more than enough money. If we took it back from them, we could house people. Thank you. Gail Simons, followed by Adrian Lobby. Thank you, Brianna. I'm I'm Gail Simons, I'm a citizen um, of East Santa Rosa. <clears throat> I definitely support the expansion of the CHAP program. I support safe parking lots in at least each city district so that we'll stop having people complain that it's, it's in their neighborhood and nobody else's. We need multiple safe parking lots at least of small populations, 15 to 20, that's handleable. We already have unofficial safe, uh, unofficial parking lots of RVs and cars all over town without sanitation. So we might as well just call it what it is and, you know, get help people get some organization. Dave, you laid out um, some mini city programs at the very beginning of the slide program. Um, although there are many lofty ideals in there, I, I may get in trouble, but I just want to share from a practical point of view that some of those programs aren't working very well at all. Um, my, the safe parking program that I work with is CHAP supported. We have 20 parking spots. Um, we work with um, coordinated entry in order to get CHAP funds to pay for the porta potty. Last, August, late August or September, we met with CHAP and they promised us that within a few days we'd have multiple applicants for our safe parking spots. And I, to my knowledge, we've had one. And the reason given is that the computer systems just can't seem to talk to each other. So just kind of wanted you to know that. Um, so I assist at that safe parking lot. It is a bare bones safe parking lot. It's not housing focused. So it doesn't cost us much money. We have no security, we have a porta potty, we have garbage cans, we have two to four community volunteers, all women. Our participants are so grateful. They almost come to tears thanking us for this opportunity. They have relative safety, they have a sense of community, they are in a sort of a neighborhood, they, they have reliability and routine. They get a placard with a number on it and a key to the porta potty padlock. That's what they get when they come in. They sign a small agreement to keep the peace. They are so attached to parking space number five or parking space number 12. If anybody else is in that parking space, bless them because people need to know that that's their little piece of the world. There are three churches, very small churches that operate in that small business complex um, many hours of the day. Then they take our neighbors in and offer them food and they're wonderful, no complaints. Thank you, Adrian Lobby followed by Alice Lynn. Hello again. I just want to mention that Gail, who you just talked to, has also been part of the volunteer group to run this uh, parking lot, Safe Parking, has also been meeting with the neighborhood uh, folks and with the owner of the facility who lets us use that facility. So it's a very uh, vibrant situation with a lot of community that goes out beyond the parking lot into the neighborhood itself. And it's all run for the cost of a porta potty, cost of trash pickup. Yeah, it's really nice when you have someone who can come in and help people. I'm sure that most of the people who are in that 20 person parking lot would love to have somebody come by, knock on their window and say, what do you need? Can I help you get some documentation? Can I help you get signed up for services? I'm not opposed to having people help people. I think it's a good thing. But what we're talking about now is survival. And when Ian DeJong was in town last, he made it really clear Yes, we try to get people into housing, and we try to help people stay alive while we're waiting for housing to come to them. Those two, how much money we put into one versus the other is a community decision. Our community has never really made, had this conversation. We've just gone to say, oh, we should just fund things that are housing focused. 
but clearly we have 1600 people right now while we're sitting in this chamber who are sleeping in the cold and the damp. 30% of those people, according to Portland's time chart um, count, have a vehicle, live in a vehicle. It's not ideal, but they have some kind of shelter that is not under a bush or an awning. And to give them a place where they can just go and sleep, where they know who's in the car next to them, and it's not somebody new every night, where they don't have to worry about the cops coming by or the neighbors complaining. That is, well, as Daniel said, that is a huge benefit to people's health outcomes. I would really encourage you to take care of the insurance problem. I've seen many people try to step up for this kind of program and get knocked back by the, the problem of trying to figure out the insurance. I would encourage you to really look at the costs and, and as you were talking about already, try to figure out what's a reasonable cost to put into this and please open it up for uh, requests for proposals rather than handing it off to a single operator. I think you'll find some interesting ideas coming forth. Thank you for considering it. Thank you. Alice Lynn followed by Thomas Ells. Thank you, Mary Ashbedholm and Council. Um, the United Nations has a minimum set of standards for the treatment of refugees of war, famine, and natural disasters described in free online UN handbooks on providing for refugees. These minimum standards provide necessities for health and safety, such as a fenced permitted site with security for residents' safety, portable toilets, hand washing, and showers, a private tent for each individual or household, cooking and heating features. We need to establish a minimum standard of care for people experiencing homelessness in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County. It should be focused on lowest cost solutions to ensure a minimum level of care for all 2,000 people unsheltered in Sonoma County. Safe parking, as Gregory Ferron uh, described, has been and can be one of those lowest cost solutions. A car or RV provides a rigid structure, a roof, a locked door designed to protect human beings and provide transportation for them. I urge you as well to ensure a diversity of service providers so that a wide range of people can be served and to create a healthy competition between providers to improve services for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas Ellis followed by Bob Cheel. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and to address this question. I appreciate the uh, council's efforts. I wanna point out that in the original uh, CHAP program that it included areas of, of assembly buildings and general commercial and that was interpreted narrowly to the specific zoning of commercial general, the commercial general zone. Okay, I believe that's incorrect uh, according to that approval and that should be either addressed or widened to the legal term of general commercial, which is all commercial properties. And then you would have an expansion of that capability. Uh, the recent proposals for the indoor and outdoor shelter proposals were only for provider qualifications. They do not include sites. So there'd be no sites proposed in there. So I wanna address sites. Um, I believe, and I, I'm, I may not be, hope everybody can hear me up. Uh, I believe that the city owns the library sites. So the city owns the Rincon Valley Library, the Northwest Library and its site, uh, and the downtown library and its site, which has parking. It also owns the Steel Lane Center, City Hall and the First and D. Um, I'll tell you that the, 
significant cost is the porta potties at, of of the costs that are not related to to uh, services or navigation services, uh, which are roughly the porta potties roughly about ten percent of the total five hundred thousand or a million dollars for the twenty four hour sites. You'd be looking at about ten percent of that for the cost of the porta potties for all of the entire program, and then the other parts were services uh, being provided. Uh, you also have the parking structures, and on those you could have you could offer passes. They're sixty dollars a month for the pass, approximately. But the person's buying the pass; they give the money back to you, so there's no cost there. There'd be no cost for using those sites, and some of them have bathroom, bathrooms. I'll tell you, the city hall has an AA or AOD recovery program right over here. The people come in. And I guarantee you, because I've been out in the parking lot and I know what they're doing out there, and you have more problems here from that than you would in the safe parking that they've had at Dave Berto's over on McBride for the whole time. You have more problems right now already than you would ever have from the safe parking because they're worried about their housing because it's their housing when they're going to lose it um, if they cause a problem. So please do uh, pass this. And uh, remember, it's 10% would be the cost uh, which would be just the porta potties, and and that could include the uh, the hand washing stations. Thank you. Thank you, Bob Geo, followed by Eric Frazier. Um, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Fleming. Um, thank you to the council. I'd like to thank also to David and Kelly for the work that your department has done um, in support. I'm with the, a volunteer with the First United Methodist Church. And uh, of course, it's easy to, I, I'd like to say that the words that Gail said regarding the, you know, the temperament of the, of the people, we call them participants and our safe parking. We've been doing safe parking at our Giffen Avenue address since December of 2017. Um, we tried very hard to do safe camping, you know, as we remember, when CHAP was first uh, allowing, when, when we said safe camping is good, we said, great, let's do it. And what we discovered, of course, is that these projects are very much front loaded with fear. You know, the neighbors are afraid, everybody's afraid um, to, in, to embark in it. And we find those are big hurdles. And so, of course, once it gets going, you soon discover that like safe parking, I, I'm not, I don't know the statistics, but I would imagine that very few people in the neighborhood even know that it's going on, you know? Although, one of the things that it tends to do is it tends to be um, targeted as, say, a magnet. So if something goes on over there, it must be because of our safe parking, right? And so then the phone call may come into the city. Of course, obviously those two are disconnected, but it is, the, again, that fear. So what I what I, I I'm certainly very much in favor of expanding this out. But the reason that hits me the most is that is that the example that's being set, you know, the fact that safe parking is working here in town, you know, should quell fears like the question of is it going to be like Joe Rodota Trail? Well, actually, the fact is we do it with volunteers. No, do we have people? You know. Driving in, I don't. I, in all the time that I've volunteered, I volunteer once a night, one one night a week, each week. I have never once found a car that's not supposed to be there. Um, people that are there are very much protective of this of the site and the spot. And if there is somebody there, they'll call us and say, "Oh, by the way, there's somebody here who's not supposed to be here." So they're very much invested in it. I like the idea of the Los Gilicos project that's going on, thinking, well, maybe this will be like safe camping. You know, maybe this will be a, a working example. I think that's what we need more of. So I encourage you to go. The thing that we lack, the biggest piece that's missing is our ability to help them move into housing. And so any monies that are spent to help with that piece, the housing locators, um, everything along that line is a would be a big help for us. So thank you for us. Thank you, Bob. Eric Frazier, followed by Daisy Pisty Lynn. Yes, thank you again. I'll uh, try to be brief. I know the evening's getting long. Uh, what struck me, though, was how we can have a declared emergency, a homeless emergency, over the past several years, 
but it doesn't look like it's being effectively managed. I, I hear a lot of great uh, programs. I know Mayor Swedholm, I've talked to you personally about the Housing First model, but it's undeniable when we're sitting in the audience, such esteemed experts on housing solutions, that there seems to be a big disconnect when figure comes forward of $500,000. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like the gravitas of emergency is visited upon the council. I don't mean that in any disrespect because I know that the struggle for finding solutions has been ongoing, but there does seem to be a business disconnect over managing what is a declared emergency. And it seems like the council is in fact front loaded with fear. There's something that's making this not fall in line with just common sense solutions. People are already parking in the streets of Santa Rosa. People are already homeless. People are already going without appropriate restrooms at night. Their health incomes are definitely being affected by being homeless. The emergency I thought was to properly manage and mitigate the impact of people that are experiencing the emergency. I mean, when the crisis broke out on the trail, I, I was astounded that restrooms weren't there practically <laughs> as soon as they saw a bunch of people congregating, where were the restrooms? I mean, don't you val value the, the safety and health of the general community as well, including everybody that's part of our community, including those that are living in cars and going to work people that are living on the ground and going to work, or people that are also in those situations and can't work. I, that's the disconnect for me is, I just don't understand where the gravitas of solving the emergency has left your decision-making process. So I hope you do find a solution. I hope you listen to our fellow um, neighbors that have obviously studied the issue and are acting with their heart and with their money, and they're not spending a half a million dollars <laughs> to do the impacts that they're doing so effectively, but they need help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Daisy Pisty Lynn. Um, good evening. I know I stand between you all and getting back to your homes that you're lucky enough to have and the rest of us that are lucky enough to have them. Um, I was sitting in my own home, which I'm lucky to have watching this tonight, and you guys have tackled a lot of really important issues that are near and dear to my heart. Obviously, I know that you're aware that you know zero waste and clean energy are very important to me, and this is the thing that brought me here tonight because I have been walking around this city. I was out on the Redota Trail recently, and it is just astonishing and horrifying to me that we have denied access to land to people for whom the instability in their lives continues the trauma that they've already experienced in their lives that has put them there. If any of you have experienced the instability in between housing, or maybe you had to crash on a friend's couch for a few weeks when you were in your 20s, if you can think back to that, Maybe you were moving into your dorm room and you didn't know what your dorm mates were gonna be like when you went to college. Maybe when you were leaving college, you didn't know where you would live when you moved to a city. Think about that instability that you experienced briefly, probably maybe decades ago in some of your cases. And imagine if that instability has been prolonged for weeks, months, and years in your life, how impossible it would be to even imagine doing anything close to getting a job Try and think, when you're going home tonight, what it would be like to not have somewhere to go that would be secure, where you could feel safe. Access to land has been one of the bases for revolution all throughout the Americas because people understand that without a home, people cannot form their lives. We have public land available. We have people who are suffering every single night now to next week when you have your next meeting, that is seven nights of near freezing temperatures these people will experience because of the delay. It's been many months since this was studied and begun, 
and we need action to give people some sense of stability in their lives. It's impossible to imagine if you guys were denied getting into your own homes until this crisis was solved, this crisis would have been solved. I think for all of us, we could say that. And I know it's a challenge, it's a huge challenge and there's budgetary problems, but just allowing people access to land and stability to be able to start getting their feet under themselves is a very basic thing that I think we in the community, all of us can agree is extremely important. And I hope you do the outreach to neighbors to help them both get involved in these projects and understand these people. Thank you. Thank you. No more. All right, bring it back to council. Any additional questions for staff? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm perplexed and I'm curious. What, what would change um, in our strategy if we moved, if we expanded the CHAP program without the housing focus program piece. What would change? What, what, what about the program would, cha would so negatively change, whether it be expense, um, whatever it might be, I don't know. I don't, I don't eat and breathe this, this subject the way so many do in our community, so I'm curious. So again, you're, you're asking for a, 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 I mean, right now we have a focus targeted approach. When you would change that, you would be setting a new approach. We, we know what the results are. I, 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 would, I would hate to have staff speculate on something we don't know. I mean, I think we don't know the answer to these questions. We've had an approach. The approach is based on housing first. If we change the approach and, you know, and council wanted us to take a different approach, we would be back in a space where we would be discovering together with the community what that meant uh, and what the results of that were. So, so again, I'm stepping in front of staff a little bit because I think we do, the, that is the unknown question. We've seen, um, we, we get stories about some of the challenges in other communities, um, but we don't, we really don't know what's gonna specifically happen here. Um, and there is, you hear, a lot of desire to see some change in the, in the program. Um, what we can tell you is that we followed a very specific set of protocols, which were developed out of um, when we, when we initiated these protocols, the, what, the challenges we were facing near the Farmer's Lane extension. And we We've been active in that approach. Um, you know, it is it is difficult, time-consuming uh, uh, work for the entire organization. We work, as you know, we have a, hap, a, a, a heap and a hat meetings on a weekly basis. We've 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 gone into difficult conversations with both community groups and advocates, and this team has really spent a lot of time working on this. You know, but there are there are these open questions, and we recognize them. But I I, I don't know what that's going to result in. Um, we're we're looking just like you. To, you know, we've been asked to bring this back. We we have documented success in where we're working, but the question is. Is, is, is council satisfied with that work or do we need to go in a different direction? Well, I, I appreciate that. And, and I think what, what resonates with me is that I, because I live in an area that is where I see the, and I, well, I live very, very close to, um, to the end of Farmer's Lane. So I was very well aware of what was happening up on the hill, um, both before and after um, the change there. What I am also very aware of in, in my neighborhood is a constant um, revolving um, group of cars, uh, RVs, et cetera, parking on the city streets night after night. So the, the comment about they're already there, uh, they're in the community, they're on our city streets, I'm wondering what and I, I've seen some of the some of the unfortunate behavior as well, which um, leaving trash, et cetera, um, around the vehicles. 
So some of the, the challenges are already there, and I, and I think about where, where are the, well, they're probably because of the fast food restaurants around, there are restrooms that are available to them, and it's probably um, why my neighborhood is perhaps a little more popular than, than others, but they are there. They are on our city streets. And uh, I don't know what impact that has on our, on our um, uh, public safety officials, um, but there's, there clearly is something that's not working. And um, I've been a staunch supporter of Housing First because I think it's kept us from being hasty at times. And I don't think anyone could accuse us of being hasty. Um, because of the length of time that we've been trying to be f focused. And I think that by not, there are, the county has had a problem with being focused and um, they've been paying a price for it of, of late, a pretty high price, I think. Um, it would do them good to, to be a little more cooperative, I think, with the city of Santa Rosa. Um, and they accuse us of doing, of not being effective, where we've housed 300 people last year and, and another 100, is it, are we, whatever the number is, I think we've been effective. Um, but I am concerned that there is something staring us in the face that is, that, that needs attention and I'm not sure how to go about um, resolving that and, or responding to it. Any other questions? Oh. Mr. Olivares, you have this uh, item. Do you wanna start the conversation? Well, I think we should start a conversation because there's really nothing to make a motion on yet because we're looking at uh, moving in the direction of adding some components to the uh, uh, CHAP program. So I, I guess there's not a motion to make, but other than start a conversation about what changes, if any, need to be made to our existing program. You know, so, so for me, and having um, hear what Bob had to say, because I think Bob was at the same meeting that I was at with Dave on November 30th, 2016. Never forget that, 150 angry people. Um, but then I see what safe parking does out there on Stony Point. Um, I, if we could replicate that and make that part of the system, that's kind of what my interest is, because there are different sites that are working here. How do we go there? Uh, because what is scary for me when you see those dollars, if I see half a million bucks, a million bucks, um, when I know we're housing people and I know there are people that actually want to enter into these master leases, you know, I'm a proponent, let's end people's homeless versus just managing them and getting those resources. When you talk about outreach workers, I think our number one need in this community, and that's just not Santa Rosa, but the whole homeless system of care, we need more outreach workers. If we've got 1,600 folks in the city of Santa Rosa experiencing homelessness and we're only funding two outreach workers, because those are the subject matter experts that understand the system, build those networks to actually get them housed. So that's where I'm a little bit fuzzy. This item was for the expansion of the CHAP program. If we can replicate some of these successful expansions of the CHAP, that's what I'd, you know, I'm interested in. Right, and, and, and I, I mean, for me, I think the Housing First model is an effective model to continue to pursue. I think services are important, and I understand frustrations that we all experience out in the community, but again, sometimes we're looking for innocent results. But the fact of the matter is things are working. They're just not, maybe perhaps not working fast enough for some, and we still continue to have this emergency. Uh, and, and I think it's also looking at our, probably perhaps our roles and responsibilities. What is our role as a city? Uh, we don't necessarily provide services, but we fund a lot of services. We, based on what we saw already that was provided by staff is we do a lot right now in, in, within Santa Rosa and some of these things are working well. So how do we replicate some of those and expand those and, and how do we align these efforts with the rest of the county? Other communities are experiencing similar issues within their communities. Uh, so how do, how do we bring them along as well? Uh, in, in as far as coordinated a strategy that is countywide, region-wide, if you will, uh, and hopefully others will, will replicate the model of CHAP within their own communities as well. So again, how do we start calling some of these successes and how do we expand some of that and identify what our different roles and responsibilities are in making things happen? Okay. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think Dave hit it on the, the head when he talked about what we really need to do is scale up what we're already doing. And I, and I think that that's sort of what the council is feeling. 
is when we hear those positive success outcomes for the folks that we are actually able to serve, it, it's encouraging to us because it tells us that we're moving in the right direction, we just don't have enough resources. I think um, when, when Council Member Dowd mentioned mental health services, that's really where this is a difficult conversation for us as well. So we don't have a mental health, uh, health and human services department at the city. We don't have the resources and generally speaking the funding doesn't come down to us for that type of approach. Uh, with that said, I know that we are funding a mental health outreach worker, which is fantastic. But in terms of scaling up those programs, it's gonna take some additional help, whether it's from the county or especially from the state. I did wanna mention uh, last year, uh, Governor Brown allocated a billion dollars for homeless services that was really focused on building the infrastructure that we're talking about, whether it's repurposing Bennett Valley Senior Center or other types of creative solutions for uh, permanent supportive housing. Uh, we learned last week at the League of Cities that he's allocating another billion this year, but the focus is gonna be predominantly on those mental health services to try to address the underlying causes uh, that both help people to slip into homelessness, but also keep them there uh, for a long time. So I think that there is some help on the way for that one. Uh, I will also say, when we had this discussion almost two and a half years ago at this point uh, about sanctioned encampments, it, it was a difficult conversation, not just because pushback from the community, but I think that we all look at the housing first model and see that that is our most likely chance at lifting individuals out of homelessness. And we felt at the time that it was our responsibility to make sure that we were investing our dollars in a way that was focused on ending homelessness for, for people. And what that inherently meant was that we didn't have anything that was focused on mitigation. We didn't have programs that were designed for people who either couldn't get into our services because we hadn't scaled them up or they weren't ready to go into our services for whatever reason. And it was designed in a way to help push those, the latter folks, into services as well. I think what I'm hearing from the community uh, and have been hearing for, for quite some time is that there is an interest in us finding, whether it's housing first focused or not, a place for people to be while they look for those services, while we try to outreach to those folks, because to the point they're already in our community. And so that's why I keep bringing up City Hall, that's why I keep bringing up City Land, is I do think that we have an obligation if we're asking businesses or faith groups to, to put their skin in the game and host parking sites is the least that we can do as well. And I'm not saying completely throw out housing first. I'm not even saying change how we allocate most of our funding because I do think that we have seen a trajectory of success if we can scale that up. But just something as simple as allowing the parking lots to be used so that people have a place to go. And I'll finish on this. I have uh, recently had a conversation with a friend of mine who is fully employed, is very capable, and ended up homeless for a couple of days due to some domestic issues at home. And I will tell you, she expressed to me just how absolutely terrifying it was for her the first time she went into Sam Jones Hall. And that for her in particular, she would have felt so much more comfortable living in her car, living in an encampment that she knew was managed in a way or was safe for her to be at. Uh, we need a better diversity of services for places for people to go and, and, and providing... <laughs> <laughs> providing small places where people can park can be a component of that. And, I, and I'm not suggesting spend $600,000 on it. I'm saying just tell people that they can go someplace and feel safe to park overnight, whether it's City Hall or Bennett Valley Senior Center or any of our community centers that we have around the community. And yes, again, make it geographically representative. Other thoughts, Ms. Feismeyer? Yeah, I uh, would like to echo everything that Mr. Rogers said and tag on to it that, you know, we talk about this from evidence-based, and I guarantee you that if you talk to any one of the nearly 400 people that have been housed through a Housing First policy, that's the best thing ever. And if we could do that and get everybody who is waiting for housing into housing and into services, you wouldn't get any fight from me. But I'm... The only person who's ever sat at this diet who has been involved in direct outreach to homeless services. I have been raised by a person who was homeless as a child. 
I speak from deep personal experience when I say that housing first is a lot like saying um, when we do affordable housing that you have to have certain numbers or you have to pay the in lieu fees. If you jack it up high enough, it doesn't work. And it's not because the spirit is wrong, it's not because the evidence is wrong on getting it, it's because we flat out don't have the resources. And I get choked up because there will be people who die as a result of us sticking to this decision that was made because we decided that we're gonna stick to a decision that was made because we made a decision that we're gonna stick with. And to me, that's unacceptable that we are going to allow people to suffer as a result of of a decision that was made. And had I been on the council, I would have brought my experience to bear as a social worker and as a family member of somebody who's homeless, who was raised in homelessness. And I can tell you it shaped my life. That sense of insecurity, that sense of not knowing where you are in the world and where to go. And I know it's too much to ask of staff to ask you to project what would or wouldn't happen, but I'm asking us as a council to be courageous in, in small ways, perhaps, in piloting things, and not to say that things have to cost a half million dollars to park. And I challenge each of the six council members who can have this conversation to identify a place in their district. I would love to come to you with places in District 4, and I'm sure I will hear about it from my residents, and if I lose an election over it, oh well, because this is important enough, because people will die as a result. People are dying, people are sleeping in puddles, and it's just plain unacceptable. And we can say we want to partner better with the county, and we can throw this ball back and forth between who's being a good actor and who's not, but the truth is, is that they have a different organizational structure than we do, a different organizational culture. There are ways that they are good at things, there are ways that we are good at things, there's ways that we all suck. And the thing is, is that we have to rise above throwing this volley back and forth and just say, what can we do? We have city properties, let's use them, let's all rise to the challenge and be good council members. As somebody said tonight, it's a choice. Let's be strong. If we lose our jobs over 96, and we get paid, what, $9,600 and we get health care? Like, let's, let's rise to the occasion and do something for our most vulnerable residents. Anyone else like to make any comments or did you wanna make a motion? I think that Council Member Rogers has a stronger command of the policy on this matter, but I'm happy to second his motion. <laughs> uh, I actually, I am happy to make a motion that we accept the staff's recommendations for expansions of the CHAP program and seek, uh, seek city land within each of the council districts, I think would be a good way for us to put it, uh, that we can then open up to parking in the evening uh, and have staff bring back in the budget some form of estimates about what that could cost if we add additional levels of service so that then we can talk about this is the cost for security, this is the cost for restrooms, and we can actually have that conversation structurally around if we did nothing and just said just park here, it costs this much, and if we provided this level of services, it costs this much, and if we brought with it a, a host worker that was designed to go around to each of these sites and engage people, how much would that cost? I'd like a, a suite of options on that parking program. I'd like to second that and offer a friendly amendment that we also uh, authorize $50,000 to go for uh, a grant writer to scour for these additional monies and revisit it in a year. And if it has brought us more than $50,000, then good. And if not, then we can evaluate that. Do you accept that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay. Any other? comments or questions on that motion or anything else to add? Yes, uh, the motion referenced recommendations from staff. I did not see recommendations from staff. I saw information provided to us to try to come up with some recommendations from the council. So does staff have recommendations? It, it was around engaging property owners, expanding the definition, doing community outreach, 
emergency building standards uh, adoption. Uh, and then the question was about the housing first alignment. I, I, I understand, but I wanted to hear from staff if they had actual recommendations for us on, on this issue. Well, no, but we, we heard the affirmation in the motion, so we understand. I just consulted with the team. We understand the direction, and so we, while technically correct, we, we understand the direction and we can, we, can, we can come back with that. Thank you. The question that, or comment that I would like to add to this, because I know my impression when we started CHAP is that the city was doing a lot, but we needed the community, give the community an opportunity to assist with that. That's how we had some of the church sites. So I would, I would ask staff or members of the community who are listening to that, if there are people who would like to assist us with this endeavor, because some sites they've modeled it that it actually works. So rather than just looking at it from, you know, this is more of a partnership, just the city generating it, there's a dollar amount. If we get the volunteers, you know, the, the restaurants, and all the other, all the other attributes of successful safe parking sites. Again, I, I would like to make this more of a community effort than this is just a city run. I, I totally agree with city property, but it's got to be a partnership. Not got to be a partnership. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing the information about uh, did we solicit the community for their support and acceptance of this, and if so, how might that mitigate and uh, create somewhat of a partnership? Yeah, and, and that was a given uh, for me in, in the motion as well and with the existing CHAP program. And my hope is that uh, when the community sees that the city is putting our own skin in the game, that they realize that uh, that we need to have a community response and we need their help as well. Mr. Oliver, question or comment? No, I, I, I just going back to my original comment about skin in the game, we keep saying that we have had skin in the game. We can't say that we have not. We have had significant uh, brew skin in the game, <laughs> and we have been trying to engage so, the community. Skin, skin is the wrong term. Uh, no, I, we're, I, we're putting property in the game. No, we're not. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I get that, but again, it's the words that we use, I think, that are important in how we describe what we're doing, because this is an emotional issue, but we also stay, need to stick to some factual information that we have, too, and capacities. Uh, and, you know, I understand the suggestion about putting sites in each of the seven districts, yet not all the districts are represented, which is, a, which is also an issue that, that would be, uh, need to be crossed. So. This is my comments on that. Well, and again, let's be careful with uh, how we phrase things because every district is represented because we do still have some at-large representatives. Do you have any comments, Mr. Sawyer? Yeah. One other comment, too, that I heard in your motion, um, you had mentioned a host outreach worker go there at night. We got two of them. So I would also ask if staff could we need up the capacity of outreach workers and you know are I'm very appreciative and they are successful outreach workers but that's a skill that's not a volunteer role to do that so if I heard you say part of the motion one outreach worker well if it's seven days a week because right now we have zero nighttime host outreach workers it, to me that would be part of the conversation in the budget about bare bones just allow it to be there and then added services to it. To me, added services includes that host outreach worker. Right. I just want to make sure that staff yeah. will be able to capture that and come back with yes. a dollar amount. Yes. Great. Any other additions or conversations? Are, are you, when we first asked staff, are you clear on what the motion is or would you like Mr. Rogers to repeat it? I have just a couple clarifying questions. The first part is accept the expansion of CHAP, and there wasn't any recommendation of staff, so I'm just assuming then the motion flows to seek land in each district for possible safe parking, come up with a suite of options for a budget with that, from best basic services of security, washing stations, all the way up to a housing first model. There's also including in the budget uh, 50000 for a grant writer to come back and give us some options of what grants might be available and that the community, we seek community partnership to keep this a true CHAP program. That motion sounds great. <laughs> Probably sounds great to the second or two, right? That, that hits Mark. Okay. Mr. Dowd. Uh, the only thing I would like uh, Mr. Rogers uh, to add into it and in his second uh, from Ms. Fleming is um, something about look as to how we might incorporate some of the services that uh, the homeless may need uh, at, as a part of the pricing element is how we might do that. 
Yeah, and I think, I mean, yes. All right, any other questions, additions, clarifications? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, no written communications. We do have a couple of uh, public comments on non-agenda items. First up, Margie Brunel, followed by Eric Frazier. Thank you, Council, for your time and efforts tonight on behalf of the homeless in Sonoma County. Um, I just wanted to mention I, I spend a lot of time um, with homeless action and in the downtown area, and there are, you know, people sleeping in doorways tonight down there and no access to restrooms. I know you're aware of that. I'm also interested in the constant beep, beep, beep that comes from the crosswalks down there. I think it's a, actually a, a noise pollution, and um, I think we could do better with that. And I'm interested in who I would talk to about maybe changing that situation downtown. It's um, very disturbing for somebody who would be trying to sleep outside or inside actually, because you can actually hear it inside the buildings downtown. Um, and it's from the traffic light and crosswalks. And I don't think that it's actually helpful for anybody who is disabled to be crossing the street because it just beeps continuously. So it doesn't signal whether a light is on or off. So I don't know actually what the purpose of the continual beep, beep, beep is, but it is, um, prevents people from sleeping. It prevents me from sleeping, I can tell you that much. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you. Eric Frazier? Thank you, and I'll make my comments brief, but thank you again for your time, I appreciate that. I wanted to rise and address, uh, just as you know, I'm on this ongoing project to understand and audit the TOT and SRTBIA situation, and probably also, as you've learned from me before, that I'm shocked to discover the lack of oversight and some fundamental accounting problems and other issues. But I rise today not to take that whole can of worms because it is quite extensive, but I did want to address one issue, and that is the unfairness that's created by charging evacuees and victims of, of emergencies, the TOT and BIA. Why are we directing people into short-term occupancy who are residents of the city or this county and subjecting them, them to this additional tax, especially since our research shows that this tax is not well spent. It's, it's mismanaged to the extreme. So for the life of me, I can't understand this additional burden that exists for our people. Not everybody earns six figures in this city. When you have to evacuate, it, the chances are your cost burden goes way through the roof. How do you mitigate that? Why do we add insult to injury to charge this additional 9% TOT and 3% SRTBIA? I thought I was gonna limit my comments to just that one issue, which I feel very passionate about, but another development happened today in the city of San Francisco where the head of public works was arrested in a graft scheme. Within that graft, Travel, incentive travel, and uh, many issues surrounding favoritism were addressed in the FBI charges. My research in the SRTBIA and the construct of the Chamber of Commerce Visit Santa Rosa construct certainly introduces the prospect that travel, incentive travel, especially connected to Ironman locations and other places in the world, is being used to cast favoritism in a political process. I mean, these are serious issues, and I can't believe we don't have suitable accounting, suitable oversight to address these issues. I, I, I really am quite shocked by it. But thank you very much for your time. We'll get to the bottom of this this year. 
I'm sure you'll hear from me again. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for agenda. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I am going to adjourn this meeting in the memory and honor uh, recognition of Clayvon R. Stalen, who was a police lieutenant and unfortunately passed after a battle of cancer um, last night. Uh, Clay worked for the police department for 20 years, and um, those of you that know him would know him as one of the kindest human beings you ever met. Uh, one of the programs that he started, the Shop with a Cop program that uh, now goes on an annual basis, was started by Clay, and it's all from the heart. Uh, so with that, um, we're, he's in our thoughts and prayers, and his wife, Lynn, and two daughters. Um, Santa Rosa really lost an angel last night. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>